My Life on the Plains, or Personal Experiences with Indians by George A. Custer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As a fitting introduction to some of the personal incidents and sketches which I shall hereafter present to the readers of the galaxy, a brief description of the country in which these events transpired may not be deemed inappropriate. It is but a few years ago that every schoolboy, supposed to possess the rudiments of a knowledge of the geography of the United States, could give the boundaries and the general description of the great American desert. As to the boundaries, the knowledge seemed to be quite explicit. On the north, bounded by the upper Missouri, on the east by the lower Missouri and Mississippi, on the south by Texas, and on the west by the Rocky Mountains. The boundaries on the northwest and south remained undisturbed, while on the east, civilization propelled and directed by Yankee enterprise, adopted the motto, Westward the Star of the Empire Takes Its Way. Countless throngs of immigrants crossed the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, selecting homes in the rich and fertile territories lying beyond. Each year this tide of immigration, strengthened and increased by the flow from foreign shores, advanced towards the setting sun, slowly but surely narrowing the preconceived limits of the great American desert, and correspondingly enlarging the limits of civilization. At last the geographical myth was dispelled. It was gradually discerned that the great American desert did not exist, that it had no abiding place but that within its supposed limits, and instead of what had been regarded as a sterile and unfruitful tract of land, incapable of sustaining either man or beast, there existed the fairest and richest portion of the national domain, blessed with a climate pure, bracing, and healthful, while its undeveloped soil rivaled if it did not surpass the most productive portions of the eastern, middle, or southern states. Discarding the name Great American Desert, this immense tract of country, with its eastern boundary moved back by civilization to a distance of nearly 300 miles west of the Missouri River, is now known as the Plains, and by this more appropriate title it shall be called when reference to it is necessary. The Indian tribes which have caused the government most anxiety, and whose depredations have been most serious against our frontier settlements and prominent lines of travel across the plains, infest that portion of the plains bounded on the north by the valley of the Platte River, and its tributaries on the east by a line running north and south between the 97th and 98th meridians, on the south by the valley of the Arkansas River, and west by the Rocky Mountains. Although by treaty stipulations almost every tribe with which the government has recently been at war is particularly debarred from entering or occupying any portion of this tract of country. Of the many persons who I have met on the plains as transient visitors from the States or from Europe, there are few who have not expressed surprise that their original ideas concerning the appearance and characteristics of the country were so far from correct or that the plains in imagination, as described in books, terse letters, or reports of isolated scientific parties, differed so wildly from the plains as they actually exist and appear to the eye. Travelers, writers of fiction, and journalists have spoken and written a great deal concerning this immense territory, so unlike in all its quantities and characteristics to the settled and cultivated portion of the United States, but to a person familiar with the country, the conclusion is forced upon reading these published descriptions, either that the writers never visited but a limited portion of the country they aim to describe, or, as is most commonly the case at the present day, that the journey was made in a stagecoach or Pullman car, half of the distance traveled in the night time, and but occasional glimpses taken during the day. A journey by rail across the plains is at best but ill-adapted to a thorough or satisfactory examination of the general character of the country, for the reason that in selecting the route for railroads 
the valley of some stream is, if practicable, usually chosen to contain the roadbed. The valley being considerably lower than the adjacent country, the view of the tourist is correspondingly limited. Moreover, the vastness of the varied character of this immense track could not fairly be determined or judged by a flying trip across one portion of it. One would scarcely expect an accurate opinion to be formed of the swamps of Florida from a railroad journey from New York to Niagara. After indulging in criticisms on the written descriptions of the plains, I might reasonably be expected to enter into what I conceive a correct description, but I forbear. Beyond a general outline embracing some of the peculiarities of this slightly known portion of our country, the limits and character of these sketches of Western life will not permit me to go. The idea entertained by the greater number of people regarding the appearance of the plains, while it is very incorrect so far as the latter are concerned, is quite accurate and truthful if applied to the prairies of the western states. It is probable, too, that the romance writers and even tourists at an earlier day mistook the prairies for the plains, and in describing one imagined they were describing the other whereas the two have little in common to the eye of the beholder, save the general absence of trees. In proceeding from the Missouri River to the base of the Rocky Mountains, the ascent, although gradual, is quite rapid. For example, at Fort Riley, Kansas, the bed of the Kansas River is upward of a thousand feet above the level of the sea, while at Fort Hayes, at a distance of nearly 150 miles further west, is about 1,500 feet above the level of the sea. Starting from almost any point near the central portion of the plains and moving in any direction, one seems to encounter a series of undulations at a more or less remote distance from each other, but consistently in view. Comparing the surface of the country to that of the ocean, a comparison often indulged in by those who have seen both, it does not require a very great stretch of the imagination when viewing this boundless ocean of beautiful living verdure to picture these successive undulations as gigantic waves not wildly chasing each other to or from the shore but standing silent and immovable and by their silent immobility adding to the impressive grandeur of the scene these undulations, varying in height from 50 to 500 feet, and sometimes forming a light sandy soil, but often of different varieties of rock, producing at a distance the most picturesque effect. The constant reoccurrence of these waves, if they may be so termed, is quite puzzling to the inexperienced plainsman. He imagines, and very naturally too, judging from appearances, that when he ascends to the crest, he can overlook all the surrounding country. After a weary walk or ride of perhaps several miles, which appeared at starting not more than one or two, he finds himself at the desired point, but discovers that directly beyond, in the direction he desires to go, rises a second wave, but slightly higher than the first, and from the crest which he must certainly be able to scan the country as far as the eye can reach. Thither he pursues his course, and after a ride of from five to ten miles, although the distance did not seem half so great before starting, he finds himself on the crest, or, as it is invariably termed, the divide, but again only to discover that another and apparently a higher divide rises in his front, and at about the same distance. Hundreds, yes, thousands of miles may be journeyed over, and the same effect witnessed every few hours. As you proceed toward the west from the Missouri, the size of the trees diminishes, as well as the number of kinds. As you penetrate the borders of Indian country, leaving civilization behind you, the sight of the forest is no longer enjoyed. The only trees to be seen being scattered along the banks of the streams, these becoming smaller and more rare, finally disappearing altogether, and giving place to a few scattering willows and osiers. The greater portion of the plains may be said to be without timber of any kind, 
and to the cause of this absence scientific men disagree, some claiming that the high winds which prevail in the unobstructed force prevent the growth and existence of not only trees, but even the taller grasses. This theory is well supported by facts, as unlike the western prairies where the grass often attains a height sufficient to conceal a man on horseback, the plains are covered by a grass which rarely and only under favorable circumstances exceeds three inches in height. Another theory, also somewhat plausible, is that the entire plains were at one time covered with timber, more or less dense, but this timber, owing to the various causes, was destroyed, and has since been prevented from growing or spreading over the plains by the annual fires which the Indians regularly create, and which swept over the entire country. These fires are built by the Indians in the fall, to burn the dried grass and hasten the growth of the pasturage in the early spring. Favoring the theory that the plains were at one time covered with forest is the fact that the entire trunks of large trees have been found in a state of petrification, or elevated portions of the country, and far removed from the streams of water. While dwarf specimens of almost all varieties of trees are found fringing the banks of some of the streams, the prevailing species are cottonwood and poplar trees, Populus monolifera and Populus angulosa. Intermingled with these are found clumps of osiers, Salix longifolia. In almost any other portion of the country, the cottonwood would be the least desirable of trees, but to the Indian, and in many instances which have fallen under my observation to our troops, the cottonwood has performed a service which no other tree has been found its equal and that is his forage for horses and mules during the winter season, when the snow prevents even dried grass from being obtainable. During the winter campaign of 1868-69 to 69, against the hostile tribes south of the Arkansas, it not unfrequently happened that my command, while in pursuit of Indians, exhausted its supply of forage, and the horses and mules were subsisted upon the young bark of the cottonwood tree. In routing the Indians from their winter villages, we invariably discovered them locked up at that point of the stream, promising the greatest supply of cottonwood bark, while the stream in the vicinity of the village was completely shorn of its supply of timber, and the village itself was strewn with the white branches of the cottonwood entirely stripped of their bark. It was somewhat amusing to observe an Indian pony feeding on a cottonwood bark, the limb being usually cut into pieces about four feet in length and thrown upon the ground, the pony, accustomed to this kind of long forage, would place one forefoot on the limb in the same manner as a dog secures a bone, and gnaw the bark from it. Although not affording anything like the amount of nutriment that either hay or grain does, yet our horses invariably preferred the bark to either, probably on account of its freshness. The herbage to be found on the principal portion of the plains is usually sparse and stunted in its growth. Along the banks of the streams and in the bottom lands, there grows generally in rich abundance a species of grass often found in the states east of the Mississippi. But on the uplands is produced what is there known as the buffalo grass, indigenous and peculiar in its character, differing in form and substance from all other grasses. The blade, under favorable circumstances, reaches a growth usually of from three to five inches, but instead of being straight or approximately so, it assumes a curled or waving shape, the grass itself becoming densely matted and giving to foot, when walking upon it, a sensation similar to that produced by stepping upon moss or the most costly of velvet carpets. Nearly all of the graminivorous animals inhabiting the plains, except the elk and some species of the deer, prefer the buffalo grass to that of the lowland, and it is probable that even these exceptions would not prove good if it were not for the timber on the bottom land, which affords good cover to both the elk and the deer. Both are often found in large herds grazing upon the uplands, although the grass is far more luxuriant and plentiful on the lowlands. Our domestic animals invariably choose the buffalo grass, and experience demonstrates beyond question that it is the most nutritious of all varieties of wild grasses. 
The favorite range of the buffalo is contained in a belt of country running north and south, about 200 miles wide, and extending from the Platte River on the north to the valley of the Upper Canadian on the south. In migrating, if not grazing or alarmed, the buffalo invariably move in single file, the column generally being headed by a patriarch of the herd, who is not only familiar with the topography of the country, but whose prowess in the field entitles him to become the leader of his herd. He maintains this leadership only so long as his strength and courage enable him to remain the successful champion in the innumerable contests which he is called upon to maintain. The buffalo trails are always objects of interest and inquiry to the sightseer on the plains. These trails, made by the herds in their migrating moments, are so regular in their construction and course as to well excite curiosity. They vary but little from eight to ten inches in width, and are usually from two to four inches in depth. Their course is almost as unvarying as that of the needle, running north and south. Of the thousands of buffalo trails which I have seen, I recollect none of which the general direction was not north and south. This may seem somewhat surprising at first, though, but it admits of a simple and satisfactory explanation. The general direction of all streams, large and small on the plains, is from the west to the east, seeking as they do an entrance to the Mississippi. The habits of the buffalo incline him to graze and migrate from one stream to another, moving northward and crossing each in succession as he follows the young grass in the spring, and moving southward, seeking the milder climate and open grazing in the fall and winter. Throughout the buffalo country are to be seen what are termed buffalo wallows. The number of these is so great as to excite surprise. A moderate estimate would give from one to three to each acre of ground throughout this vast tract of country. These wallows are about eight feet in diameter and from six to eighteen inches in depth, and are made by the buffalo bulls in the spring when challenging a rival to combat for the favor of the opposite sex. The ground is broken by pawing, if an animal with a hoof can be said to paw, and if the challenge is accepted, as it usually is, the combat takes place, after which the one who comes off victorious remains in possession of the battlefield and, occupying the wallow of fresh unturned earth, finds it produces a cooling sensation to his hot and gory sides. Sometimes the victory which gives possession of the battlefield and drives the hated antagonist away is purchased at a dear price. The carcass of the victor is often found in the wallow, where his brief triumph has soon terminated from the effects of his wounds. In the early spring, during the shedding season, the buffalo resorts to his wallow, to aid in removing the old coat. These wallows have proven of no little benefit to man as well as to animals other than the buffalo. After a heavy rain they become filled with water, the soil being of such a compact character as to retain it. It has not unfrequently been the case when making long marches that the streams would be found dry, while water in abundance could be obtained from the wallows. True, it was not of the best quality, particularly if it had been standing long and the buffalo had patronized the wallows as a summer resort. But on the plains, a thirsty man or beast far from any streams or water does not parley long with these considerations. Whatever water is found on the plains, particularly if it is standing, innumerable gadflies and mosquitoes generally abound. To such an extent do these pests to the animal kingdom exist, to our thinly coated animals such as the horse and the mule. Grazing is almost an impossibility while the buffalo with his huge shaggy coat can browse undisturbed. The most sanguinary and determined of these troublesome insects are the buffalo flies. They move in myriads and so violent and painful as their assaults upon the horses that a herd of the latter has been known to stampede as a result of an attack from a swarm of these flies. But here again is furnished what some reasoners would affirm is evidence of the eternal fitness of things. In most localities where these flies are found in troublesome numbers, there are also found flocks of starlings, 
a species of blackbird these more i presume to obtain a livelihood than to become the defender of the helpless perch themselves upon the backs of the animals when woe betide the hapless gadfly who ventures near only to become a choice morsel for the starling in this way i have seen our herds of cavalry horses grazing undisturbed each horse of the many hundreds having perched upon his back from one to dozens of starlings standing guard over him while he grazed one of the first subjects which addresses itself to the mind of the stranger on the plains particularly if he be a philosophical or scientific turn of mind is the mirage which is here observed in all its perfection many a weary mile of the traveller has been whirled away in endeavours to account for the fitful and beautiful changing visions presented by the mirage sometimes the distortions are wonderful and so natural as to deceive the most experienced eye upon one occasion i met a young officer who had spent several years on the plains and in the indian country he was on the occasion alluded to in command of a detachment of cavalry in pursuit of a party of indians who had been committing depredations on our frontier while riding at the head of his command he suddenly discovered as he thought a party of indians not more than a mile distant the latter seemed to be galloping towards him the attention of his men was called to them and they pronounced them indians on horseback the trot was sounded and the column moved forward to the attack the distance between the attacking party and the supposed foe was rapidly diminishing the indians appearing plainer to view each moment the charge was about to be sounded when it was discovered that the supposed party of indians consisted of decayed carcasses of a half a dozen slain buffaloes which number had been magnified by the mirage while the peculiar motion imparted by the latter had given the appearance of indians on horseback i have seen a train of government wagons with white canvas covers moving through a mirage which by elevating the wagons to treble their height and magnifying the size of the covers presented the appearance of a line of large sailing vessels under full sail why the unusual appearance of the mirage gave the correct likeness of an immense lake or sea sometimes a mirage has been the cause of frightful suffering and death by its deceptive appearance trains of immigrants making their way to california and oregon have while seeking water to quench their thirst and that of their animals been induced to depart from their course in the endeavor to reach the inviting lake of water which the mirage displayed before their longing eyes it is usually represented at a distance of from five to ten miles sometimes if the nature of the ground is favorable it is dispelled by advancing toward it at others it is like an ignis fatus hovering in sight but keeping beyond reach here and there throughout this region are pointed out the graves of those who are said to have been led astray by the mirage until their bodies were famished and they succumbed to thirst the routes usually chosen for travel across the plains may be said to furnish upon an average water every fifteen miles in some instances however and during the hot season of the year it is necessary in places to go into what is termed a dry camp that is to encamp where there is no water in such emergencies with a previous knowledge of the route it is practicable to transport from the last camp a sufficient quantity to satisfy the demands of the people composing the train but the dumb brutes must trust to the little moisture obtained from the night grazing to quench their thirst the animals inhibiting the plains resemble in some respects the fashionable society of some of our larger cities during the extreme heat of the summer they forsake their accustomed haunts and seek a more delightful retreat for although the plains are drained by streams of all sizes from the navigable river to the humblest of brooks yet at certain seasons the supply of water in many of them is of the most uncertain character the pasturage from the excessive heat the lack of sufficient moisture and the withering hot winds which sweep across from the south become dried withered and burnt and is rendered incapable of sustaining life then it is that the animals usually found on the plains disappear for a short time and await the return of a milder season having briefly grouped 
the prominent features of the central plains and as some of the incidents connected with my service among the indian tribes occurred far to the south of the localities already referred to a hurried reference to the country north of texas and in which the wichita mountains are located a favorite resort of some of the tribes is here made to describe as one would view in the journeying upon horseback over this beautiful and romantic country to picture with the pen those boundless solitude so silent that their silence alone increases their grandeur to gather inspiration from nature and to attempt to paint the scene as my eye beheld it is a task before which a much readier pen than mine might well hesitate it was a beautiful and ever-changing panorama which at one moment excited the beholder's highest admiration at the next impressed him with speechless veneration approaching the wichita mountains from the north and after the eye has perhaps been wearied by the tameness and monotony of the unbroken plains one is gladdened by the relief which the sight of these picturesque and peculiarly beautiful mountains affords here are to be seen all the varied colors which Beierstadt and church endeavor to represent in their mountain scenery a journey across and around them on foot and upon horseback will well repay either the tourist or artist the air is pure and fragrant and as exhilarating as the purest of wine the climate entrancingly mild the sky clear and blue as the most beautiful sapphire with here and there clouds of rarest loveliness presenting to the eye the richest commingling of bright and varied colors delightful odors are constantly being wharfed by while the forest filled with the mocking bird the calibre the humming bird and the thrush consistently put forth a joyful chorus and all combined to fill the soul with visions of delight and enhance the perfection and glory of the creation strong indeed must be that unbelief which can here contemplate nature in all her purity and glory and unawed by the sublimity of this closely connected testimony question either the divine origin or purpose of the beautiful fulfillment unlike most mountains the wichita cannot properly be termed a range or chain but more correctly a collection or group as many of the highest and most beautiful are detached and stand on a level plain solitary and alone they are mainly composed of granite the huge blocks of which exhibit numerous shades of beautiful colors crimson purple yellow and green predominating they are conical in shape and seem to have but little resemblance to the soil upon which they are founded they rise abruptly from a level surface so level and unobstructed that it would be an easy matter to drive a carriage to any point of the circumference at the base and yet so steep and broken are the sides that it is only here and there that it is possible to ascend them from the foot of almost every mountain pours a stream of limpid water of almost icy coldness if the character given to the indian by cooper and other novelists as well as by well-meaning but mistaken philanthropists of a later day were the true one if the indian were the innocent simple-minded being he is represented more the creature of romance than reality imbued only with a deep veneration for the works of nature freed from the passions and vices which must accompany a savage nature if in other words he possessed all the virtues which his admirers and works of fiction ascribe to him and were free from all the vices which those best qualified to judge assign to him he would be just the character to complete the picture which is presented by the country embracing the wichita mountains cooper to whose writings more than to those of any other author are the people speaking the english language indebted for a false and ill-judged estimate of the indian character might well have laid the scenes of his fictitious stories in this beautiful and romantic country it is to be regretted that the character of the indian as described in cooper's interesting novels is not the true one but as emerging from childhood into the years of a mature age we are often compelled to cast aside many of our earlier illusions and replace them by beliefs less inviting but more real so we as a people with opportunities enlarged and facilities for obtaining knowledge increased 
have been forced by a multiplicity of causes to study and endeavor to comprehend thoroughly the character of the red man. So intimately has he become associated with the government as ward of the nation, and so prominent a place among the questions of national policy does the much mooted Indian question occupy that it behooves us no longer to study this problem from works of fiction, but to deal with it as it exists in reality. Stripped of the beautiful romance with which we have been so long willing to envelop him, transferred from the inviting pages of the novelist to the localities where we are compelled to meet with him, in his native village on the warpath and when raiding upon our frontier settlements and lines of travel, the Indian forfeits his claim to the appellation of the noble red man. We see him as he is, and, so far as all knowledge goes, as he ever has been, a savage in every sense of the word, not worse, perhaps, than his white brother would be similarly born and bred, but one whose cruel and ferocious nature far exceeds that of any wild beast of the desert. That this is true, no one who has been brought into intimate contact with the wild tribes will deny. Perhaps there are some who, as members of peace commissions or as wandering agents of some benevolent society, may have visited these tribes or attended with them at councils held for some pacific purpose, and who, by passing through the villages of the Indian while at peace, may imagine their opportunities for judging of the Indian's nature all that could be described. But the Indian while he can seldom be accused of indulging in a great variety of wardrobe, can be said to have a character capable of adapting itself to almost every occasion. He has one character, perhaps his most serviceable one, which he preserves carefully, and only airs it when making his appeal to the government or its agents for arms, ammunition, and license to employ them. This character is invariably paraded, and often with telling effect, when the motive is a peaceful one. Prominent chiefs invited to visit Washington invariably don this character, and in their talks with the Great Father and other less prominent personages, they successfully contrived to exhibit but this one phrase. Seeing them under these or similar circumstances only is not surprising that by many the Indian is looked upon as a simple-minded son of nature, desiring nothing beyond the privilege of roaming and hunting over the vast unsettled wilds of the West, inheriting and asserting but few native rights, and never trespassing upon the rights of others. This view is equally erroneous with that which regards the Indian as a creature possessing the human form, but divested of all other attributes of humanity, and whose traits of character, habits, modes of life, disposition, and savage customs disqualify him from the exercise of all rights and privileges, even those pertaining to life itself. Taking him as we find him, at peace or at war, at home or abroad, waiving all prejudices, and laying aside all partiality, we will discover in the Indian a subject for thoughtful study and investigation. In him we will find the representative of a race whose origin is, and promises to be, a subject forever wrapped in mystery, a race incapable of being judged by the rules or laws applicable to any other known race of men, one between which and civilization there seems to have existed from time immemorial, a determined and unceasing warfare, a hostility so deep-seated and inbred with the Indian character, that in the exceptional instances where the modes and habits of civilization have been reluctantly adopted, it has been at the sacrifice of power and influence as a tribe, and the more serious loss of health, vigor, and courage as individuals. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 2 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. If the character of the Indian is enveloped in mystery, how much more so is his origin? 
From the earliest history to the present time, learned men have striven to unravel this mystery, and to trace the genealogy of the red man to its original source. But in spite of all study, and the deepest research capable of being brought to bear on this subject, it is today surrounded by a darkness, almost as deep and impenetrable as that which enfolded it centuries ago. Various writers of ability have attempted to prove that the Indians came from eastern Asia. Others trace them to Africa, others to Phoenicia, while other class believes them to be Autochthons. In favor of each of these beliefs, strong circumstantial evidence can be produced. By closely studying the customs, costumes, faith, and religious traditions of the various tribes, a striking homogeneity is seen to exist. At the same time, and from the same sources, we are enabled to discover satisfactory resemblance between certain superstitions and religious rites practiced among the Indian tribes and those which prevailed at one time among the ancient Persians, the Hebrews, and the Chaldeans. They who adhere to the belief of disparity of origin may readily adduce arguments in refutation of an opposite theory. The apparent similarity found to exist in the customs, dress, and religious rites of different tribes may be partially accounted for by their long intercourse under like circumstances, the effect of which would necessarily be an assimilation in beliefs and usage to a greater or less degree. The preponderance of facts inclines strongly in favor of that theory, which does not ascribe unity of origin to the Indian tribes. Passing down the Mississippi to Mexico and from Mexico to Peru, there once existed an unbroken chain of tribes, which, either in a peaceful or warlike manner, maintained a connection and kept up an intercourse with each other. In various ways, proofs have been discovered that at one time the most northern tribes must have held intercourse with the civilized nations of Peru and Mexico. These evidences have been seized upon by certain chevants to support the theory that the Indian tribes of North America are descendants of the Aztecs and other kindred nations of the South, arriving at this conclusion from the fact that an apparently similarity in history, psychology, traditions, and customs. But by studying the migration and tendencies of ancient nations and making allowances for such modifications as climate influences, intermarriage, contact with civilization, and an altered mode of living would necessarily produce upon any branch of the human race, remembering, too, that in the vast majority of cases relating to our subject, we must be guided by tradition rather than history. It is not difficult to establish a strong, typical likeness between the tribes of American Indians and some of the nations of most remote antiquity. When or in what exact manner they first reached this continent, is a problem difficult of solution. This theory necessarily involves the admission of immigration to this continent centuries before the landing of Columbus. Upon this point there is much that may be inferred, and not a little susceptible of strong proof. When civilization made its first inroads within the borders of this continent, numerous tribes, each powerful in numbers, were found inhabiting it. Each tribe had its peculiar customs, whether of war, the chase, or religion. They exhibited some close resemblances as well as widely different traits of character. That they sprang from different nations rather than from a single source seems highly probable. It is said that when the Spaniards conquered Yucatan, a number of intelligent Indians declared that by traditions from their ancestors, they had learned that their country had been peopled by nations coming from the east, whom God had delivered from their enemies by opening a road for them across the sea. Few persons will deny that the existence of America was believed in, if not positively known, centuries before its discovery by Columbus. Even so far back as the time of Alexander the Great, a historian named Theopompus, in giving a dialogue that took place between Midas and Salinas, credits the latter with saying that Europe, Asia, and Africa were only islands, but that a vast, fertile continent existed beyond the sea. This continent was peopled by a race of powerful men, and gold and silver were abundant on its surface. 
Hanno, 800 years before Christ, made a voyage along the coast of Africa and sailed due west for 30 days. From the account which he afterward wrote of his voyage, it is probable that he saw portions of America or some of the West India Islands. Reference is also made by Homer and Horace to the existence of islands at a long distance west of Europe and Africa. Diodorus speaks of an immense island many days sail to the west of Africa. Immense rivers flowed from its shores. Its inhabitants resided in beautiful mansions. Its soil was fruitful and highly cultivated. The description corresponds with that given of Mexico by the Spaniards who first discovered it. Aristotle makes mention of it in the following terms. It is said that the Carthaginians have discovered, beyond the pillars of Hercules, a very fertile island, but which is without inhabitants, yet full of forests, of navigable rivers, and abounding in fruit. It is situated many days' journey from the mainland. After the discovery of America, Europeans were surprised to find in villages in Guatemala inhabitants wearing the Arabian masculine costume and the Jewish feminine costume. Travelers in South America have discovered Israelites among the Indians, this discovery strengthens the theory given by Garcia, a Spanish writer, that the Indians are descendants of the tribes of Israel that were led captive into Assyria. Many of the Indian customs and religious rites closely resemble those of the Israelites. In many tribes the Indians offer the first fruits of the earth and of the chase to the great spirit. They have also certain ceremonies at stated periods, their division of the year corresponds with the Jewish festivals. In some tribes, the brother of the deceased husband receives the widow into his lodge as his legitimate wife. Some travelers claim to have seen circumcision practice among certain tribes. Another analogy between the Jews and the Indian is seen in their purification, baths, anointing, fasts, manner of praying, and abstaining from certain quadrupeds, birds and reptiles considered impure. In general, Indians are only permitted to marry in their own tribe. Some tribes are said to carry with them an ark similar to the one mentioned in the Holy Writ. I know that all tribes with which I have been brought in contact carry with them a mysterious something which is regarded with the utmost sacredness and veneration and upon which the eye of no white man at least is ever permitted to rest. Then again, the medicine man of the tribe, who is not, as his name implies, the physician, but stands in the character of high priest, assumes a dress and manner corresponding to those of the Jewish high priest. Mr. Adair, who spent forty years among the various northern tribes, and who holds to the idea that the Indian is descended from the Hebrew, asserts that he discovered an unmistakable resemblance between various Indian words and the Hebrew intended to express the same ideas. He further asserts that he once heard an Indian apply the following expression to a culprit, Tashi Waxit Kanha, Thou art like a Canaanite sinner. Numerous evidences and various authorities go to prove that prior to the discovery of America by Columbus, a series of voyages had been made from the old to the new continent. The historical records of the Scandinavians describing their migratory expeditions fix not only the dates of such excursions, but also the exact points on the American coast at which landings were made and colonies established. In 1002, Thorward Erickson, following the example of his countrymen, began a voyage during which he landed near Cape Cod. He was afterwards slain in an encounter with the natives. Other expeditions were undertaken by the Scandinavians at subsequent periods, down to the early part of the 15th century, when, owing to various causes of decline, including savage wars and disease, these early explorers lost their foothold on the American continent and disappeared from its limits. But from the ninth to 15th century, it was easily proved by their historical records and traditions that the American continent had been visited and occupied by pioneers from the Scandinavians. From the great number of inscriptions, antique 
utensils, arms, bones, and monuments discovered in New England states, it is fair to presume that these adventures had occupied a larger portion of the new continent than their manuscripts would lead us to suppose. At the same time, the discoveries in the western states and territories of mounds containing human bones, earthen vessels, and weapons, whose form and structure prove that their original owners belonged to a different people, from any of which were acquainted at the present day, should be received as evidence strongly confirmatory of the early migrations claimed to have been made by the Scandinavians and other nations. Admitting that there are certain physiological attributes common to nearly all the Indian tribes, sufficiently decided and clear to enable them to be classed together as one branch of the human family, yet an intimate study of all the tribes of North America will develop physical diversities, sufficiently ample to justify the belief that the various tribes may have sprung from different nationalities. We find them altogether generally of a copper color, presenting all shades of complexion from a deep black to a shade of white. Some tribes are of powerful stature, others are dwarfed. So marked are these differences that a person accustomed to meeting the various tribes can at a glance distinguish the individuals of one from the other. Almost every tribe possesses a language peculiarly its own, and what seems remarkable is the fact that no matter how long or how intimately two tribes may be associated with each other, they each preserve and employ their own language, and individuals of the one tribe rarely become versed in the spoken language of the other, all intercommunications being carried on either by interpreters or in the universal sign language. This is noticeably true of Cheyenne and Arapahoes, two tribes which for years have lived in close proximity to each other, and who are so strongly bound together offensively and defensively as to make common cause against the enemies of either, particularly against the white man. These tribes encamp together, hunt together, and make war together. Yet but a comparatively small number of either can speak fluently the language of the other. I remember to have had an interview at one time with a number of prominent chiefs belonging to five different tribes, the Cheyenne, Kiowas, Osages, Kaws, and Apaches. In communicating with them, it was necessary for my language to be interpreted into each of the five Indian tongues, no representatives of any two of the tribes being able to understand the language of each other, yet all of these tribes were accustomed to more or less intimate association. Between the tribes which inhabited the eastern states and those originally found on the plains, a marked difference is seen to exist. They have but little in common, while a difference equally marked is discovered between the Indians of the plains and those of the mountain regions further west, as well as the tribes of both Old and New Mexico. Inseparable from the Indian character, whenever he is to be met with, is his remarkable taciturnity, his deep dissimulation, the perseverance with which he follows his plans of revenge or conquest, his concealment and apparent lack of curiosity, his stoical courage when in the power of his enemies, his cunning, his caution, and last but not least, the wonderful power and subtlety of his senses. Of this last I have had most interesting proof, one instance of which will be noted when describing the Washita campaign. In studying the Indian character, while shocked and disgusted by many of his traits and customs, I find much to be admired, and still more of deep and unvarying interest. To me Indian life, with its attendant ceremonies, mysteries, and forms, is a book of uneasing interest. Grant that some of its pages are frightful, and, if possible, to be avoided, yet the attraction is none the weaker. Study him, fight him, civilize him if you can, he remains still the object of your curiosity, a type of man peculiar and undefined, subjecting himself to no known law of civilization, contending determinately against all efforts to win him from his chosen mode of life. He stands in a group of nations solitary and reserved, 
seeking alliance with none, mistrusting and opposing the advances of all. Civilization may and should do much for him, but it can never civilize him. A few instances to the contrary may be quoted, but these are susceptible of explanation. No tribe enjoying its accustomed freedom has ever been induced to adopt a civilized mode of life, or, as they express it, to follow the white man's road. At various times certain tribes have forsaken the pleasures of the chase and the excitement of the war-path for the more quiet life to be found on the reservation. Was this course adopted voluntarily and from preference? Was it because the Indian chose the ways of his white brother rather than those in which he had been born and bred? In no single instance has this been true. What then, it may be asked, have been the reasons which influenced certain tribes to abandon their predatory nomadic life, and today to influence others to pursue a similar course? The answer is clear and as undeniable as it is clear. The gradual and steady decrease in numbers, strength, and influence, occasioned by wars both with other tribes and with the white man, as well as losses brought about by diseases partly attributable to contact with civilization, have so lowered the standing and diminished the available fighting force of the tribe as to render it unable to cope with more powerful neighboring tribes with any prospect of success, the stronger tribes always assume an overbearing and dominant matter toward their weaker neighbors, forcing them to join in costly and bloody wars, or themselves to be considered enemies. When a tribe falls from the position of a leading one, it is at the mercy of every tribe that chooses to make war, being forced to take sides, and at the termination of the war is generally sacrificed to the interests of the more powerful. To avoid these sacrifices, to avail itself of the protection of civilization and its armed forces, to escape from the running influences of its more warlike and powerful neighbors, it reluctantly accepts the situation, gives up its accustomed haunts, its wild mode of life, and nestles down under the protecting arm of its former enemy, the white man, and tries, however feebly, to adopt his manner of life. In making this change, the Indian has to sacrifice all that is dear to his heart. He abandons the only mode of life in which he can be a warrior, and win triumphs and honors worthy to be sought after. And in taking up the pursuits of the white man, he does that which he has always been taught, from his earliest infancy to regard as degrading to his manhood, to labor, to work for his daily bread, an avocation suitable only for squaws. To those who advocate the application of laws of civilization to the Indian, it might be a profitable study to investigate the effect which such application produces upon the strength of the tribe as expressed in numbers. Looking at him as the fearless hunter, the matchless horseman and warrior of the plains where nature placed him, and contrasting him with the reservation Indian, who is supposed to be reveling in the delightful comforts and luxuries of an enlightened condition, but who in reality is groveling and beggary, bereft of many of the qualities which in his wild state tended to render him noble and heir to a combination of vices, partly his own, partly bequeathed to him from the pale face, one is forced, even against desire, to conclude that there is unending antagonism between the Indian nature and that with which his well-meaning white brother would endow him. Nature intended him for a savage state. Every instinct, every impulse of his soul inclines him to it. The white race might fall into a barbarous state, and afterwards subjected to the influence of civilization, be reclaimed and prosper. Not so the Indian. He cannot be himself and be civilized. He fades away and dies. Cultivation, such as the white man would give him, deprives him of his identity. Education, strange as it may appear, seems to weaken rather than strengthen his intellect. Where do we find any specimens of educated Indian eloquence, comparing with that of such native untutored orders as Tecumseh, Osceola, Red Jacket, and Logan, 
or to select from those of more recent fame red cloud of the sioux or santata of the kiowas unfortunately for the last named chief whose name has been such a terror to our frontier settlements he will have to be judged for other qualities than that of eloquence attention has more recently been directed to him by his arrest by the military authorities near fort sill indian territory and his transportation to texas for trial by civil court for various murders and depredations alleged to have been committed by him near the texas frontier he has since had his trial and if public rumor is to be credited has been sentenced to death reference will be made to this noted chief in succeeding pages his eloquence and able arguments upon the indian question in various councils to which he was called won for him the deserved title of orator of the plains in his boasting harangue before the general of the army which furnished the evidence of his connection with the murders for which he has been tried and sentenced he stated as a justification for such outrages or rather as the occasion of them that they were in retaliation for his arrest and imprisonment by me some three years ago as there are two sides to most questions even if one be wrong when the proper time arrives a brief account of santata's arrest and imprisonment with the causes leading thereto will be given in these sketches one of the favorite remarks of santata in his orations and one to which other chiefs often indulge in being thrown out as a glittering generality meaning much or little as they may desire but most often the latter was that he was tried of making war and desired now to follow the white man's road it is scarcely to be presumed that he found the gratifications of this oft-expressed desire in recently following the white man's road to texas under strong guard and heavily manacled with hanging to the indian the most dreaded of all deaths plainly in the perspective aside however from his character for restless barbarity and actively in conducting merciless forays against our exposed frontiers santetta is a remarkable man remarkable for his powers of oratory and determined warfare against the advances of civilization and his opposition to the abandonment of his accustomed mode of life and its exchange for the quiet unexciting uneventful life of a reservation indian if i were an indian i often think that i would greatly prefer to cast my lot among those of my people who adhered to the free open plains rather than to submit to the confined limits of a reservation there to be the recipient of the blessed benefits of civilization with its vices thrown in without stint or measure the indian can never be permitted to view the question in this deliberate way he is neither a luxury nor necessary of life he can hunt roam and camp when and wheresoever he pleases provided always that in so doing he does not run contrary to the requirements of civilization in its advancing trend when the soil which he has claimed and hunted over for so long a time is demanded by this to him insatiable monster there is no appeal he must yield or like the car of juggernaut it will roll merrilessly over him destroying as it advances destiny seems to have so willed it and the world looks on and nods its approval at best the history of our indian tribes no matter from what the standpoint is regarded affords a melancholy picture of loss of life two hundred years ago it required millions to express in numbers the indian population while at the present time less than half the number of thousands will suffice for the purpose where and why have they gone ask the saxon race since whose introduction into an occupation of the country these vast changes have been effected but little idea can be formed of the terrible inroads which disease before unknown to them have made upon their numbers war has contributed its share it is true 
but disease alone has done much to depopulate many of the indian tribes it is stated that the smallpox was first introduced among them by the white man in eighteen thirty seven and that in the short space of one month six tribes lost by this disease alone twelve thousand persons confusion sometimes arises from the division of the indians into nations tribes and bands a nation is generally a confederation of tribes which have sprung from a common stock or origin the tribe is intended to embrace all bands and villages claiming a common name and is presided over by a head chief while each band or village is presided over by one or more subordinate chiefs but all acknowledging a certain allegiance to the head or main village this division cannot always be accounted for it arises sometimes from necessity where the entire tribe is a large one and it is difficult to produce game and grazing in one locality sufficient for all in such cases the various bands are not usually separated by any great distance but regulate their movements so as to be able to act in each other's behalf sometimes a chief more warlike than the others who favors war and conquest at all times and refuses to make peace even when his tribe assents to it will separate himself with those who choose to unite their fortunes with his from the remainder of the tribe and act for the time independently such character produces endless trouble his village becomes a shelter and rendezvous for all the restless spirits of the tribe while the latter is or pretends to be at peace this band continues to make war yet when pressed or pursued avails itself of the protection of those who are supposed to be peaceable having hurriedly sketched the country in which we shall find it necessary to go and glanced at certain theories calculated to shed some light on the origin and destiny of the indian tribes the succeeding pages will be devoted to my personal experience on the plains commencing with the expedition of major general hancock in the spring of eighteen sixty seven end of chapter two This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 3 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There are two classes of people who are always eager to get up an Indian war, the Army and our frontiersmen. I quote from an editorial on the Indian question which not long since appeared in the columns of one of the leading New York daily newspapers. That this statement was honestly made I do not doubt, but that instead of being true it could not have been further from the truth I will attempt to show. I assert, and all candid persons familiar with the subject will sustain the assertion, that of all classes of population, the army and the people living on the frontier entertain the greatest dread of an Indian war, and are willing to make the greatest sacrifices to avoid its horrors. This is a proposition, the assertion of which almost carries its proof with it. Under the most auspicious circumstances, and in time of peace with the Indians, the life of an army officer on the plains or along the frontier is, at best, one involving no little personal discomfort, and demanding the sacrifices of many of the luxuries and benefits which he could obtain were he located within the limits of civilization. To many officers, service in the West amounts almost to social exile. Some can have their families with or near them. There is a limited opportunity for social intercourse. Travel from states to across the plains, either for business or pleasure, is uninterrupted and male facilities with friends and relations in the states are maintained. An Indian war changes all this. The troops must prepare to take the field, provided with but few comforts necessarily limited in this respect by the amount of transportation, which on the plains is narrowed down to the smallest practicable the soldier bids adieu, often a final one, to the dear ones of home, of with his comrades in arms set out, no matter how inclement the season, to seek what? 
fame and glory how many military men have reaped laurels from their indian campaigns does he strive to win with the approving smile of his countrymen that is indeed in this particular instance a difficult task for let him act as he may in conducting or assisting in a campaign against the indians if he survives a campaign he can feel assured of this fact that one half of his fellow citizens at home will revile him for his zeal and pronounce his success if he achieves any a massacre of poor defenseless harmless indians while the other half if his efforts to chastise the common enemy are not crowned with satisfactory results will cry down with him down with the regular army and give us brave volunteers who can serve the government in other ways besides eating rations and drawing pay an unsuccessful campaign under which head nineteen out of twenty may reasonably be classed satisfies no portion of the public and greatly dissatisfies that portion of the western population whose knowledge of the murders and depredations committed by the indians is unlikely that of the people of the states further east of too recent origin to be swept away by false notions of clemency during the continuance of the campaign both officers and soldiers are generally cut off from all communications with friends left behind couriers sent as bearers of a few dispatches and letters are sometimes under cover of the night and enabled to make their way back to the forts but even these fail sometimes i now recollect the circumstance of two trusty scouts being sent with dispatches and a small mail to make their way from the southern portion of kansas to fort dodge on the arkansas when we saw them again we beheld their lifeless mangled remains their bodies pierced with numerous arrows and mutilated almost beyond recognition our letters scattered here and there by the savages who had torn open the little canvas mail bag in search of plunder the indians had surrounded these faithful fellows when within about ten miles of the end of their perilous journey the numerous empty cartridge shells which lay around and near the bodies of the two men proved how persistently and bravely they had struggled for their lives the opening of an indian campaign is also the signal for the withdrawal of all privileges and enjoyments such as leaves of absence visits from eastern friends hunting and pleasure parties of all kinds the reception from the east of all luxuries and delicacies for the table and of all the current literature such as the numerous railroads being constructed in the west particularly the two pacifics render easy of procurement ceases and not only the private soldier but the officer is limited in his mess fare to an indifferent portion of the ordinary ration it is probable or reasonable that these objects and results the principles of one generally so far as the army as individuals is concerned would be considered sufficient to render either officer or soldiers eager to get up an indian war i have yet to make the acquaintance of that officer of the army who in time of undisturbed peace desired a war with the indians on the contrary the army is the indian's best friend so long as the latter desires to maintain friendship it is pleasant at all times and always interesting to have a village of peaceful indians locate their lodges near our frontier posts or camps the daily visits of the indians from the most venerable chief to the strap papooses their rude interchange of civilities their barterings races dances legends strange customs and fantastic ceremonies all combine to render them far more agreeable as friendly neighbors than as crafty bloodthirsty enemies as to the frontiersman he has everything to lose even to life and nothing to gain by an indian war his object is to procure a fat contract or a market for his produce adds the journal from which the opening lines of this chapter are quoted this seems plausible and likely enough but does that journal and do the people who believe on this question as it does know that there are two reasons more are not required why its statement is a very great error 
First, our frontier farmers, busily employed as they are in opening up their farms, never have any produce to dispose of, but consider themselves fortunate if they have sufficient for their personal wants. They are never brought in contact with the Indian except when the latter makes a raid or incursion of at least hundreds of miles and attacks the settlements. It is another case of Mohammed in the mountain. The frontiersman never goes beyond the settlements. The Indian forsakes his accustomed hunting grounds when ambitions of obtaining scalps or plunder and visits the settlements. The only ground upon which the frontiersman can be accused of inspiring or inciting an Indian war with the Indian is that when supplied to buy the latter to surrender his life, family, and property, scalp thrown in, he stoutly refuses, and sometimes employs force to maintain this refusal. I have shown that this absurd class of the pioneers of civilization have no hand in the fat contracts. Who are the fortunate parties? With but rare exceptions, our most expensive expeditions against the Indians on the plains have been supplied by contracts made with parties far inside the limits of civilization, who probably never saw a hostile Indian, and who never even visited the Indian country. The supplies are purchased far from the frontiers, in the rich and thickly settled portions of the states, then shipped by rail and boat to the most available military post, from which point they are generally drawn by huge trains of army wagons or carried on pack animals. Of the many important expeditions organized to operate in the Indian country, none perhaps of late years has excited more general and unfriendly comment considering the slight loss of life inflicted upon the Indians than the expedition organized and led in person by Major General Hancock in the spring of 1867. The cliché generally known as the Indian Ring were particularly male violent and bitter in their denunciations of General Hancock for precipitating, as they expressed it, an Indian war. This expedition was quite formidable in appearance, being made up of eight troops of cavalry, seven companies of infantry, and one battery of light artillery, numbering together about 1,400 men. As General Hancock at the time and since has been so often accused of carelessly bringing on an Indian war, a word and explanation may not be amiss. Being in command of the cavalry connected with the expedition, I had ample and frequent opportunities for learning the true purposes and objects of the march into the heart of the Indian country. I know no better mode of explaining these than by quoting the following extract from letters written by General Hancock to the agents of the various tribes with which we expected to be brought in contact. I have the honor to state for your information that I am at present preparing an expedition to the plains which will soon be ready to move. My object in doing so at this time is to convince the Indians within the limits of this department that we are able to punish any of them who may molest travelers across the plains, or who may commit other hostilities against the whites. We desire to avoid, if possible, any troubles with the Indians, and to treat them with justice and according to the requirements of our treaties with them. And I wish especially in my dealings with them to act through the agents of the Indian Department as far as it is possible so to do. If you as their agent can arrange these matters satisfactorily with them, we will be pleased to defer the whole subject to you. In case of your inability to do so, I would be pleased to have you accompany me when I visit the country of your tribes to show that the officers of the government are acting in harmony. I will be pleased to talk with any of the chiefs whom we may meet. Surely there was no hostile intent here expressed. In another communication to the agents of different tribes, General Hancock, in referring to certain murders which have been recently committed, and which have been traced to the tribes in question said, These cases will now be left entirely in the hands of the Indian Department, 
and I do not expect to make war against any of the Indians of your agency unless they commence war against us. It may be asked, what had the Indians done to make this incursion necessary? They had been guilty of numerous thefts and murders during the preceding summer and fall, but none of which had they been called to account. They had attacked the stations of the overland mail route, killed the employees, burned the station, and captured the stock. Citizens have been murdered in their homes on the frontier of Kansas. Murders have been committed on the Arkansas route. The principal perpetrators of these acts were the Cheyennes and Sioux. The agent of the former, if not a party to the murder at the Arkansas, knew who the guilty persons were, yet took no steps to bring the murderers to punishment. Such a course would have had interfered with his trade and profits. It was not to punish for these sins of the past that the expedition was set on foot, but rather by its imposing appearance and its early presence in the Indian country to check or intimidate the Indians from a repetition of their late conduct. This was deemed particularly necessary from the fact that the various tribes from which they had the greatest cause to anticipate trouble had during the winter through their leading chiefs and warriors threatened that as soon as the grass was up in the spring and combined outbreak would take place along the entire frontier and especially against the main routes of travel to assemble the tribes for the desired consul word was sent early in march to the agents of those tribes who it was desirable to meet the agents sent runners to the villages inviting them to meet us at some point near the arkansas river general hancock with the artillery and six company of infantry reached fort riley kansas from fort leavenworth by rail the last week in march here he was joined by four companies of the seventh cavalry and an additional company of the thirty seventh infantry it was at this point that i joined the expedition and as a very fair sample of the laurels which military men may win in an indian campaign by a zealous discharge of what they deem their duty i will here state in parentheses that after engaging in the expedition some of the events of which i am about to relate and undergoing fatigue privations and dangers equal to those of a campaign during the rebellion i found myself at the termination of the campaign again at fort riley in arrest this is not mentioned in a fault-finding spirit i have no fault to find it is said that blessings sometimes come in disguise such proved to be true in this instance although i must say the disguise for some little time was most perfect from fort riley we marched to fort harker a distance of ninety miles where our force was strengthened by the addition of two more troops of cavalry halting only long enough to replenish our supplies we next directed our march towards fort larned near the arkansas about seventy miles to the southeast a march from the third to the seventh of april brought us to fort larned the agent for the comanches and the kiowas accompanied us at fort larne we fought against the agents of the cheyennes arapahoes and apaches from the latter we learned that he had as requested sent runners to the chiefs of his agency inviting them to the council and that they had agreed to assemble near fort larne on the tenth of the month requesting that the expedition would remain there until that date to this request general hancock acceded on the ninth of april while in camp awaiting the council which was to be held the following day a terrible snowstorm occurred lasting all day until late in the evening it was our good fortune to be in camp rather than on the march had it been otherwise we could not well have escaped without loss of life from the severe cold and blinding snow the cavalry horses suffered seriously and were only preserved by doubling their rations of oats while to prevent their being frozen during the intensely cold night which followed the guards were instructed to keep passing along the picket lines with a whip and to keep the horses moving constantly 
The snow was about eight inches in depth. The council, which was to take place the next day, had to be postponed until the return of good weather. Now began the display of a kind of diplomacy for which the Indian is peculiar. The Cheyennes and a band of the Sioux were encamped on the Pawnee Fork, about thirty miles above Fort Larned. They neither desired to move nearer to us, nor have us approach nearer to them. On the morning of the 11th, they sent us word that they had started to visit us, but discovering a large herd of buffalo near their camp, they had stopped to procure a supply of meat. This message was not received with much confidence, nor was a buffalo hunt deemed of sufficient importance to justify the Indians in breaking their engagement. General Hancock decided, however, to delay another day, when if the Indians still failed to come in, he would move his command to the vicinity of their village and hold the conference there. Orders were issued on the evening of the 12th for the march to be resumed on the following day. Later in the evening, two chiefs of the dog soldiers, a band comprised of the most warlike and troublesome Indians on the plains, chiefly made up of Cheyennes, visited our camp. They were accompanied by a dozen warriors, and expressed a desire to hold a conference with General Hancock, to which he assented. A large council fire was built in front of the General Hancock's tent, and all the officers of his command assembled there. A tent had been erected for the accommodation of the chiefs, a short distance from the generals. Before they could feel equal to the occasion, and in order to obtain time to collect their thoughts, they desired that supper might be prepared for them, which was done. When finally ready, they advanced from their tent to the council fire in single file, accompanied by their agent and an interpreter. Arrived at the fire, another brief delay ensued. No matter how pressing or momentous the occasion, an Indian invariably declines to engage in a council until he has filled his pipe and gone through with the important ceremony of a smoke. This attended to, the chiefs announced that they were ready to talk. They were then introduced to the principal officers of the group, and seemed much struck with the flashy uniforms of the few artillery officers who were present in all the glory of red horsehair plumes, aglets, etc., the chiefs seemed puzzled to determine whether these insignia designated chieftains or medicine men. General Hancock began the conference by a speech in which he explained to the Indians his purpose in coming to see them, and what he expected of them in the future. He particularly informed them that he was not there to make war, but to promote peace. Then expressing his regret that more of the chiefs had not visited him, he announced his intention of proceeding on the morrow with his command to the vicinity of their village, and there holding a council with all the chiefs. Tall Bull, a fine, warlike-looking chieftain, replied to General Hancock, but his speech contained nothing important, being made up of allusions to the great growing scarcity of the buffalo, his love for the white man, and the usual hint that a donation in the way of refreshments would be highly acceptable. He added that he would have nothing new to say at the village. Several years prior to the events referred to, our people had captured from the Indians two children. I believe they were survivors of the Chivington Massacre at Sand Creek, Colorado. These children had been kindly cared for, and were being taught to lead a civilized mode of life. Their relatives, however, made demands for them, and we by treaty stipulation agreed to deliver them up. One of them, a little girl, had been cared for kindly in a family living near Denver, Colorado. The other, a boy, had been carried east to the States, and it was with great difficulty that the government was able to learn his whereabouts and obtain possession of him. He was finally discovered, however, and sent to General Hancock to be by him delivered up to his tribe. He accompanied the expedition and was quite a curiosity for the time being. He was dressed comfortably, in accordance with civilized custom, and having been taken from his people at so early an age, 
was apparently satisfied with the life he led. The Indians who came to our camp expressed a great desire to see him, and when he was brought into their presence, they exhibited no emotion, such as white men under similar circumstances might be expected to show. They evidently were not pleased to see him clothed in the white man's dress. A little fellow, then some eight or ten years of age, seemed little disposed to go back to his people. I saw him the following year in the village of his tribe. He then had lost all trace of civilization. He had forgotten his knowledge of the English language, and was as shy and suspicious of the white men as any of his dusty comrades. From older persons of the tribe we learned that their first act, after obtaining possession of him, was to deprive him of his store clothes, and in their stead substitute the blanket and leggings. Rightly, concluding that the Indians did not intend to come to our camp as they had first agreed to, it was decided to move nearer their village. On the morning following the conference held with the two chiefs of the dog soldiers, our entire force therefore marched from Fort Larne up Pawnee Fork in the direction of the main village, encamping the first night about twenty-one miles from the fort. Several parties of the Indians were seen in our advance during the day, evidently watching our movements, while a heavy smoke seemed to rise in the direction of the Indian village, indicating that something more than usual was going on. The smoke we afterward learned arose from the burning grass. The Indians, thinking to prevent us from encamping in their vicinity, had set fire and burned all the grass from miles in the direction from which they were expecting us. Before we arrived at our campground, we were met by several chiefs and warriors belonging to the Cheyennes and Sioux. Among the chiefs were Pawnee Killer of the Sioux and White Horse of the Cheyennes. It was arranged that these chiefs should accept our hospitality and remain with us during the night, and in the morning all the chiefs of the two tribes then in the village were to come to General Hancock's headquarters and hold a council. On the morning of the 14th, Pawnee Killer left our camp at an early hour for the purpose, as he said, of going to the village to bring in the other chiefs to the council. Nine o'clock had been agreed upon as the hour at which the council should assemble. The hour came, but the chiefs did not. Now an Indian council is only often an important but always an interesting occasion, and somewhat like a famous recipe for making a certain dish, the first thing necessary in holding an Indian council is to get the Indian. Half past nine o'clock came, and still we were lacking this one important part of the council. At this juncture, Bull Bear, an influential chief among the Cheyennes, came in and reported that the chiefs were on their way to our camp, but would not be able to reach it for some time. This was a mere artifice to secure delay. General Hancock informed Bull Bear that as the chiefs could not arrive for some time, he would move his forces up the stream nearer to the village, and the council could be held at our camp that night. To this proposition Bull Bear gave his assent. At 11 a.m. we resumed the march and had proceeded but a few miles when we witnessed one of the finest and most imposing military displays prepared according to the Indian art of war, which it has ever been my lot to behold. It was nothing more or less than an Indian line of battle drawn directly across our line of march, as if to say, thus far, and no further. Most of the Indians were mounted. All were bedecked in their brightest colors, their heads crowned with the brilliant war bonnet, their lances bearing the crimson pennant, bows strung, and quivers full of barbed arrows. In addition to these weapons, which with the hunting knife and tomahawk are considered as forming the armament of the warrior, each one was supplied with either a breech-loading rifle or revolver, sometimes with both, the latter obtained through the wise foresight and strong love of fair play which prevails in the Indian department, which seeing that its wards are determined to a fight, is equally determined that there shall be no advantage taken, but that these two sides shall be armed alike, proving too, in this manner, the wonderful liberality of our government, 
which not only is able to furnish its soldiers with the latest improved style of breech loaders to defend it and themselves, but is equally able and willing to give the same pattern of arms to their common foe. The only difference is, is that the soldier, if he loses his weapon, is charged double price for it, while to avoid making any such charge against the Indian, his weapons are given with him without conditions attached. In the line of battle before us there were several hundred Indians, while further to the rear and at the different distances were other organized bodies acting apparently as reserved. Still further were small detachments who seemed to perform the duty of couriers and were held in readiness to convey messages to the village. The ground beyond was favorable for an extended view, allowing the eye to sweep the plain for several miles. As far as the eye could reach, small groups of individuals could be seen in the direction of the village. These were evidently parties of observation, whose sole object was to learn the result of our meeting with the main body and hasten with the news to the village. For a few moments, appearances seemed to foreshadow anything but a peaceful issue. The infantry was in the advance, followed closely by the artillery, while my command, the cavalry, was marching on the flank. General Hancock, who was riding with his staff at the head of the column, coming suddenly in view of the wild, fantastic battle array, which extended far to our right and left, and not more than a half a mile in our front, hastily sent orders to the infantry, artillery, and cavalry to form a line of battle, evidently determined that if war was intended, we should be prepared. The cavalry, being the last to form on the right, came into line on a gallop, and without waiting to align the ranks carefully, the command was given to draw saber. As the bright blades flashed from their scabbards, into the morning sunlight and the infantry brought their muskets to a carry a most beautiful and wonderfully interesting sight was spread out before and around us presenting a contrast which to a military eye could be but striking here in battle array facing each other we were the representatives of the civilized and barbarous warfare the one, with but a few modifications, stood clothed in the same rude style of dress, bearing the same pattern shield and weapon, chant his ancestors, and born centuries before. The other confronted him in the dress and supplied with the implements of war, which the most advanced stage of civilization had pronounced the most perfect. Was the comparative superiority of these two classes to be subjected to the mere tests of war here? Such seemed the prevailing impression on both sides. All was eager anxiety and expectation. Neither side seemed to comprehend the object or intentions of the other. Each was waiting for the other to deliver the first blow. A more beautiful battleground could not have been chosen. Not a bush or even the slightest irregularity of ground intervened between the two lines which now stood frowning and facing each other. Chiefs could be seen riding along the line as if directing and exhorting their braves to deeds of heroism. After a few moments of painful suspense, General Hancock, accompanied by General A. J. Smith and other officers, rode forward, and through an interpreter, invited the chiefs to meet us midway for the purpose of an interview in response to this invitation roman nose bearing a white flag accompanied by bull bear white horse gray beard and medicine wolf on the part of the cheyennes and pawnee killer bad wound tall bear that walks under the ground left hand left bear and little bear on the part of the sioux rode forward to the middle of the open space between the two lines here we shook hands with all the chiefs, most of them exhibiting unmistakable signs of gratification at this apparently peaceful termination of our re-encounter. General Hancock very naturally inquired the object of the hostile attitude displayed before us, saying to the chiefs that if war was their object, we were ready then and there to participate. Their immediate answer was that they did not desire war, but were peacefully disposed. They were then told that we would continue our march towards the village, 
and encamp near it, but would establish such regulations that none of the soldiers would be permitted to approach or disturb them. An arrangement was then effected by which the chiefs were to assemble at General Hancock's headquarters as soon as our camp was pitched. The interview then terminated, and the Indians moved off in the direction of their village, we following leisurely in the rear. A march of a few miles brought us in sight village which was situated in a beautiful grove on the banks of the stream up which we had been marching the village consisted of upwards of three hundred lodges a small fraction over half belonging to the cheyennes and the remainder to the sioux like all indian encampments the ground chosen was a most romantic spot and at the same time fulfilled every aspect the requirements of a good camping ground wood, water, and grass were abundant. The village was placed on a wide, level plateau, while on the north and west, at a short distance off, rose high bluffs, which admirably served as a shelter against the cold winds, which at that season of the year prevail from these directions. Our tents were pitched within a half a mile of the village. Guards were placed between, to prevent intrusion upon our part. A few of the Indian ponies found grazing near our camp were caught and returned to them, to show that our intentions were at least neighborly. We had scarcely pitched our tents when Romanos, Bull Bear, Gray Beard, and Medicine Wolf, all prominent chiefs of the Cheyennes, came into camp with the information that upon our approach their women and children have all fled from the village, alarmed by the presence of so many soldiers, and imagining a second Chivalton massacre to be intended. General Hancock insisted they should all return, promising protection and good treatment to all, that if the camp was abandoned he would hold it responsible. The chiefs then stated their belief in their ability to recall the fugitives, could they be furnished with horses to overtake them. This was accordingly done, and two of them set out mounted on two of our horses. An agreement was also entered into at the same time that one of our interpreters, Ed Gurrier, a half-breed Cheyenne who was in the employ of the government, should remain in the village and report every two hours as to whether any Indians were leaving the village. This was about seven o'clock in the evening. At half-past nine the half-breed returned to headquarters with the intelligence that all the chiefs and warriors were saddling up to leave, under circumstance showing that they had no intention of returning such as packing up such articles as could be carried with them, and cutting and destroying their lodges, this last being done to obtain small pieces for temporary shelter. I had retired to my tent, which was located some few hundred yards from that of General Hancock's, when a messenger from the latter awakened me with the information that General Hancock desired my presence at his tent. Imagining a movement on the part of the Indians, I made no delay in responding to the summons. General Hancock briefly stated the situation of affairs, and directed me to mount my command as quickly and as silently as possible, surround the Indian village, and prevent the departure of its inhabitants. Easily said, but not so easily done. Under ordinary circumstances, silence not being necessary, I could have returned to my camp, and by a few blasts from the trumpet placed every soldier in the saddle almost as quickly as it has taken time to write this sentence. No bugle calls must be sounded. We were to adopt some of the stealth of the Indian. How successfully remains to be seen. By this time every soldier, officers as well as men, was in his tent sound asleep. How to awaken them and impart to each the necessary order? First going to the tent of the adjutant, and arousing him, I procured an experienced assistant in my labors. Next, the captains of the companies were awakened and orders imparted to them. They, in turn, transmitted the order to the first sergeant, who similarly aroused the men. It has often surprised me to observe the alacrity with which disciplined soldiers experienced in campaigning will hasten to prepare themselves for the march in an emergency like this. No questions are asked, no time is wasted. A soldier's toilet on an Indian campaign is a simple affair and requires little time for arranging. His clothes are gathered up hurriedly, no matter how, so long as he retains possession of them. 
The first object is to get his horse saddled and bridled, and until this is done, his own toilet is a matter of secondary importance, and one button or hook must do the duty of a half a dozen. When his horse is ready for the mount, the rider will be seen completing his own equipment. Stray buttons will receive attention, arms to be overhauled, spurs restrapped. Then, if there still remain a few spare moments, a homely black pipe is filled and lighted, and the soldier's preparation is completed. The night was all that could be desired for the success of our enterprise. The air was mild and pleasant. The moon, although nearly full, kept almost consistently behind the clouds, as if to screen us from our hazardous undertaking. I say hazardous because there were none of us who imagined for one moment that if the Indians discovered us in our attempt to surround them and their village, we would escape without a fight. A fight, too, in which the Indians sheltered behind the trunks of the steady forest trees under which their lodges were pitched, would possess all the advantage. General Hancock, anticipating that the Indians would discover our approach, and that a fight would ensue, ordered the artillery and the infantry under arms to await the results of our moonlight adventure. My command was soon in the saddle, and silently making its way towards the village. Instructions had been given forbidding all conversation, except in a whisper. Sabres were so disposed as to prevent clanging. Taking a campfire which we could see in the village as our guiding point, we made a detour, so as to place the village between ourselves and the infantry. Occasionally the moon would peep out from behind the clouds and enable us to catch a hasty glance at the village. Here and there, under the thick foliage, we could see the white, conical-shaped lodges. Were their inmates slumbering, unaware of our close proximity? Or were their dusky defenders concealed, as well they might have been, along the banks of the Pawnee, quietly awaiting our approach, and prepared to greet us with their well-known war-whoop? These were questions that were probably suggested to the mind of each individual of my command. If we were discovered approaching in the stealthy, suspicious manner which characterized our movements, the hour being midnight, it would require a more confiding nature than that of the Indian to assign a friendly or peaceful motive to our conduct. The same flashes of moonlight which gave us hurried glimpses of the village enabled us to see our own column of horsemen stretching its silent length far into the dim darkness and winding its course like some huge anaconda about to envelop its victim. The method by which it was determined to establish a cordon of armed troopers about the fated village was to direct the march in a circle, with the village in the center, the commanding officer of each rear troop halting his command at the proper point, and deploying his men similarly to a line of skirmishes, the entire circle, when thus formed, facing towards the village, and distant from it perhaps a few hundred yards. No sooner was our line completely formed than the moon, as if deemed darkness no longer essential to our success, appeared from behind her screen and lighted up the entire scene. A beautiful scene it was. The great circle of troops, each individual of which sat on his steed silent as a statue. The beautiful and in some places dense foliage of the cotton trees, sheltering and shading the bleached skin-clad lodges of the red man, while in the midst of all murmured undisturbedly in its channel the little stream on whose banks the village was located, all combined to produce an artistic effect, as beautiful as it was interesting. But we were not there to study artistic effects. The next step was to determine whether we had captured an inhabited village involving almost necessarily a fierce conflict with its savage occupants, or whether the red man had again proven too wily and crafty for his more civilized brothers. Directing the entire line of troops to remain mounted with carbines held at the advance, I dismounted 
and taking with me Gurrier, the half-breed, Dr. Coates, one of our medical staff, and Lieutenant Moylan, the adjutant, proceeded on our hands and knees towards the village. The prevailing opinion was that the Indians were still asleep. I desired to approach near enough to the lodges to enable the half-breed to hail the village in the Indian tongue, and if possible establish friendly relations at once. It became a question of prudence with us, which we discussed in whispers as we proceeded on our tramp, 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 the boys are creeping. How far from our horses and how near to the village we dared to go. If so few of us were discovered entering the village in this questionable manner, it was more than probable that, like the returners of stolen property, we should be suitably rewarded and no questions asked. The opinions of Gurrier, the half-breed, were eagerly sought for and generally deferred to. His wife, a full-blooded Cheyenne, was a resident of the village. This, with him, was an additional reason for wishing a peaceful termination to our efforts. When we had passed over two-thirds of the distance between our horses and the village, it was deemed best to make our presence known. Thus far not a sound had been heard to disturb the stillness of the night. Gurrier called out at the top of his voice in the Cheyenne tongue. The only response came from the throats of a score or more of Indian dogs which set up a fierce barking. At the same time, one or two of our party asserted that they saw figures moving beneath the trees. Gurrier repeated his summons with no better results than before. A hurried consultation ensued. The presence of so many dogs in the village was regarded by the half-breed as almost positive assurance that the Indians were still there. Yet it was difficult to account for their silence. Gurrier, in a loud tone, repeated who he was, and that our mission was a friendly one. Still, no answer. He then gave it as his opinion that the Indians were on the alert, and were probably waiting in the shadow of the trees for us to approach nearer, where they would pounce upon us. This comforting opinion induced another conference. We must ascertain the truth of the matter. Our party could do this as well as a larger number, and go back and send another party in our stead could not be thought of. Forward was the verdict. Each one grasped his revolver, resolved to do his best, whether it was in running or fighting. I think most of us would have preferred to take our own chances at running. We had approached near enough to see that some of the lodges were detached some distance from the main encampment. Selecting the nearest of these, we directed our advance on it, while all of us were full of the spirit of adventure and were further encouraged with the idea that we were in the discharge of our duty. There was scarcely one of us who would not have felt more comfortable if we could have got back to our horses without loss of pride. Yet nothing under the circumstances but a positive order would have induced any one to withdraw. The doctor, who was a great wag, even in his moments of greatest danger, could not restrain his propensities in this direction. When everything before us was being weighed and discussed in the most serious matter, he remarked, General, this recalls to mind those beautiful lines. Backward, turn backward, O time, in thy flight. Make me a child again just for one night. This night of all others. We shall meet the doctor again before daylight, but under different circumstances. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 4 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cautiously approaching on all fours to within a few yards of the nearest lodge, occasionally halting and listening to discover evidence as to whether the village was deserted or not, we finally decided that the Indians had fled before the arrival of the cavalry, and that none of the empty lodges were before us. 
this conclusion somewhat emboldened as well as accelerated our progress arriving at the first lodge one of our party raised a curtain or mat which served as a door and the doctor and myself entered the interior of the lodge was dimly lighted by the decaying embers of a small fire built in the centre all around us were to be seen the unusual adornments and articles which constitute the household effects of an indian family buffalo robes were spread like carpets over the floor head mats used to recline upon were arranged as if for the comfort of their owners parfleches a sort of indian box with their contents apparently undisturbed were to be found carefully stowed away under the edges or borders of the lodge there with the doormats paint bags and rawhide ropes and other articles of indian equipment were left as if the owners had only absented themselves for a brief period to complete the picture of an indian lodge over the fire hung a camp kettle in which by means of a dim light of the fire we could see what had been intended for the supper of the late occupants of the lodge the doctor ever on the alert to discover additional items of knowledge whether pertaining to history or science snuffed the savory odors which arose from the dark recesses of the mysterious kettle casting about the lodge for some instrument to aid him in his pursuit of knowledge he found a horn spoon with which he began his investigation of the contents finally succeeding in getting possession of a fragment which might have been the half of a duck or rabbit judging merely from its size ah said the doctor in his most complacent manner here is the opportunity i have long been waiting for i have often desired to test and taste of the indian mode of cooking what do you suppose this is holding up the dripping morsel unable to obtain the desired information the doctor whose naturally good appetite had been sensibly sharpened by his recent exercise of la de croupe set to with a will and ate heartily at the mysterious contents of the kettle what can this be again inquired the doctor he was only satisfied on one point that it was delicious of dish fit for a king just then gurrier the half-breed entered the lodge he could solve the mystery having spent years among the indians to him the doctor appealed for information fishing out a huge piece and attacking it with the voracity of a hungry wolf he was not long in determining what the doctor had supped so heartily upon his first words settled the mystery why this is dog i will not attempt to repeat the few but emphatic words uttered by the heartily disgusted member of the medical fraternity as he rushed from the lodge other members of our small party had entered other lodges only to find them like the first deserted but little of the furniture belongings to the lodges had been taken, showing how urgent and hasty had been the flight of the owners. To aid in the examination of the village, reinforcements were added to our party, and an exploration of each lodge was determined upon. At the same time, a messenger dispatched to General Hancock, informing him of the flight of the Indians some of the lodges were closed by having bush or timber piled up against the entrance as if to preserve the contents others had huge pieces cut from their sides these pieces evidently being carried away to furnish temporary shelter to the fugitives in most of the lodge the fires were still burning i had entered several without discovering anything important finally in the company with the doctor i arrived at one the interior of which was quite dark, the fire having almost died out. Procuring a lighted faggot, I prepared to explore it, as I had done the others. But no sooner had I entered the lodge than my faggot failed me, leaving me in total darkness. Handing it to the doctor to be relighted, I began feeling my way about the interior of the lodge. I had almost made the circuit when my hand came in contact with a human foot. 
at the same time a voice unmistakably indian and which evidently came from the owner's foot convinced me that i was not alone my first impression was that in their hasty fight the indians had gone off leaving this one asleep my next very naturally related to myself i would have gladly placed myself on the outside of the lodge and there matured plans for interviewing its occupant but unfortunately to reach the entrance of the lodge i must either pass over or round the owner of the before mentioned foot and voice could i have been convinced that among its other possessions there was neither tomahawk nor scalping knife pistol nor war club or any similar article of the noble red man's toilet i would have risked an attempt to escape through the low narrowing opening of the lodge but who ever saw an indian without one or all of these interesting trinkets had i made the attempt i should have expected to encounter either the keen edge of a scalping knife or the blow of the tomahawk and to have engaged in the questionable struggle for life this would not do i crouched in silence for a few moments hoping the doctor would return with the lighted faggot i need not say that each succeeding moment spent in the darkness of that lodge seemed like an age i could hear a slight movement on the part of my unknown neighbor which did not add to my comfort why does not the doctor return at last i discovered the approach of a light on the outside when it neared the entrance i called to the doctor and informed him that an indian was in the lodge and that he had better have his weapon ready for a conflict i had upon discovering the foot drawn my hunting knife from its scabbard and now stood waiting in the denouement with his lighted faggot in one hand and cocked revolver in the other the doctor cautiously entered the lodge and there directly between us wrapped in a buffalo robe lay the cause of my anxiety a little indian girl probably ten years old not a full blood but half-breed she was terribly frightened at finding herself in our hands with none of her people near why was she left behind in this manner gurrier our half-breed interpreter was called in his inquiries were soon answered the little girl who at first was an object of our curiosity became at once an object of pity the indians an unusual thing for them to do toward their own blood had willfully deserted her but this at last was the least of their injuries to her after being shamefully abandoned by the entire village a few of the young men of the tribe returned to the deserted lodge and upon the person of this little girl committed outrages the details of which are too sickening for these pages she was carried to the fort and placed under the care of kind hands and warm hearts where everything was done for her comfort that was possible other parties in exploring the deserted village found an old decrepit indian of the sioux tribe who had also been deserted owing to his infirmities and inability to travel with the tribe he was also kindly cared for by the authorities of the fort nothing was gleaned from our search of the village which might indicate the direction of the flight general hancock on learning the situation of affairs dispatched some companies of infantry to the deserted village with orders to replace the cavalry and protect the village of its contents from disturbance until its final disposition could be determined upon starting my command back to our camp near general hancock's headquarters I galloped on in advance to report the particulars to the general. It was then decided that with eight troops of cavalry I should start in pursuit of the Indians at early dawn on the following morning, April 15th. There was no sleep for my command the remainder of the night, the time being fully occupied in preparation for the march, neither the extent nor the direction of which was known. Mess kits were overhauled and fresh supplies of coffee sugar flour and the other articles which go to supply the soldiers larder were laid in blankets were carefully rolled so as to occupy as little space as possible every useless pound of luggage was discarded for in making a rapid pursuit after indians 
much of the success depends upon the lightness of the order of the march. Saratoga trunks and their accompaniments are at a discount. Never was the old saying that in Rome one must do as the Romans do more aptly illustrates than on an Indian campaign. The Indian, knowing that his safety either on offensive or defensive movements, depends in a great measure upon the speed and endurance of his horse, and takes advantage of every circumstance which will favor either the one or the other. To this end, he divests himself of all superfluous dress and ornament when preparing for rapid movements. The white man, if he hopes for success, must adopt the same rule of action, and encumber his horse as little as possible. Something besides well-filled mess chests and carefully rolled blankets is necessary in preparing for an Indian campaign. Arms must be re-examined, cartridge boxes refilled, so that each man should carry about one hundred rounds of ammunition on his person, while each troop commander must see that in the company wagon there are placed a few boxes of reserve ammunition. Then, when the equipment of the soldier has been attended to, his horse, without whose assistance he is helpless, must be looked after. Loose shoes are tightened by the driving of an additional nail. To accomplish this, one must see the company blacksmith, a soldier, with the few simple tools of his kit on the ground beside him, hurriedly fashioning the last shoe by the uncertain light of the candle held in the hands of the rider of the horse, their mutual labor being varied at times by queries as to, How long shall we be gone? I wonder if we will catch Mr. Lowe. If we do, we'll make it lively for him. So energetic at every one bed that before daylight everything was in readiness for the start, in addition to the regularly organized companies of soldiers which made up the pursuing column, I had with me a detachment of white scouts or plainsmen, and one of friendly Indians, the latter belonging to the tribe of Delawares once so famous in Indian wars. Of the Indians only one could speak English. He acted as an interpreter for the party. Among the white scouts were numbered some of the most noted in their class, the most prominent man among them was Wild Bill, whose highly varied career was made the subject of an illustrated sketch in one of the popular monthly periodicals a few years ago. Wild Bill was a strange character, just the one which a novelist might gloat over. He was a plainsman in every sense of the word, yet unlike any other of his class. In person, he was about six foot one in height, straight as the straightest of the warriors whose implacable foe he was broad shoulders well-formed chest and limbs and a face strikingly handsome a sharp clear blue eye which stared at you straight in the face when in conversation a finely shaped nose inclined to be aquiline a well-turned mouth with lips only partially concealed by a handsome mustache his hair and his complexion were those of the perfect blonde. The former was worn in uncut ringlets falling carelessly over his powerfully formed shoulders. Add to this figure a costume blending the immaculate needless of the dandy with the extravagant taste and style of the frontiersman, and you have Wild Bill, then is now the most famous scout on the plains. Whether on foot or on horseback, he was one of the most perfect types of physical manhood I ever saw. Of his courage, there could be no question. It had been brought to the test on too many occasions to admit a doubt. His skill in the use of the rifle and pistol was unerring, while his deportment was exactly that opposite of what might be expected from a man of his surroundings. It was entirely free from all bluster and bravado. He seldom spoke of himself unless requested to do so. His conversation, strange to say, never bordered either on the vulgar or blasphemous. His influence among the frontiersmen was unbounded. His word was law. And many of the personal quarrels and disturbances which he has checked among his comrades by a simple announcement that this has gone far enough, if need be followed by the ominous warning, 
that when persisted in or renewed the quarreler must settle it with me wild bill is anything but a quarrelsome man yet no one but himself can enumerate the many conflicts in which he has been engaged and which have almost invariably resulted in the death of his adversary i have personal knowledge of at least half a dozen men whom he has at various times killed one of these being at the time a member of my command others have been severely wounded yet he always escapes unhurt on the plains every man openly carries his belt with its invariable appendages knife and revolver often two of the latter wild bill always carries two handsome ivory handled revolvers of the large size he was never seen without them where this is the common custom brawls or personal difficulties are seldom if ever settled by blows the quarrel is not from a word to a blow but from a word to the revolver and he who can draw and fire first is the best man no civil law reaches him none is applied for in fact there is no law recognized beyond the frontier but that of might makes right should death result from a quarrel as it usually does no coroner's jury is impaneled to learn the cause of the death and the survivor is not arrested but instead of these old-fashioned proceedings a meeting of citizens takes place the survivor is requested to be present when the circumstances of the homicide are inquired into and the unfailing verdict of justifiable self-defense and so on is pronounced and the law stands vindicated that justice is often deprived of a victim there is not a doubt yet in all the many affairs of this kind in which wild bill has performed a part and which have come to my knowledge there is not a single instance in which the verdict of twelve fair-minded men would not be pronounced in his favor that the even tenor of his way continues to be disturbed by the little events of this description may be inferred from an item which has been floating lately through the columns of the press and which states that the funeral of jim bloodson who was killed the other day by wild bill took place to-day and then adds the funeral expenses were borne by wild bill what could be more thoughtful than this not only to send a fellow mortal out of the world but to pay the expenses of the transit gurrier the half-breed also accompanied the expedition as guide and interpreter everything being in readiness to move the column began its march and reached the vicinity of the village before day had fully dawned here a brief halt was necessary until the light was sufficient to enable our scouts to discover the trail of the indians when they finally set to discover this their method was highly interesting and resembled not a little the course of a thorough sportsman who with a well-trained pointer or setter thoroughly ranges and beats the ground in search of his coveted game the indian had set out on their flight soon after dark the preceding night the heavy frost covered the ground and rendered it difficult to detect the trail from the many pony tracks which were always found in the vicinity of a village we began to grow impatient at the delay when one of the indians gave the hallo as a signal that the trail was discovered and again the column marched forward our order of the march was for the indian and the white scouts to keep a few hundred paces in advance of the troops so that momentary delays upon the part of those watching and following the trail should not extend to the troops the indians on leaving the village had anticipated pursuit and had adopted measures to mislead us in order to prevent their trail from being easily recognizable they had departed in many detachments or parties almost as there were families or lodges in the village each party taking a different direction from the others having personally agreed of course upon the general direction and place of reuniting once being satisfied that we were on the right trail no difficulty was found in following it as rapidly as our horses could walk the indians had nearly twelve hours the start of us 
but being encumbered by their families we hope to overhaul them before many days our first obstacle was encountered when we struck walnut creek a small stream running east and west some thirty miles north of the arkansas at that point the banks were so high and abrupt that it was impossible to reach the water's edge let alone clamber up the opposite bank a few of the indians had been able to accomplish this feat as was shown by the tracks on the opposite side but the main band had moved upstream in search of a favorable crossing and we were compelled to do likewise here we found that the indians had called a halt built fires and cooked their breakfast so rapidly had we gained upon them that the fires were burning freshly and the departure of the indians had been so abrupt that they left several ponies with their packs tied to trees one of the packs belonged to the famous chief roman nose who was one of those who met us at the grand gathering just before we reached their village a few days before one of our delawares who made the capture was very proud of the success and was soon seen ornamenting his headdress with the bright crimson feathers taken from the wardrobe of roman nose encouraged by our progress we continued the pursuit as rapidly as a due regard for our horses would permit thus far neither myself nor any of the soldiers had caught sight of any indians but our delaware scouts who were consistently in the advance and on our flanks taking advantage of the bluffs to reconnoiter frequently reported that they saw small parties of indians observing our movements from a distance from positive evidence familiar to those accustomed to the plains we were convinced that we were rapidly gaining upon the indians the earth upturned by the feet of their ponies and by the ends of the trailing lodge poles was almost as damp and fresh as that disturbed by the horses of the command soon we discovered additional signs of encouragement the route now became strewn with various lodge poles and other obstacles peculiar to an indian's outfit showing that they were lightening up so as to facilitate their escape so certain did we feel of our ability to outtrail them that the only question now was one which had often determined the success of military operations would darkness intervene to disappoint us we must imitate the example of the indians and disembarrass ourselves of everything tending to retard our speed the troops would march much faster if permitted to do so than the rate at which our wagons had forced themselves along it was determined to leave the wagons under the escort of one squadron to follow our trail as rapidly as they could while the other three squadrons pushed on in pursuit should darkness settle down before overtaking the indians the advantage was altogether against us as we would be compelled to await daylight to enable us to follow the trail while the indians were free to continue their flight sheltered and aided by the darkness by three o'clock p m we felt that we were almost certain to accomplish our purpose no obstacle seemed to stand in our way the trail was broad and plain and apparently as fresh as our own half an hour or an hour at the furthest seemed only necessary to enable us to dash upon our wily enemy alas for human calculations the indians by means of the small reconnoitering parties observed by our scouts had kept themselves consistently informed regarding our movements and progress they at first risked their safety upon the superior speed and endurance of their ponies a safe reliance when favored by the grass season but in winter this advantage was on our side failing in their first resource they had a second and better method of eluding us so long as they kept united and moved in one body their trail was as plainly to be seen and as easily followed as if made by a heavily laden wagon train we were not called upon to employ time and great watchfulness on the part of our scouts to follow it but when it was finally clear to be seen that the race as it was then being run the white man was sure to win the proverbial cunning of the red man came to his rescue and thwarted the plans of his pursuers 
again dividing his tribe as when first setting out from the village into numerous small parties we were discouraged by seeing the broad well-beaten trail suddenly separate into hundreds of indistinct routes leading fan shape in as many different directions what was to be done the general direction of the main trail before dissolving into so many small ones had been nearly north showing that if undisturbed in their flight the indians would strike the smoky hill overland route cross it then pursue their way northwards to the headwaters of the solomon or republican river or further still to the platte river selecting a central trail we continued our pursuit now being compelled often to halt and verify our course the trail gradually grew smaller and smaller until by five o'clock it had become so faint as to be followed with the greatest difficulty we had been marching exactly twelve hours without halting except to water our horses reluctantly we were forced to go into camp and await the assistance of daylight the delaware scouts continued the pursuit six miles further but returned without accomplishing anything the indians after dividing up into small parties kept up communication with each other by means of columns of signal smoke these signal smokes were to be seen to the west north and east of us but nor nearer than ten miles they only proved to us that we were probably on the trail of the main body as the fires were in front and on both sides of us we had marched over thirty-five miles without halt the delawares having determined the direction of the trail for six miles we would be able next morning to continue that far at least unaided by daylight our wagons overtook us a few hours after we reached camp reveille was sounded at two o'clock the next morning and four o'clock found us again in the saddle and following the guidance of our friendly delawares the direction of our march took us up the valley an almost dry bed of a small stream the delawares thought we might find where the indians had encamped during the night by following the upward course of the stream but in this we were disappointed the trail became more and more indistinct until it was lost in the barren waste over which we were then moving to add to our annoyance the water course had become entirely dry and our guides were uncertain as to whether water could be procured in one day's march in any direction except that from which we had come we were therefore forced to countermarch after reaching a point thirteen miles from our starting place in the morning and retrace our steps until the uncertain stream in whose valley we then were would give us enough water for our wants here i will refer to an incident entirely personal which came very near costing me my life when leaving our camp that morning i felt satisfied that the indians having traveled at least a portion of the night were then many miles in advance of us and there was neither danger nor probability that encountering any of them near the column we were then in a magnificent game country buffalo antelope and smaller game being in abundance on all sides of us although an ardent sportsman i had never hunted the buffalo up to this time consequently was exceedingly desirous of tasting its excitement i had several fine english greyhounds whose speed i was anxious to test with that of the antelope said to be which i believe the fleetest of animals I was mounted on a fine large thoroughbred horse taking with me but one man the chief bugler and calling my dogs around me i galloped ahead of the column as soon as it was daylight for the purpose of having a chase after some antelope which could be seen grazing nearly two miles distance that such a course was rashly imprudent i am ready to admit a stirring gallop of a few minutes brought me near enough to the antelope of which there were a dozen or more to enable the dogs to catch sight of them then the chase began the antelope running in a direction which took us away from the command by availing myself of the turns in the course I was able to keep well in view of the exciting chase until it was evident that the antelope were in no danger of being caught by the dogs which latter had become blown for want of proper exercise 
I succeeded in calling them off and was about to set out on my return to the column. The horse of the chief bugler, being a common bred animal, failed early in the race, and his rider wisely concluded to regain the command so that I was alone. How far I had traveled from the troops I was trying to determine when I discovered a large, dark-looking animal grazing nearly a mile distance. And yet I had never seen a wild buffalo, but I at once recognized this as not only a buffalo, but a very large one. Here was my opportunity. A ravine nearby would enable me to approach unseen until almost within pistol range of my game, Calling my dogs to follow me, I slowly pursued the course of the ravine, giving my horse opportunity to gather himself for a second run. When I emerged from the ravine, I was still several hundred yards from the buffalo, which almost instantly discovered me, and set off as fast as his legs could carry him. Had my horse been fresh, the race would have been a short one, but the preceding long run had not been without effect. How long? for how fast we flew in pursuit, the intense excitement of the chase prevented me from knowing. I only know that even the greyhounds were left behind, until finally my good steed placed himself and me close alongside the game. It may be because this was the first I had seen, but surely of hundreds of thousands of buffaloes which I have since seen, none have corresponded with him in his size and lofty grandeur. My horse was above the average size, yet the buffalo towered even above him. I had carried my revolver in my hand from the moment the race began. Repeatedly could I have placed the muzzle against the shaggy body of the huge beast, by whose side I fairly yelled with wild excitement and delight, yet each time would I withdraw the weapon, as if to prolong the enjoyment of the race. It was a race for life or death yet how different the award from what could be imagined. Still we sped over the springy turf, the high breeding and metal of my horse being plainly visible over that of the huge beast that struggled by his side. Mile after mile was traversed in this way, until the rate and distance began to tell precipitately upon the bison, whose protruding tongue and labored breathing plainly betrayed his distress. Determined to end the chase and bring down my game, I again placed the muzzle of the revolver close to the body of the buffalo, when, as if divining my attention and feeling his inability to escape by flight, he suddenly determined to fight, and at once wheeled it, as only a buffalo can, to gore my horse. So sudden was this movement, and so sudden was the corresponding veering of my horse to avoid the attack, that to retain my control over him, I hastily brought up my pistol hand to the assistance of the other. Unfortunately, as I did, so my finger, in the excitement of the occasion, pressed the trigger, discharged the pistol, and sent the fatal ball into the very brain of the noble animal I rode. Running at full speed, he fell dead in the course of his leap. Quick as though I disengaged myself from the stirrups, and found myself whirling through the air over and beyond the head of my horse. My only thought, as I was describing this trajectory, and my first thought on reaching the terra firma was, what will the buffalo do with me? Although at first inclined to rush upon me, my strange procedure seemed to astonish him. Either that, or pity for the utter helplessness of my condition, inclined him to alter his course, and leave me alone to my own bitter reflections. In a moment the danger into which I had unluckily brought myself stood out in bold relief before me. Under ordinary circumstances the death of my horse would have been serious enough. I was strongly attached to him, had ridden him in battle during the portion of the late war, yet now his death, except in its consequence, was scarcely thought of. Here I was, alone in the heart of Indian country, with warlike Indians known to be in the vicinity. I was not familiar with country. How far I had traveled, or in what direction from the column, I was at a loss to know. In the excitement of the chase I had lost all reckoning. 
Indians were liable to pounce upon me at any moment. My command would not note my absence probably for hours. Two of my dogs overtook me, and with mute glances first at the dead steed, then at me, seemed to inquire to cause of this strange condition of affairs. Their instinct appeared to tell them that they were in misfortune. While I was deliberating what to do, the dogs became uneasy, whined piteously, and seemed eager to leave the spot. In this desire I sympathized with them, but whither should I go? I observed that their eyes were generally turned in one particular direction. This I accepted as my cue, and with one parting look at my horse, and grasping a revolver in each hand, I set out on my uncertain journey. As long as the body of my horse was visible above the horizon, I kept referring to it as my guiding point, and in this way contrived to preserve my direction. This resource soon failed me, and I then had recourse to weeds, buffalo skulls, or any two objects I could find on my line of march. Consistently my eyes kept scanning the horizon, each moment expecting, with reason too, to find myself discovered by Indians. I had traveled in this manner what seemed to me about three or four miles, when far ahead in the distance I saw a column of dust rising. A hasty examination soon convinced me that the dust was produced by one or three causes, white men, Indians, or buffalo. Two to one in my favor at any rate, selecting a ravine where I could crawl away undiscovered should the approaching body prove to be Indians, I called my dogs to my side and concealed myself as well as I could to await developments. The object of my anxious solitude was still several miles distant. Whatever it was, it was approaching in my direction, and was plainly discernible from the increasing columns of dust. Fortunately, I had my field glass slung across my shoulder, and if Indians, I could discover them before they could possibly discover me. Soon. I was able to see the heads of mounted men running in irregular order. This discovery shut out the probability of their being buffaloes, and simplified the question to white men or Indians. Neither during the war did I scan an enemy's battery or approaching column with half the anxious care with which I watched the party then approaching me. For a long time nothing satisfactory could be determined until my eye caught sight of an object which, high above the heads of the approaching riders, told me in unmistakable terms that friends were approaching. It was the cavalry guide on, and never was the sight of stars and stripes more welcome. My comrades were greatly surprised to find me seated on the ground alone and without my horse. A few words explained all. A detachment of my men followed my directions, found my horse, and returned with saddle and other equipments. Another horse, and Richard was himself again, plus a little valuable experience, and minus a valuable horse. In retracing our steps later in the day, in search of water sufficient for camping purposes, we marched over nine miles of our morning route, and at 2 p.m. on April 16th, we went into camp. From this point I wrote a dispatch to General Hancock and sent it back by two of my scouts, who set out on their journey as soon as it was dark. It was determined to push on and reach the Smoky Hill route as soon as possible, and give the numerous stage stations along that route notice of the presence of warlike Indians. This was before the Pacific Railroad or its branches had crossed the plains. Resting our animals from 2 until 7 p.m., we were again in the saddle and setting out for a night march, our only guide being the North Star. We hoped to strike the stage route near a point called Downey Station. After riding all night, we reached and crossed about daylight the Smoky Hill River, along whose valley and stage route runs. The stations were then from 10 to 15 miles apart, if Indians had crossed this line at any point, the station men would be informed of it. To get information as to this, as well as to determine where we were, an officer with one company was at once dispatched on this mission. This party had scarcely taken its departure, and our pickets been posted, 
before the entire command of tired, sleepy cavalrymen, scouts, and Delawares had thrown themselves on the ground and were wrapped in the deepest slumber. We had slept perhaps an hour or more, yet it seemed but a few moments when an alarm shot from the lookout at the startling cry of Indians brought the entire command under arms. End of chapter 4「フルオーディオブックス」like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter Five of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Although in search of Indians and supposed to be always prepared to encounter them, yet the warning shot of the sentry, follows as it was by his cry of Indians, could not but produced the greatest excitement in camp, where all had been quiet before, men sleeping and resting after their long night march, animals grazing unsuspectedly in the midst of the wagons and tents, which thickly dotted the plain here and there. All was now bustle, if not confusion. Herders and teamsters ran to their animals to conduct them inside the limits of the camp, The troopers on one platoon of each company hastened to secure the cavalry horses and provide against a stampede, while those of the remaining platoons were rapidly marshaled under arms by their troop officers and advanced in the direction from which the lookout reported the enemy to be approaching. All this required but a few moments of time. Recovering from that first shock of surprise, we endeavored, one and all, to discover the number and purpose of the foes who had in so unceremonious a manner disturbed our much needed slumbers. Daylight had just dawned, but the sun was not yet high enough to render a satisfactory view of the country possible. This difficulty was aggravated, too, by a dull, heavy mist which hung like a curtain near the horizon. Yet, in spite of all these obstructions, We could clearly perceive at a distance of perhaps a mile the dim outlines of numerous figures, horsemen evidently, approaching our camp not as if simply on the march, but in battle array. First came a deployed line of horsemen, followed in the rear as we could plainly see by a reserve also mounted and moving in compact order. It required no practiced eye to comprehend that be they who or what they might, The parties advancing in this precise and determined manner upon us were doing so with hostile purpose, and evidently intended to charge into our camp unless defeated in their purpose. No time was to be lost. Dispositions to meet the coming attack were rapidly made. To better observe the movements and determine the strength of the approaching parties, an officer ascended the knoll occupied by the lookout. We had often heard of the high perfection of some of the Indian tribes in military evolutions and discipline, but here we saw evidence which went far to convince us that the red man was not far behind in his more civilized brother in the art of war. Certainly, no troops of my command could have advanced a skirmish line or moved a reserve more accurately than was done in our presence that morning. As yet, we had no means of determining to what tribe the attacking party belonged. We were satisfied they must be either Sioux or Cheyennes, or both. In either case, we should encounter troublesome foes. But for the heavy mist, we could have comprehended everything. Soon we began receiving reports from the officer who had ascended to the lookout. First, there were not more than eighty horsemen to be seen. This number we could easily dispose of. Next, the attacking parties seemed to have changed their plan. A halt was ordered, and two or three horsemen seemed to be advancing to the front, as if to parley or reconnoitre our position. Then the skirmishes were suddenly withdrawn and united with the reserve, when the entire party wheeled about and began to move off. This was mystifying in the extreme, but a couple of young cavalry officers leaped into their saddles. And taking a few mounted troopers with them, dashed after our late enemies, determined to learn more about them than they seemed willing we should. A brisk 
gallop soon cleared away the mystery and furnished another proof of the deceptive effects produced by the atmosphere on the plains those who have read the preceding article will remember that at the termination of the night march which brought us to our present camp an officer was dispatched with one troop of cavalry to find the nearest stage station on the overland route near which we knew we must be our camp lay on the smoky hill river the stage route better known as the smoky hill route was known to be but a few miles north of us to determine our exact locality we had been marching by compass over a wild country and in the night time and to learn something regarding the indians this officer was sent out he was selected for this service because of his professed experience on and knowledge of the plains he had set out from our camp an hour or more before daylight but losing his bearings had marched his command in a semi-circle until daylight found him on the side of our camp opposite that from which he had departed the conical sibley tent used in my command resembling the indian lodge from which it was taken seen through the peculiar and uncertain morning atmosphere of that region had presented to his eyes and to those in his men the appearance of an indian village the animals grazing about our camp might well have been taken for the ponies of the indians besides it was well known that large encampments of indians were in the part of the country over which we were marching the bewilderment of this detachment then was not surprising considering the attending circumstances had the officer in command been young and inexperienced his mishap might have been credited to these causes but here was an officer who had grown gray in the service familiar with the plains and with indians yet so completely misled by appearances as to mistake his camp which he had left but an hour before as an indian village few officers laboring under the same impression would have acted so credibly he and his men imagined they had discovered the camp of indians whom we had been pursuing and although believing their enemies outnumbered them ten to one yet their zeal and earnestness prompted them instead of sending to their main camp for reinforcements thereby losing valuable time and probable opportunities to effect a surprise to make a dash at once into the village and it was only the increasing light of day that enabled them to discover their mistake and saved us from a charge from our own troopers this little incident will show how necessary experienced professional guides are in connection with all military movements on the plains it was a long time before the officer who had been so unlucky as to lose his way heard the last of it from his brother officers the remainder of his mission was completed more successfully aided by daylight and moving nearly due north he soon struck the well-traveled overland route and from the frightened employees at the nearest station he obtained intelligence which confirmed our worst fears as to the extent of the indian outbreak stage stations at various points along the route had been attacked and burned and the inmates driven off or murdered all travel across the plains was suspended and an indian war with all its barbarities had been forced upon the people of the frontier as soon as the officer ascertaining these facts had returned to camp and made his report the entire command was again put in motion and started in the direction of the stage route with the intention of clearing it of straggling bands of indians reopening the main line of travel across the plains and establishing if possible upon the proper tribes responsibility for the numerous outrages recently committed the stage stations were erected at points along the route distant from each other from ten to fifteen miles and were used solely for the shelter and accommodation of the relays of drivers and horses employed on the stage route we found in passing over the route on our eastward march that only about every fourth station was occupied the occupants on the other three having congregated there for mutual defense against the indians and later having burned the deserted stations from the employees of the company at various points we learned that for the few preceding days the indians had been crossing the line going toward the north in large bodies 
In some places we saw the ruins of the burned stations, but it was not until we reached Lookout Station, a point about 15 miles west of Fort Hayes, that we came upon the first real evidence of Indian outbreak. Riding some distance in advance of the command, I reached the station only to find it and the adjacent building in ashes. The ruins still smoking. Nearby I discovered the bodies of three station keepers so mangled and burned as to be scarcely recognizable as human beings. The Indians had evidently tortured them before putting an end to their suffering. They were scalped and horribly disfigured. Their bodies were badly burned, but whether before or after death could not be determined. No arrow or other article of Indian manufacture could be found to positively determine what particular tribe was a guilty one. The men at the other station had recognized some of the Indians passing as belonging to the Sioux and Cheyennes, the same we had passed from the village on the Pawnee Fork. Continuing our march, we reached Fort Hayes, from which point I dispatched a report to General Hancock on the Arkansas, furnishing him with all the information I had gained concerning the outrages and movements of the Indians. It had been a question of considerable dispute between the respective advocates of the Indian peace and war policy as to which party committed the first overt act of war, the Indians or General Hancock's command. I quote from a letter on the subject written by Major General Hancock to General Grant in reply to a letter of inquiry from the latter when commanding the armies of the United States. General Hancock says, When I learned from General Custer, who investigated these matters on the spot, that directly after they had abandoned the villages they attacked and burned a mail station on the Smoky Hill, killed the white men at it, disemboweled and burned them, fired into another station, endeavored to gain admittance to a third, fired on my expressmen both on the Smoky Hill and on their way to Larned. I conclude that this must be war, and therefore deemed it my duty to take the first opportunity which presented to resist these hostilities and outrages, and did so by destroying their villages. As a punishment, for the bad faith practiced by the Cheyennes and the Sioux who occupied the Indian village at this place, and as a chastisement for murders and depredations committed since the arrival of the command, at this point, by the people of these tribes, the village recently occupied by them which is now in our hands will be utterly destroyed. From these extracts the question raised can be readily settled. This act of retribution on the part of General Hancock was the signal for an extensive pen and ink war directed against him and his forces. This was to be expected. The pecuniary loss and deprivation of opportunities to speculate in Indian commodities, as practiced by most Indian agents, were too great to be submitted to without a murmur. The Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Apaches had been united under one agency— the Kiowas and Comanches under another. As General Hancock's expedition had reference to all of these tribes, he had extended invitations to each of the two agents to accompany him into Indian country, and to be present at all interviews with the representatives of these respective tribes, for the purpose, as the invitation states, of showing the Indians that the officers of the government are acting in harmony. These agents were both present at General Hancock's headquarters. Both admitted to General Hancock in conversation that Indians had been guilty of all the outrages charged against them, but each asserted their innocence on the particular tribes under his charge and endeavored to lay their crimes at the door of their neighbors. The agent of the Kiowas and Comanches declared to the department commander that the tribes of his agency have been grossly wronged by having been charged with various offenses which have undoubtedly been committed by the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Apaches, and that these tribes deserve severe and summary chastisement for their numerous misdeeds, very many of which had been laid at the doors of his innocent tribes. Not to be outdone in the profuse use of fair words, however, the agent of the three tribes thus assailed informed General Hancock that his three tribes were peaceably inclined 
and rarely committed offenses against the laws, but that most unfortunately they were charged in many instances with the crimes which had been perpetrated by other tribes, and that in this respect they had suffered heavily from the Kiowas, who were the most turbulent Indians of the plains, and deserved punishment more than any others. Here was positive evidence from the agents themselves that the Indians against whom we were operating were guilty and deserving of severe punishment. The only conflicting portion of the testimony was as to which tribe was most guilty. Subsequent events proved, however, that all of the five tribes named, as well as the Sioux, had combined for a general war throughout the plains and along our frontier. Such a war had been threatened to our post commanders along the Arkansas and many occasions during the winter. The movement of the Sioux and the Cheyennes toward the north indicated that the principal theater of military operations during the summer would be between the Smoky Hill and Platte Rivers. General Hancock accordingly assembled the principal chiefs of the Kiowas and Arapahoes in council at Fort Dodge, hoping to induce them to remain at peace and observe their treaty obligations. The most prominent chiefs in council were Satanta, Lone Wolf, and Kicking Bird of the Kiowas, and Little Raven and Yellow Bear of the Arapahoes. During the council, extravagant promises of future good conduct were made by these chiefs, so effective and convincing was the oratorical effort of Satanta that at the termination of his address, the department commander and staff presented him with the uniform coat, sash, and the hat of a major general. In return for this compliment, Satanta, within a few weeks after, attacked the post at which the council was held, arrayed in his new uniform. This said chief, had but recently headed an expedition to the frontier of Texas, where, among other murders committed by him and his band, was known as the Box Massacre. The Box family consisted of a father, mother, and five children, the eldest a girl about eighteen, the youngest a babe. The entire family had been visiting at a neighbor's house and were returning home in the evening, little dreaming of the terrible fate impending, when Satanta and his warriors dashed upon them, surrounded the wagon in which they were driving, and at the first fire killed the father and one of the children. The mother was at first permitted to carry the youngest child, a babe of a few months, in her arms, but the latter, becoming fretful during the tiresome night ride, began to cry. The Indians, fearing the sound of its voice might be heard by pursuers, snatched it from its mother's arms and dashed its brains out against a tree, and threw the lifeless remains to the ground and continued their flight. No halt was made for twenty-four hours, after which the march was conducted more deliberately. Each night the mother and three children were permitted to occupy one shelter, closely guarded by their watchful enemies. After traveling for several days, this war party arrived at the point where they rejoined their lodges. They were still a long distance from the main village, which was near the Arkansas, each night the scalp of the father was hung up in the lodge occupied by the mother and children. A long and weary march over a wild and desolate country brought them to the main village. Here the captives found that their most serious troubles were to commence. In accordance with Indian custom, upon the return of a successful war party, a grand assembly of the tribe took place. The prisoners, captured horses, and scalps were brought forth and the usual ceremonies terminating in a scalp dance followed. Then the division of the spoils was made. The captives were apportioned among the various bands composing the tribe, so that when the division was completed, the mother fell to the possession of one chief, the eldest daughter to that of another, the second, a little girl, was probably ten years to another, and the youngest, a child of three years, to a fourth. No two members of the family were permitted to remain in the same band, but were each carried to separate villages, distant from each other several days' march. This was done partially to prevent escape. No pen can describe the painful tortures of mind and body endured by this unfortunate family. They remained as captives in the hands of the Indians for more than a year, during which time the eldest daughter, a beautiful girl just ripening into womanhood, 
was exposed to a fate infinitely more dreadful than death itself. She first fell into one of the principal chiefs, who, after robbing her of that which was more precious than life, and forcing her to become the victim of his brutal lust, bartered her in return for two horses to another chief. He again, after wearing of her, traded her to a chief of a neighboring band, and in that way this unfortunate girl was passed from one to another of her savage captors, undergoing a life so horribly brutal that, when meeting her upon her release from captivity, one could only wonder how a young girl matured in a civilization and possessed the natural refinement and delicacy of thought which she exhibited could have survived such a degrading treatment. The mother and the second daughter fared somewhat better. The youngest, however, separated from mother and sisters, had thrown among people totally devoid of all kind feeling, spent the time in shedding bitter tears. This so enraged the Indians that, as a punishment as well as a preventative, the child was seized and the soles of its naked feet exposed to the flames of the lodge fire, till every portion of the cuticle was burned therefrom. When I saw this little girl a year afterwards, her feet were from this cause still in painful and unhealed condition. These poor captives were reclaimed from their bondage through the efforts of officers of the army and by the payment of a ransom amounting to many hundreds of dollars. The facts relating to their cruel treatment were obtained by me directly from the mother and eldest daughter immediately after their release, which occurred a few months prior to the council held with Satanta and other chiefs. To prove something of the character of the Cheyennes, one of the principal tribes with which we were at war, I will give the following extract from an official communication addressed by me to General Hancock prior to the surrender of the little Indian boy of whom mention was made in a former article. My recommendation was not deemed practicable, as it had been promised by us in treaty stipulation to return the boy unconditionally. Having learned that a boy belonging to the Cheyenne tribe of Indians is in the position of the military authorities, and that it is the intention of the Major General commanding the department to deliver him up to the above-named tribe, I would respectfully state that a little white girl aged from four to seven years is held captive by the Cheyenne Indians and is now in the possession of Cutnose, a chief of said tribe. The child referred to has been in the hands of the Indians a year or more. She was captured somewhere in the vicinity of the Cache Podre, Colorado. The parent's name is Fletcher. The father escaped with a severe wound, the mother and two younger children being taken prisoners. The Indians killed one of the children outright, and the mother, after subjecting her to torture too horrible to name. The child now held by the Indians was kept captive. An elder daughter made her escape and now resides in Iowa. The father resides in Salt Lake City. I have received several letters from the father and eldest daughter, and from friends of both requesting me to obtain the release of the little girl, if possible. I would therefore request that it be made a condition of the return of the Indian boy now in our possession that the Cheyennes give up the white child referred to above. This proposition failing in its object, and the war destroying all means of communications with the Indians and scattering the latter over the plains, all trace of the little white girl was lost, and to this day nothing is known of her fate. After breaking out of Indian difficulty, Cutnose, with his band, was located along the Smoky Hill route in the vicinity of Monument Station. He frequently visited the stage stations for purpose of trade, and was invariably accompanied by his little captive. I never saw her, but those that did represented her as strikingly beautiful, her complexion being fair, her eyes blue, and her hair of a bright golden hue. She presented a marked contrast to the Indian children who accompanied her. Cut nose from the delicate light color of her hair gave her an Indian name signifying little silver hair. He appeared to treat her with great affection and always kept her clothed in the handsomest of Indian garments. All offers from individuals to ransom her proved unavailing. 
Although she had been with the Indians but a year, she spoke the Cheyenne language fluently and seemed to have no knowledge of her mother tongue. The treatment of the Box and Fletcher families is not given as isolated instances, but is referred to principally to show the character of the enemy with whom we were at war. Volume after volume might be filled in recounting the unprovoked and merciless atrocities committed upon the people of the frontier by their implacable foe, the Red Man. It will become necessary, however, in making a truthful record of the principal events which transpired under my personal observations, to make mention of Indian outrages surpassing, if possible, in savage cruelty, any yet referred to. As soon as General Hancock had terminated his council with the Kiowas and Arapahoes, he marched with the remaining portion of the expedition across from the Arkansas to Fort Hayes, where my command was then encamped, arriving there on the 3rd of May. Here, owing to the neglect or delay of the officers of the quartermaster's department in forwarding the necessary stores, the cavalry was prevented from undertaking any extensive movement but had to content itself for the time being in scouting the adjacent country. This time, however, was well employed in the preparation of men and animals for the work which was to be assigned them. Unfortunately, desertions from the ranks became so frequent and extensive as to cause no little anxiety. To produce these, several causes combined. Prominent among them was the insufficiency and inferior quality of rations furnished the men. At times the latter were made the victims of fraud, and it was only by the zealous care and watchfulness of the officers immediately over them that their wants were properly attended to. Dishonest contractors at the receiving depots further east had been permitted to perpetrate gross frauds upon the government the result of which was to produce want and suffering among the men. For example, unbroken packages of provisions shipped from the main depot of supplies, of which it was impracticable to replace without loss of time, were when opened, discovered to contain huge stones, for which the government had paid so much per pound, according to contract price. Boxes of bread were shipped and issued to the soldiers of my command, the contents of which had been baked in 1861, yet this was in 1867. It is unnecessary to state that but little of this bread was eaten, yet there was none at hand of better quality to replace it. Bad provisions were a fruitful cause of bad health. Inactivity led to restlessness and dissatisfaction. Scurvy made its appearance, and cholera attacking neighboring stations, for all these evils, desertion became the most popular antidote. To such an extent was this the case, that in one year one regiment lost by desertion alone more than half of its effective force. General Hancock remained with us only a few days before setting out with a battery for his headquarters at Fort Leavenworth. Supplies were pushed out, and every preparation was made for resuming offensive movements against the Indians. To find employment for the few weeks which must ensure before breaking up camp was sometimes a difficult task. To break the monotony and give horses and men exercise, buffalo hunts were organized, in which officers and men joined heartily. I know of no better drill for perfecting men in the use of firearms on horseback and thoroughly accustoming them to the saddle than buffalo hunting over a moderately rough country. No amount of riding under this best of drill masters will give that confidence of security in the saddle, which will result from a few spirited charges into a buffalo herd. The command, consisting of cavalry alone, was at last in readiness to move. Wagons had been loaded with reserve supplies, and we were only waiting the growth of the spring grass to set out on the long march which had previously been arranged. On the 1st of June, with about 350 men and a train of 20 wagons, I left Fort Hayes and directed our line of march towards Fort McPherson on the Platte River, distant by the proposed route 225 miles. The friendly Delawares accompanied us as scouts and trailers, but 
Our guide was a young white man known on the plains as Will Comstock. No Indian knew the country more thoroughly than did Comstock. He was perfectly familiar with every divide, water course, and strip of timber for hundreds of miles in either direction. He knew the dress and the peculiarities of every Indian tribe, and spoke the languages of many of them. Perfect in horsemanship, fearless in manner, and splendid hunter, and a gentleman by instinct, as modest and unassuming as he was brave, he was an interesting and, well, valuable companion on a march such as was then before us. Many were the adventures and incidents of frontier life with which he was accustomed to entertain us when around the campfire or on the march. Little did he then imagine that his own life would soon be given as a sacrifice to his daring, and that he, with all his experience among the savages, would fall a victim of Indian treachery. End of chapter 5「Thence described a semicircle to the southward, touching the headwaters of the Republican, and again reached the Platte at or near Fort Sedwick, at which post we would replenish our supplies, then move directly south to Fort Wallace on the Smoky Hill, and from there march the overland route to our starting point at Fort Hayes. This would involve a ride of upwards of 1,000 miles. As is usually the case, the first day's march was not to be a long one. The troops under charge of the officer second command, Colonel Wycliffe Cooper, left the camp and marched up the valley of Big Creek, a distance of 18 miles, and there encamped. Two companies of cavalry and a small force of infantry were to constitute the garrison to remain behind. When the troops composing my command left, it became necessary to rearrange the camp and provide new disposition for defense. My wife, who always accompanied me when in camp or on the march except when I was engaged in active pursuit of Indians, had rejoined me soon after my arrival at Fort Hayes. She was accompanied by a young lady friend from the east, a schoolmate who had been tempted by the novelties of the wild western life to make her a visit in camp. As there were other ladies in camp, wives of officers who were to remain with the garrison, my wife and friend decided to remain and await our return, rather than go back to the protection and luxuries of civilization. To arrange for their comfort and superintend the locating of their tents, I remained behind my command, intending to wait until after midnight, and then, guided by the moonlight, ride on and overtake my command, before it should commence its second day's march. I retained with me two soldiers, one scout and four of the Delawares. As soon as the command moved, the portion to remain at Fort Hayes was drawn in near the few buildings which constituted the fort. All of the cavalry and a portion of the infantry were to encamp in the valley and not far from the stream. For three-quarters of a mile on either side of the valley consisted of a level, unbroken plain. Then a low bluff was encountered, succeeded by a second plain of less extent. This was bordered by a higher and more broken bluff than the first. Fortunately, in selecting the ground on which the tents intended for the ladies were to stand, I had chosen a little knoll, so small as to be scarcely perceivable, yet the only elevated ground to be found. It was within a few steps of the banks of the stream, while the main camp was located below and near the bluff. For safety reasons, a few soldiers were placed in camp a short distance above. In ordinary times, the banks of Big Creek are at this point from 25 to 45 feet above the water, 
and a person accustomed to the slow and gradual rise and fall which prevails along the beds of streams in the eastern states can with difficulty realize the suddenness with which the deep and narrow channels of the watercourses of the plains become filled with overflowing water the proportion to the surface of the country or the watersheds the watercourses or channels are few too few to accommodate the drainage necessary during the wet season the banks on which the little knoll stood was by actual measurement thirty-six feet above ordinary water mark the knoll was probably three or four feet above the level of the valley surely this location might be considered well enough for protected naturally against the rainy season so i thought as i saw the working party putting the finishing touches to the bright white canvas house which to all intents and purposes was to be to me even in my absence my army home i confidently expected to return to this camp at the termination of my march i will be pardoned if i anticipate events and terminate its history now a few days after my command had marched a heavy storm set in the rain pouring down in a matter resembling a water spout the immediate effect of the heavy shower was not at once noticeable near the camp at fort hayes as the heaviest rainfall had occurred far above that point but in the night time after the entire camp except the guards had long since retired and fallen asleep the stream overcharged by the rushing volumes from above soon became transformed from a mild and murmuring brook into an irresistible turbulent torrent so sudden and unexpected had been the rise that before the alarm could be given the thirty-six feet which had been separating the surface of the water from the top of the banks had been overcome and in addition the water began now sweeping over the entire plain after overflowing the natural banks of the creek the first new channel ran in such a manner as to surround the tents occupied by the ladies as well as that occupied by the few soldiers stationed up the stream but still leaving communication open between the main camp and the bluff toward the mainland the soldiers as well as the officers and their families in the main camp hastened to the bluff to escape being swept down the huge torrent which each instant became more fearful to add to the embarrassment of the situation the blackest darkness prevailed only relieved at times by vivid gleams of lightning while the deep sullen roar of the torrent increasing each moment in depth and volume was only drowned at intervals by the fierce and more deafening uproar of the thunder which sounded like the applause of some huge fury watching the struggle between the elements when mrs custer and her young lady companion were awakened by the storm they discovered that their tents were surrounded by the new channel and that all efforts to reach the main camp would prove unavailing they had with them at this time only a colored female servant they did not even know the fate of the other portion of the camp in the midst of this fearful scene they heard the series of cries of men in despair near their tent the cries came from soldiers who had been in camp above them but were now being carried off in the darkness by the rising current no assistance could reach them it is doubtful if they could have been saved even if they had been found by daylight there were seven in all one of them as he was being swept by the tent contrived through accident no doubt to grasp the branch of a small brush which grew on the bank it was for him that the cries of distress principally proceeded aided by the dim light of a camp lantern the ladies were enabled to see this unfortunate man clinging as it were between life and death with commendable presence of mind considering the fate staring them in the face a rope was procured and after a few failures one end was thrown to the unfortunate man and by the united strength of the two ladies and their servant he was pulled ashore and for the time being at least his life was saved his six less fortunate companions were drowned two of the officers brevet major-general a j smith and his adjutant-general colonel ware with a view to rescuing the ladies 
had succeeded in making their way across the new channel made by the torrent to the knoll but when attempting to return on horseback to the mainland they found the current too deep and swift for them to succeed they were compelled then to await their fate the water continued to rise until the entire valley from the natural channel to the first bluff a distance of a quarter of a mile was covered by an unfordable river the only point still free from water was the little knoll which i had been so fortunate as to select for the tents but the rise in the water continued until it finally reached the edge of the tent at this rate the tents themselves must soon be swept away as a last resort a gatling gun which stood near the entrance of the tent and which from its great weight would probably withstand the force of the current was hauled closer to the tents and ropes securely attached to the wheels by these ropes it was proposed to fasten the ladies and the servant to the gun and in this way should the streams not rise too high above the knoll their lives might be saved the colored girl eliza who was devoted to her mistress and who had been amid scenes of great danger was on this occasion invaluable eliza had quite a history before she visited the plains formerly a slave but set free by the war she had accompanied me as cook during the last three years of the war twice taken prisoner by the confederates she each time made her escape and refound me she was present at almost every prominent battle of the army of the potomac accompanied by command on all raids and winter marches and upon more than one occasion during the progress of a battle eliza might be seen near the front earnestly engaged in preparing a cup of coffee for the officers at the headquarters who but for her would have gone through the day dinnerless i have seen her remain by the camp cook fire when the enemy shells were bursting overhead to such an extent that men who were similarly employed deserted their station and sought shelter in the rear there were few officers or soldiers in the cavalry corps from general sheridan down with whom eliza was not a great favorite all had a pleasant word for her and few had not at some time or another cause to remember her kindness when the water finally approached close to the tent eliza marked its progress from time to time by placing a small stake at the water line how anxiously the gradual rise of the turret must have been watched at last when all hope seemed almost exhausted the waters were stayed in their progress and soon the great joy of the little party besieged began to recede it was still dark but so rapidly did the volume of water diminish as rapidly as it accumulated that a few hours after daylight a safe passage was effected to the mainland with the exception of those of the six soldiers no lives were lost although many narrow escapes were made in the morning daylight showed the post hospital a stone building surrounded by an unfordable stream the water rushing through the doors and windows the patients had managed to climb up upon the roof and could be seen by the officers and men on the mainland no boats were to be had but no class of men are so full of expedients as soldiers the beds of some governed wagons were hastily removed the canvas covers were stretched under the bottoms and in this way a temporary kind of pontoon was constructed which answered the desired purpose and by means of which the beleaguered patients were soon released the officer in command of the infantry major merriman was occupying a tent with his wife near the main camp finding himself cut off from the main land but before the water had attained its greatest depth he took his wife in his arms and forded the stream which ran between his tent and the bluff and in this manner reached a point of safety it is remarkable however that within two years from the date of this occurrence the same officer with his wife and child encountered a similar freshet in texas hundreds of miles from this locality and in that watery grave which was so narrowly avoided in kansas awaited the mother and child in texas of the circumstances of the storm at fort hayes i was necessarily ignorant until weeks later
soon after midnight everything being in readiness and my little party having been refreshed by a cup of good army coffee it only remained to say adieu to those who were to remain behind and we were ready for our moonlight gallop but little was said as we made our way rapidly over the plain in the direction taken by the command occasionally as we dashed across the ravine we would suddenly come upon a herd of antelope or a few scattering buffaloes startling them from their response and causing them to wonder what was the occasion and who the strange parties disturbing the peaceful quiet of the night in this unusual manner on the speed our good steeds snuffing the early morning air and pressing forward as eagerly as if they knew their companions were awaiting them in the advance daylight had given us no evidence of its coming when after a ride of nearly twenty miles we found ourselves descending into the valley in which we knew the command must be encamped the moon had disappeared before the horizon and we were left to make our way aided by such light as the stars twinkling in a clear sky afforded us our horses gave us unmistakable evidence that camp was near to convince us beyond all doubt the clear ringing notes of the bugle sounded the reveille greeting our ears as directed by the sound we soon found ourselves in camp the cavalry camp immediately after reveille always presents an animated and most interesting scene as soon as the rolls are called and the reports of absentees made to headquarters the men of the companies with the exception of the cooks are employed in the care of the horses the later are fed and while eating are thoroughly groomed by the men under the superintendence of their officers nearly an hour is devoted to this important duty in the meanwhile the company cooks tend each company and the officer servants are busily engaged preparing breakfast so that within a few minutes after the horses have been received in proper attention breakfast is ready and being simple it requires but little time to dispose of it immediately after breakfast the first bugle call indicates of the march is the general and is the signal for tents to be taken down and everything packed in readiness for moving a few minutes later this is followed by the bugler at headquarters sounding boots and saddles when horses are saddled up and the wagon trains put in readiness for pulling out five minutes later to horse is sounded and the men of each company lead their horses into line each trooper standing at the head of his horse at the words prepare to mount from the commanding officer each trooper places his left foot in the stirrup and at the command of mount every man rises on his stirrup and places himself in the saddle the whole command presenting the appearance to the eye of a huge machine propelled by one power woe betide the unfortunate trooper who through carelessness or inattention fails to place himself in the saddle simultaneously with his companions if he is not for this offence against military rule deprived of the services of his horse during the succeeding half-day's march he escapes luckily as soon as the command is mounted the advance is sounded and the troops usually in the columns of fours moves out the company leading the advance one day march in rear the following day this success of changing gives each company an opportunity to march by regular turn in advance on average daily march when it is not immediate pursuit of an enemy was about twenty-five miles upon reaching in the evening the horses were cared for as in the morning opportunities being given them to graze before dark pickets were posted and every precaution adopted to guard against surprise our second day's march brought us to the saline river which we encamped for the night from our camp ground we could see on a knoll some two miles distant a platform or scaffold erected which resembled somewhat one of our war signal stations curious to discover its purpose i determined to visit it Taking with me Comstock and a few soldiers, I soon reached the point, and discovered that the object of my curiosity and surprise was an Indian grave. The body, instead of being consigned to Mother Earth, was placed on top of the platform. The latter was constructed of saplings, and was about twenty feet in height. 
From Comstock, I learned that with some of the tribes, this is the usual mode of displaying of the body after death. The prevailing belief of the Indian is that when done with this world, the spirit of the deceased is transferred to the happy hunting ground, where he is permitted to engage in the same pleasures and pursuits which he preferred while on earth. To this end, it is deemed essential that after death the departed must be supplied with the same equipment and ornaments considered necessary while in the flesh. In this accordance with this belief, a complete Indian outfit, depending in extent upon the rank and importance of the deceased, is prepared and consigned with the body to the final resting place. The body found on this occasion must have been that of a son of some important chief. It was not full grown, but accompanied with all the arms and adornments usually owned by a warrior. There was a bow and a quiver full of steel pointed arrows, a tomahawk and a scalping knife, and a red clay pipe and a small bag full of tobacco. In order that the departed spirit should not be wholly dependent upon friends after his arrival at the happy hunting ground, he had been supplied with provisions consisting of small parcels of containing coffee, sugar, and bread. Weapons of modern structure had also been furnished him, a revolver and rifle with powder and ball ammunition for each, and a saddle, bridle, and lariat for his pony. Added to these was a supply of wearing apparel, embracing every article known in an Indian's toilet, not excepting the various colored paints to be used in decorating himself in war. A handsome buckskin scalping pocket, profusely ornamented with beads, completed the outfit. But for fear that white women's scalps might not be readily obtainable, and desiring no doubt to be received at once as a warrior, who in his own country at least was not without renown, a white woman's scalp was also considered as a necessary accompaniment, a letter of introduction to the dusky warriors and chieftains who had gone before. As the Indian of the plains is himself only when on horseback, provisions must be made for mounting him properly in the Indian heaven. To accomplish this, the favorable war pony is led beneath the platform on which the body of the warrior is placed at rest, and then strangled to death. No signs indicating the recent presence of Indians were discovered by our scouts until we neared the Republican River, where the trail of a small war party was discovered running down one of the tributaries of the Republican. After following it far enough to determine the futility of pursuit, the attempt was relinquished. Upon crossing the Republican, we suddenly came in full view of about a hundred mounted warriors, who, without waiting for a parley of any kind, set off as fast as their horses could carry them. One squadron was sent in pursuit, but was unable to overhaul the Indians. From the tracks, we learned that the Indians were mounted on horses stolen from the stage company. The horses were of superior quality and purchased by the company at a price about double that paid by the government. This was the only occasion on which we saw Indians before reaching the Platte River. One of our camps was pitched on the banks of a small stream which had been named Beaver Creek. Comstock informed us that here an opportunity could be had of killing a few beavers, as they were very numerous all along the stream, which had derived its name from the fact. We had gone into camp about 3 p.m., the numerous stumps and fallen trees, as well as the beaver dams, attested the accuracy of Comstock's statement. By his advice, we waited until sundown before taking our stations on the bank, not far above the site of our camp, as at this time the beaver would be out and on shore. Placing ourselves under Comstock's guidance, a small party proceeded to the ground selected, where we were distributed, singularly, at stations along the stream and quietly arrayed the appearance of the beaver. Whether the noise from the camp below, or the passing of hunting parties of soldiers in the afternoon had frightened them, I know not. I remained at my station with my rifle in hand, ready to fire at the first beaver which should offer itself as a sacrifice, until the sun had disappeared, and darkness had begun to spread its heavy mantle over everything around me. No living thing had thus far disturbed my reveries. 
my station was on the immediate bank of the stream on a path which had evidently been made by wild animals of some kind the bank rose above me to a distance of nearly twenty feet i was just at the point of leaving my station and giving up all hope of getting a shot when i heard the rustling of the long dry grass a few yards lower down the stream cocking my rifle i stood ready to deliver its contents into the approaching animal which i presumed would have been seen to be a beaver as soon as it should emerge from the tall grass it did not make its appearance in the path in which i stood until within a few feet of me when to my great surprise i beheld instead of a beaver an immense wildcat it was difficult to say which of us was the most surprised without delaying long to think i took a hasty aim and fired the next moment i heard a splash which relieved my mind as to which of us should retain the right of way on shore the path being too narrow to admit our passing of each other i had either wounded or killed a wild cat and its body in the darkness had been carried down with the current as the dogs which were soon attracted from the camp by my shot were unable to find the trail on either bank nothing occurred to break the monotony of our march until we reached fort mcpherson on the platte river the country over which we had marched had been quite varied in its character and as we neared the platte it became very broken and abrupt it was only by availing ourselves of comstock's superior knowledge of the country that we found an easy exit from the deep canyons and rough defiles which we were encountered at fort mcpherson we refilled our wagons with supplies and rations and forage at the same time in accordance with my instructions i reported by telegraph my arrival to general sherman who was then farther west of the line of the union pacific road he did not materially change my instructions further than to direct me to remain near fort mcpherson until his arrival which would be in the course of a few days moving my command about twelve miles from the fort i arranged for a council with pawnee killer and a few other sioux chiefs who had arrived at the platte about the same time as my command my object was if possible to induce pawnee killer and his band with such other indians as might choose to join them to bring their lodges into the vicinity of the fort and remain at peace with the whites pawnee killer and his chiefs met me in council and the subject was discussed but with no positive conclusions while protesting strongly in favor of preserving peaceful relations with us the subsequent conduct of the chiefs only confirmed the suspicion that they had arranged the council not to perfect a friendly agreement with us but to spy out and discover if possible our future plans and movements in this they were disappointed their numerous inquiries as to where we intended proceeding when we resumed the march were unavailing desiring to leave nothing undone to encourage a friendly attitude on their part i gave the chiefs a parting with them liberal presents of coffee sugar and other articles gratifying to the taste of an indian they departed after giving utterance to the strongest expressions of their desire to live at peace with their white brothers and promised to collect their families and bring them in under protection of the fort and thus avoid becoming entangled in the ravages of an indian war which now promised to become general throughout the plains pawnee killer and his chiefs never attempted to keep their promises general sherman arrived at my camp the next day he had no confidence in the faith of pawnee killer and his band and desired that a party be sent in pursuit at once and bring the chiefs back and retain a few of the prominent ones as hostages for the fulfillment of their agreement this was decided to be impracticable it was then judged best for me to move my command in a southwesterly direction to the forks of the republican and a section of the country usually infested by indians and there endeavor to find the village of pawnee killer and compel him if necessary to move nearer to the fort so that we might distinguish between those who were friendly and those who were not besides it was known that cheyennes and sioux whom we had pursued from the arkansas along the smoky hill river had not crossed north of the platte and they were rightly supposed to be located somewhere near the forks of the republican 
I could reach this point in three days marching after leaving the Platte River, on whose banks we were then encamped. Owing to the rough and broken character of the bluffs which bound the valley of the Platte on the south side, it was determined to march up the men about fifteen miles from the fort and strike south through an opening in the bluffs known as Jack Morrow's Canyon. General Sherman rode with us as far as this point, where, after commending the Cheyennes and Sioux to us in his expressive manner, he bade us good-bye and crossed the river to the railroad station on the north side. Thus far, we had no real Indian warfare. We were soon to experience it, attended by all its frightful barbarities. End of chapter 6「ファイブアンドフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリフォーリ Both were white men, but following the example of many frontiersmen, they had taken unto themselves Indian wives, and each had become the head of a considerable family of half breeds. Starting nearly due south from the Platte and marching up the canyon, which forms a natural gateway through the otherwise almost impassable barrier of bluffs and deep ravines bordering the valley of the Platte River, we again set out in search of Indians. The latter are sought after so frequently and found so seldom, except when not wanted, that scouting parties as a general thing are not overburdened with confidence on beginning an expedition. Most of us, however, felt that we were destined to see Indians, an impression probably due to the fact that we had determined to accomplish our purpose, if hard riding and watchfulness could attain this result. Our first day's march brought us to a small stream, a tributary of the Republican River, on whose banks we encamped for the night. Daylight the following morning found us in the saddle and ascending from the valley to the tablelands. We were still in the broken country. On reaching the plateau, overlooking the valley, we found ourselves enveloped in a dense fog, so dense that the sky was not visible, nor was an extended view of the country possible. Had the surface of the plain been as usual level and unbroken, we could have pursued our march guided by the unerring compass. But deep and impassable canyons divided the country in all directions and rendered our further progress impracticable. The sun, however, soon rose high enough to drive away the mist and permitted us to proceed on what might be truly termed our winding way. The afternoon on the fourth day we reached the forks of the Republican, and there we went into camp. We were then located about seventy five miles southeast of Fort Sedgwick, and about the same distance northeast of Fort Wallace. Intending to scout the surrounding country thoroughly in search of Indians, we selected our camp with reference to a sojourn of several days. Combining among its essential wood, water, good grazing, and last but not least, facilities for defense. When I parted from General Sherman, the understanding was that after beating up the country thoroughly about the forks of the Republican River, I should march my command to Fort Sedgwick, and there I would either see General Sherman again or receive further instructions from him. Circumstances seemed to favor a modification of this plan, at least as to marching the entire command to Fort Sedgwick. It was therefore decided to send a trusty officer with a sufficient escort to Fort Sedgwick with my dispatch, and to receive the dispatches which might be intended for me. My proposed change of program contemplated a continuous march which might be prolonged twenty days or more. To this end, Additional supplies were necessary. The guides all agreed in the statement that when we were then about equidistant from Fort Wallace on the south and Fort Sedgwick on the north, 
and either of which the required supplies could be obtained but that while the country between our camp and the former was generally level and unbroken favorable to the movements of our wagon train that between us and fort sedgwick was almost impassable for heavy laden wagons the train then was to go to fort wallace under sufficient escort be loaded with fresh supplies and rejoin us in camp at the same time the officer selected for that mission could proceed to fort sedgwick obtain his dispatch and return major joel a elliott a young officer of great courage and enterprise was selected as bearer of the dispatches to fort sedgwick as the errand was one involving considerable danger required for the round trip a ride of almost two hundred miles through a country which was not only almost unknown but infested by large numbers of hostile indians the major was authorized to arrange the details in accordance with his own judgment knowing that small detachments can move more rapidly than large ones and that he was to depend upon celerity of movement rather than strength of numbers to evade the numerous war parties prowling in that vicinity the major limited the size of his escort to ten picked men and one of the guides all mounted on fleet horses to elude the watchful eyes of any parties that might be noting our movements it was deemed advisable to set out from camp as soon as it was dark and by making a rapid night ride get beyond the circle of danger in this way the little party took its departure on the night of the twenty third of june on the same day our train of wagons set out for fort wallace to obtain supplies colonel west with one full squadron of cavalry was ordered to escort the train to beaver creek about midway and there halt with one of his companies while the train under escort of one company commanded by lieutenant robbins should proceed to the fort and return colonel west to employ the interval in scouting up and down the beaver creek the train was under the special management of colonel cook who on this occasion was acting in the capacity of a staff officer while at fort mcpherson and when under the impression that my command upon arriving at fort wallace after terminating the scouting expedition we were then engaged upon would remain in camp for several weeks i wrote to my wife at fort hayes advising her to meet me at fort wallace provided that travel between the two posts was considered safe i expected her to reach fort wallace before the arrival of the train an escort from my camp and under this impression i sent a letter to her by colonel cook asking her to come to our camp on the republican under escort of the colonel who was an intimate friend of the family i am thus minute in giving these details in order that the events of the succeeding few days may appear in their proper light after the departure of the two detachments which left us in almost opposite directions our camp settled down to the dull and unexciting monotony of waiting patiently for the time when we should welcome our comrades back again and listen to such items of news as they might bring to us little did we imagine that the monotony of idleness was so soon and so abruptly to be broken that night our pickets were posted as usual the horses and mules after being allowed to graze in the evening were brought in and securely tethered close to our tents and the stable guards of the different troops had been assigned to their stations for the night at half past eight the bugler at headquarters sounded the signal for taps and before the last note had died away every light in obedience to this command disappeared and nothing remained to the eye except here and there a faint glimpse of a white tent to indicate the presence of our camp it was just that uncertain period between darkness and daylight on the following morning and i was lying in my tent in the enjoyment of that perfect repose which only camp life offers when a sharp clear crack of a carbine near by brought me to my feet i knew in an instant that the shot came from the picket posted not far from the rear of my camp at the same moment my brother colonel custer who on that occasion was officer of the day and whose duties required him to be particularly on the alert rushed past my tent 
halting only long enough to show his face through the opening and shout, They are here! Now, I did not inquire who we were referring to, or how many were included in the word they, nor did my informant seem to think it necessary to explain. They referred to Indians, I knew full well. Had I doubted, the brisk fusillade which opened the next moment, and the wild war whoop were convincing evidences that in truth they were here. Ordinarily, I must confess to having sufficient regard for the customs and courtesies of life to endeavor to appear in society suitably and appropriately dressed. But when the alarm of Indians was given, and in such a startling manner as to show they were almost in our midst, the question was not, what shall I wear, but what shall I do? It has become so common, in fact, almost a law, to descry the costumes worn upon memorable occasions, that I may be pardoned if I indulge in a description, which I will endeavor to make as brief as the costume itself. A modern Jenkins, if desiring to tell the truth, would probably express himself as follows. General Custer on this occasion appeared in a beautiful crimson robe, red flannel robe he knew it, very becoming to his complexion. His hair was worn all natural, and permitted to fall carelessly over his shoulders. In his hand he carried gracefully a handsome Spencer rifle. It is unnecessary to add that he became the observed of all observers. My orderly, as was his custom on my retiring, had securely tied all the fastenings to my tent, and it was usually the work of several minutes to undo this unnecessary labor. I had no time to throw away in this manner. Leaping from my bed, I grasped my trusty Spencer, which was always at my side, whether waking or sleeping, and with a single dash burst open the tent, and, hatless as well as shoeless, ran to the point where the attack seemed to be concentrated. It was sufficiently light to see our enemies and be seen. The first shot had brought every man of my command from his tent armed and equipped for battle, the Indians, numbering hundreds, were all around the camp, evidently intending to surround us, while a party of about fifty of their best-mounted warriors had, by taking advantage of a ravine, contrived to approach quite close before being discovered. It was the intention of this party to dash through our camp, stampede all of our horses, which were to be caught up by the parties surrounding us, and then finish us at their leisure. The picket, however, discovered the approach of this party, and by firing gave timely warning, thus frustrating the plan of the Indians, who almost invariably based their hopes of success upon effecting a surprise. My men opened on them such a brisk fire from their carbines that they were glad to withdraw beyond range. The picket, who gave the alarm, was shot down at his post by the Indians, the entire party galloping over his body and being prevented from scalping him only by the fire from his comrades, who dashed out and recovered him. He was found to be badly, though not mortally, wounded by a rifle ball through the body. The Indians, seeing their attempt to surprise us and to stampede our horses had failed, then withdrew to a point but little over a mile from us, where they congregated and seemed to hold a conference with each other. We did not fear any further attack at this time, they were satisfied with this attempt and would wait another opportunity. It was desirable, however, that we should learn, if possible, what tribe our enemies belonged. I directed one of our interpreters to advance midway between our camp and the Indians to make the signal for holding a parley, and in this way ascertain who were the principal chiefs. The ordinary manner of opening communications with parties known or supposed to be hostile is to ride towards them in a zigzag manner, or ride in a circle. The interpreter gave the proper signal, and was soon answered by a small party advancing from the main body of the Indians to within hailing distance. It was then agreed that I, with six of the officers, should come to the bank of the river, which was about equidistant from my camp and from the point where the Indians had congregated, and there be met by an equal number of leading chiefs. To guard against treachery, I placed most of my command under arms and arranged with the officers left in command 
that a blast from the bugle should bring assistance to me if required. Six of the officers and myself, taking with us a bugler and an interpreter, proceeded on horseback to the designated point. Dismounting, we left our horses in charge of the bugler, who was instructed to watch every movement of the Indians, and upon the first appearance of violence or treachery, to sound the advance. Each of us took our revolvers from their leather cases and stuck them loosely in our belts. Descending to the river bank, we awaited the arrival of the seven chiefs. On one side of the river, the bank was level and covered with a beautiful green sward, while on the opposite side it was broken and thickly covered by willows and tall grass. The river itself was at this season of the year, and at this distance from its mouth, scarcely deserving of the name. The seven chiefs soon made their appearances on the opposite bank, and, after removing their leggings, waded across to where we stood. Imagine our surprise at recognizing as the head chief Pawnee Killer, our friend of the Conference of the Platte who on that occasion had overwhelmed us with the earnestness of his professions of peace, and who, after partaking of our hospitality under the guise of friendship, and leaving our camp laden with provisions and presents, returned to attack and murder us within a fortnight. This, too, without the slightest provocation, for surely we had not trespassed against any right of theirs, since the exchange of friendly greetings near Fort McPherson. Pawnee Killer and his chiefs met us as if they were quite willing to forgive us for interfering with the success of their intended surprise of our camp in the morning. I avoided all reference to what had occurred, desiring if possible to learn the locality of their village and their future movements. All attempts, however, to elicit information on these points were skillfully parried, the chiefs, in turn, were anxious to know our plans, but we declined to gratify them. Upon crossing to our side of the river, Pawnee Killer and his companions at once extended their hands and saluted us with the familiar how. Suspicious of their intentions, I kept one hand on my revolver during the continuance of our interview. We had had about concluded our conference. A young brave, completely armed, as were all the chiefs, emerged from the willows and tall grass on the opposite bank and waded across to where we were, greeting us as the others had done. Nothing was thought of this act until a few moments another brave did the same, and so on until four had crossed over and joined our group. I then called Pawnee Killer's attention to the conditions which under we met, and told him he was violating his part of the contract. He endeavored to turn it off by saying that his young men felt well disposed towards us and came over only to shake hands and say how. He was told, however, that no more of his men must come. The conversation was then resumed and continued until another party of warriors was seen preparing to cross from the other side. The conduct of these Indians in the morning added to our opinion in general as regarding treachery convinced us that it would be in the highest degree imprudent to trust ourselves in their power. They already outnumbered us eleven to seven, which were as heavy of odds as I felt disposed to give. We all felt convinced that the coming over of these warriors one by one was but the execution of a preconceived plan, whereof we were to become the victims as soon as their advantage in numbers could justify them in attacking us. Again reminding Pawnee Killer of the stipulations of our agreement, and that while we had observed ours faithfully, he had disregarded his. I told him that not another warrior of his should cross the river to our side, and called his attention to the bugler, who stood at the safe distance from us. I told him that I would then instruct the bugler to watch the Indians who were upon the opposite bank, and upon any of them making any movement as if to cross to sound the signal, which would bring my entire command to my side in a few moments. This satisfied Pawnee Killer that any further attempt to play us false would only end in his own discomfiture. He at once signaled to the Indians on the other side to remain where they were. Nothing definite could be gleaned from the replies of Pawnee Killer. I was satisfied that he and his tribe were contemplating mischief. 
Their previous declarations of peaceful intent went for naught. Their attack on our camp in the morning proved what they would do if able to accomplish their purpose. I was extremely anxious, however, to detain the chiefs near my camp or induce them to locate their village near us and keep up the semblance of at least friendship. I was particularly prompted to this desire by the facts that the two detachments which had left my command the previous day would necessarily continue absent several days, and I feared that they might become the victims of an attack from this band if steps were not taken to prevent it. Our anxiety was greatest regarding Major Elliot and his little party of eleven. Our only hope was that the Indians had not become aware of their departure. It was fortunate that the Major had chosen night as the most favorable time for setting out. As to the detachment, they have gone with the train to Fort Wallace. We felt less anxious. It being sufficiently powerful in numbers to defend itself, unless attacked after the detachment became divided at Beaver Creek. Finding all efforts to induce Pawnee Killer to remain with us unavailing, I told him that we would march to his village with him. This did not seem satisfactory. Before terminating our interview, the chief requested me to make them presents of some sugar, coffee, and ammunition. Remembering the use they had made of the latter article in the morning, it would not appear strange if I declined to gratify them. Seeing that nothing was to be gained by prolonging the interview, we separated, the officers returning to our camp and the Indians recrossing the river, mounting their ponies and galloping off to the main body, which was then nearly two miles distant. My command was in readiness to leap into their saddles, and I determined to attempt to follow the Indians and, if possible, get near their village. They were prepared for this move on our part, and the moment we advanced towards them they set off top of their speed. We followed as rapidly as our heavier horses could travel, but the speed of the Indian's pony on this occasion, as on many others, was too great for that of our horses. A pursuit of a few hours proved our inability to overtake them, and we returned to camp. Soon after arriving at camp, a small party of Indians was reported in sight in a different direction. Captain Lewis Hamilton, the lineal descendant of Alexander Hamilton, was immediately ordered to take his troop and learn something of their intentions. The Indians resorted to their usual tactics. There were not more than a half a dozen to be seen, not enough to appear formidable. These were there as a decoy. Captain Hamilton marched his troops towards the hill on which the Indians had made their appearance, but on arriving at its crest found that they had retired to the next ridge beyond. This maneuver was repeated several times until the cavalry found itself several miles from the camp. The Indians then appeared to separate into two parties, each going in different directions. Captain Hamilton divided his troop into two detachments, sending one detachment, under command of my brother, after one of the parties, while he, with twenty-five men, continued to follow the other. When the two detachments had become so far separated as to be of no assistance to each other, the Indians developed their scheme, suddenly dashing from a ravine as if springing from the earth, forty-three Indian warriors burst out upon the cavalry, letting fly their arrows and filling the air with their wild war whoops. Fortunately, Captain Hamilton was an officer of great presence of mind as well as undaunting courage. The Indians began circling about the troops, throwing themselves upon the sides of their ponies and aiming their carbines and arrows over the necks of their well-trained war steeds. Captain Hamilton formed his men in order to defend themselves against the assault of their active enemies. The Indians displayed unusual boldness, sometimes dashing close up to the cavalry and sending in a perfect shower of bullets and arrows. Fortunately, their aim, riding as they did at full speed, was necessarily inaccurate. At this time, we who had remained in the camp were ignorant of what was transpiring. Dr. Coates, whose acquaintance had been made before, had accompanied Captain Hamilton's command, but when the latter was divided, the doctor joined the detachment of my brother. In some unexplained manner, the doctor became separated from both parties, 
and remained so until the sound of the firing attracted him towards Captain Hamilton's party. When within a half a mile of the latter, he saw what was transpiring, saw our men in the center and Indians charging and firing from the outside. His first impulse was to push on and endeavor to break through the line of savages, casting his lot with his struggling comrades. This impulse was suddenly nipped in the bud. The Indians, with their quick, watchful eyes, had discovered his presence, and a half a dozen of their best-mounted warriors at once galloped towards him. Happily, the doctor was in the direction of camp from Captain Hamilton's party, and, comprehending the peril of his situation at a glance, turned his horse's head toward the camp, and applying the spur freely, set out on a ride for life. The Indians saw this move, but were not disposed to be deprived of their victim in this way. They were better mounted than the doctor, his only advantage being in the start and the greater object to be obtained. When the race began, he was fully four miles from camp. The day was hot and sultry country rough and broken, and his horse somewhat jaded from the effects of the ride in the morning. These must have seen immense obstacles in the eyes of a man who is riding for dear life. A false step, a broken girth, or almost any trifle might decide his fate. How often, if ever, the doctor looked back, I know not. His eyes, more probably, were strained to catch a glimpse of camp, or of assistance accidentally coming to his relief. Neither the one nor the other appeared. His pursuers, knowing that their success must be gained soon, if at all, pressed their fleet ponies forward until they seemed to skim over the surface of the green plain, and their shouts of exultation falling clear and louder upon his ear told the doctor that they were surely gaining upon him. Fortunately, our domestic horses, until accustomed to their presence, are as terrified by Indians as by a huge wild beast, and will fly from them if not restrained. The yells and the approaching Indians served no doubt to quicken the energies of the doctor's horse, and impelled him to greater efforts to escape. So close had the Indians succeeded in approaching that they were almost within arrow range, and would soon have sent one flying through the doctor's body, when, to greet the joy of the pursued and the corresponding grief of his pursuers, camp suddenly appeared in full view scarcely a mile distant. The ponies of the Indians had been ridden too hard to justify their riders into venturing near enough to provoke pursuit upon fresh animals. Sending a parting volley of bullets after the flying doctor, they turned about and disappeared. The doctor did not slacken his pace on this account, however. He knew that Captain Hamilton's party was in peril, and that assistance should reach him as soon as possible. Without tightening rein or sparing spur, he came dashing into camp, and the first we knew of his presence he had thrown himself from an almost breathless horse and was lying on the ground, unable, from sheer exhaustion and excitement, to utter a word. The officers and the men gathered about him in astonishment, eager and anxious to hear his story, for all knew that something far from any ordinary event had transpired to place the doctor in such a condition of mind and body. As soon as he had recovered sufficiently to speak, he told us that he had left Captain Hamilton surrounded by a superior force of Indians, and that he himself had been pursued almost to the borders of the camp. This was enough. The next moment the bugle rang out the signal to horse, and in less time than would be required to describe it, horses were saddled and arms ready. Then there was mounting in hot haste. A moment later the command set off at a brisk trot to attempt to rescue their beleaguered comrades. Persons unfamiliar with cavalry service may mentally inquire why, in such of an emergency as this, the intended reinforcements were not pushed forward at a rapid gallop. But in answer to this, it need only be said that we had a ride of at least five miles before us in order to arrive at the point where Captain Hamilton and his comrades had last been seen, and it was absolutely necessary to so husband the powers of our horses as to save them for the real work of conflict. End of chapter 7, part 1
This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 7, Part 2 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We had advanced in this manner probably two miles when we discerned in the distance the approach of Captain Hamilton's party. They were returning leisurely to camp after having succeeded in driving off their assailants and inflicting upon them a loss of two warriors killed and several wounded. The Indians could only boast of having wounded a horse belonging to Captain Hamilton's party. This encounter with the Indians occurred in the direction taken by Major Elliott's detachment on leaving camp, and the Indians after this repulse by Captain Hamilton withdrew in that direction. This added to our anxiety concerning the safety of Major Elliott and his men. There was no doubt now that all Indians infesting the broad belt of country between the Arkansas and the Platte rivers were on the warpath, and would seek revenge from any party so unfortunate as to fall in their way. The loss of two warriors slain in the fight, and their wounded comrades, would be additional incentives to acts of hostility. If there had been any possible means of communicating with Major Elliot and either strengthening or warning him, it would have been done. He left us by no traveled or defined route, and it was by no means probable that he would pass over the same trail in coming from Fort Sedgwick as in going to that point. Otherwise, reinforcements could have been sent out over his trail to meet him. On the 27th, our fears for the safety of the Major and his escort were dispelled by their safe return to camp, having accomplished a ride of nearly two hundred miles through an enemy's country. They had concealed themselves in ravines during the daytime, and traveled at night, trusting to the fateful compass and their guide to bring them safely back. Now that the Major and his party had returned to us, our anxiety became centered in the fate of the larger party, which had proceeded with the train to Fort Wallace for supplies. The fact that Major Elliott made his trip unmolested by Indians proved that the latter were most likely assembled south of us, that is, between us and Fort Wallace. Wherever they were, their numbers were known to be large. It would be impossible for a considerable force, let alone a wagon train, to pass from our camp to Fort Wallace and not be seen by the Indian scouting parties. They had probably observed the departure of the train and escort, at the time, and divining the object which occasion to sending of wagons would permit them to go to the fort unmolested, but would waylay them upon their return, in the hope of obtaining the supplies they contained. Under this supposition, the Indians had probably watched the train and escort during every mile of their progress. If so, they would not fail to discover that the larger portion of the escort halted at Beaver Creek, while the wagons proceeded to the fort guarded by only forty-eight men, in which case the Indians would combine their forces and attack the train at some point between Fort Wallace and Beaver Creek. Looking at these probable events, I not only felt impelled to act promptly to secure the safety of the train and its escort, but a deeper and stronger motive stirred me to leave nothing undone to circumvent the Indians. My wife, who, in answer to my letter, I believed was then at Fort Wallace, would place herself under the protection of the escort of the train and attempt to rejoin me in camp. The mere thought of danger to which she might be exposed spurred me to decisive action. One full squadron, well mounted and armed under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Myers, an officer of great experience in Indian affairs, left our camp at dark on the evening of the day that Captain Hamilton had his engagement with the Indians, and set out in the direction of Fort Wallace. His orders were to press forward as rapidly as practicable, following the trail made by the train. Written orders were sent to his care to Colonel West, who was in command of that portion of the escort, which had halted at Beaver Creek to join Colonel Myers' command with his own, and then to continue to march towards Fort Wallace until he should meet the returning train and escort. The Indians, however, were not deprived of this opportunity to secure scalps and plunder. 
from our camp to Beaver Creek was nearly fifty miles. Colonel Myers marched his command without halting until he joined Colonel West at Beaver Creek. Here the two commands united, and under the direction of Colonel West, the senior officer of the party, proceeded to Fort Wallace following the train left by the wagon train and escort. If the escort and Colonel West's forces could be united, they might confidently hope to repel any attack made upon them by Indians. Colonel West was an old Indian fighter, and too thoroughly accustomed to the Indian tactics to permit his command to be surprised or defeated in any manner other than by a fair contest. Let us leave them for a time and join the wagon train and its escort, the later numbering all told as before stated, forty-eight men under the immediate command of Lieutenant Robbins. Colonel Cook, whose special duty connected him with the train and its supplies, could also be relied upon for material assistance with the troops in case of actual conflict with the enemy. Comstock, the favorite scout, a host in himself, was sent to guide the party to and from Fort Wallace. In addition to these were the Teamsters, who could not be expected to do more than control their team should the train be attacked. The march from camp to Beaver Creek was made without incident. Here the combined forces of Colonel West and Lieutenant Robbins encamped together during the night. Next morning, at early dawn, Lieutenant Robbins' party, having the train in charge, continued to march towards Fort Wallace, while Colonel West sent out scouting parties up and down the stream to search for Indians. As yet, None of their party were aware of the hostile attitude assumed by the Indians within the past few hours, and Colonel West's instructions contemplated a friendly meeting between his forces and the Indians, should the latter be discovered. The march of the train and the escort was made to Fort Wallace without interruption. The only incident worthy of remark was an observation of Comstock's which proved how thoroughly he was familiar with the Indians and his customs. The escort was moving over a beautifully level plateau. Not a mound or hillock disturbed the evenness of the surface for miles in either direction. To the unpractised eye, there seemed no recess or obstruction in or behind which an enemy might be concealed. But everything appeared open to the view for miles and miles, look in what direction one might. Yet such was not the case. Ravines of greater or less extent though not perceptible at a glance, might have been discovered if searched for, extending almost to the trail over which the party was moving. These ravines, if followed, would be found to grow deeper and deeper, until, after running their course in an indefinite extent, they would terminate in the valley of some running stream. These were natural hiding places of Indian war parties, waiting for their opportunities to dash upon unsuspecting victims. These ravines served the same purpose to the Indians of the timberless plains that the ambush did to those Indians of the eastern states accustomed to fighting in the forests and everglades. Comstock's keen eyes took in all at a glance, and he remarked to Colonel Cook and Lieutenant Robbins, as the three rode together at the head of the column, that if the Indians strike us at all, it will be just about the time we are coming along back over this very spot. Now mind what I tell ye all. We shall see how correct Comstock's prophecy was. Arriving at the fort, no time was lost in loading up the wagons with fresh supplies, obtaining the mail intended for the command, and preparing to set out on the return to camp the following day. No late news regarding Indian movements was obtained. Fortunately, my letter from Fort McPherson to Mrs. Custer asking her to come to Fort Wallace miscarried, and she did not undertake a journey which in all probability would have imperiled her life, if not terminated it in a most tragic manner. On the following morning, Colonel Cook and Lieutenant Robbins began their return march. They had advanced one half of the distance which separated them from Colonel West's camp, without the slightest occurrence to disturb the monotony of their march, and had reached the point where, on passing before, Comstock had indulged in his prognostication regarding Indians, yet nothing had been seen to excite suspicious alarm. 
Comstock always on the alert, and with eyes as quick as those of an Indian, had been scanning the horizon in all directions. Suddenly he perceived, or thought he perceived, strange figures resembling human heads peering over the crest of a hill far away to the right. Hastily leveling his field glass, he pronounced the strange figures, which were scarcely perceptible to neither more nor less than Indians. The officers brought into requisition their glasses, and were soon convinced of the correctness of Comstock's report. It was some time before the Indians perceived that they had been discovered. Concealment, then, being no longer possible, they boldly rode to the crest and exposed themselves into full view. At first, but twenty or thirty made their appearance. Gradually their numbers became augmented, until about a hundred warriors could be seen. It may readily be imagined that the appearance of so considerable a body of Indians produced no little excitement and speculation in the minds of the people with the train. The speculation was as to the intentions of the Indians, whether hostile or friendly. Upon this subject all doubts were soon dispelled. The Indians continued to receive ascensions to their numbers, and reinforcements coming from beyond the crest of the hill on which their presence was first discovered. Finally, seeming confident in their superior numbers, the warriors, all of whom were mounted, advanced leisurely down the slope leading in the direction of the train and its escort. By the aid of field glasses, Comstock and the two officers were able to determine fully the character of the party now approaching them. The last doubt was thus removed. It was clearly to be seen that the Indians were arrayed in full war costume, their heads adorned by the brilliantly colored war bonnets, their faces, arms, and bodies painted in various colors, rendering their natural, repulsive appearance even more hideous. As they approached nearer, they assumed a certain order in the manner of their advance. Some were seen to be carrying the long, glistening lance with its pennant of bright colors, while upon the left arm hung a round shield, almost bulletproof and ornamented with paint and feathers, according to the taste of the wearer. Nearly all were armed with carbines and one or two revolvers, while many in addition to these weapons carried a bow and arrow. When the entire band had defiled down the inclined slope, Comstock and the officers were able to estimate roughly the full strength of the party. They were astonished to perceive that between six and seven hundred warriors were bearing down upon them, and in a few minutes would undoubtedly commence the attack. Against such odds, and upon ground so favorable for the Indian mode of warfare, it seemed unreasonable to hope for a favorable result. Yet the entire escort, officers and men, entered upon their defense with the determination to sell their lives as dearly as possible. As the coming engagement, so far as the cavalry was concerned, was to be purely a defensive one, Lieutenant Robbins at once set out preparing to receive his unwelcome visitors. Colonel Cook formed the train in two parallel columns, leaving ample space between the horses and the cavalry. Lieutenant Robbins then dismounted his men and prepared to fight on foot. The led horses, under charge of the fourth trooper, were placed between the two columns of wagons and were thus in a measure protected from the assaults, which the officers had every reason to believe would be made for their capture. The dismounted cavalrymen were thus formed in a regular circle, enclosing the train and the horses. Colonel Cook took command of one flank, Lieutenant Robbins of the other, while Comstock, who as well as the two officers remained mounted, galloped from point to point wherever his presence was most valuable. These dispositions being perfected, the march was resumed in disorder and the attack of the savages calmly awaited. The Indians, who were interested spectators of these preparations for their reception, continued to approach, but seemed willing to delay their attack until the plain became a little more favorable for their operations. Finally, the desired moment seemed to have arrived. The Indians had approached to within easy range, but not a shot had been fired, the cavalrymen having been instructed by their officers to reserve their fire for close quarters. Suddenly, with a wild, ringing war-whoop, 
the entire band of warriors bore down upon the train and its little party of defenders on came the savages filling the air with their terrible yells their first object evidently was to stampede the horses and draught animals of the train then in the excitement and consternation which would follow to massacre the escort and drivers the wagon master in immediate charge of the train had been ordered to keep his two columns of wagons constantly moving forward and well closed up this last injunction was hardly necessary as the frightened teamsters glancing at the approaching warriors and bearing their savage shouts were sufficiently anxious to keep well closed upon their leaders the first onslaught of the indians was made on the flank which was superintended by colonel cook they rode boldly forward as if to dash over the mere handful of cavalrymen who stood in skirmishing order in a circle about the train not a soldier faltered as the enemy came thundering upon them but waited until the indians were within short rifle range of the train the cavalrymen dropped upon their knees and taking deliberate aim poured a volume from their spencer carbines into the ranks of the savages which seemed to put a sudden check upon the odor of their movements and force them to wheel off to the right several of the warriors were seen to reel in their saddles while their ponies of others were brought down or wounded by the effectual fire of the cavalrymen those of the savages who were shot from their saddles were scarcely permitted to fall to the ground before a score or more of their comrades dashed to their rescue and bore their bodies beyond the possible reach of our men this in accordance with indian custom in battle they will risk the lives of a dozen of their best warriors to prevent the body of any one of their number from falling into the white man's possession the reason for this is the belief which generally prevails among all the tribes that if a warrior loses his scalp he forfeits his hope of ever reaching the happy hunting ground as the indians were being driven back by the well-directed volley of the cavalrymen the latter overjoyed at their first success became reassured and set up a cheer of exultation while comstock who had not been idle in the fight called out to the retreating indians in their native tongues taunting them with their unsuccessful assault the indians withdrew to a point beyond the range of our carbines and there seemed to engage in a parley comstock who closely watched every movement remarked that there's no such good luck for us as to think them injuns mean to give it up so six hundred red devils ain't going to let fifty men stop them from getting at the coffee and sugar that is in the wagons and they ain't going to be satisfied until they get some of our scalps to pay for the bucks we popped out of their saddles a bit ago it was probable that the indians were satisfied that they could not dash through the train and stampede the animals their recent attempt had convinced them that some other method of attack must be resorted to nothing but their greater superiority in numbers had induced them to risk so much in a charge the officers passed along the line of skirmishes for this in reality was all their line consisted of and cautioned the men against wasting their ammunition it was yet early in the afternoon and should the conflict be prolonged until night there was great danger of exhausting the supply of ammunition the indians seemed to have thought of this and the change in their method of attack encouraged such a result but little time was spent at the parley again the entire band of warriors except those already disabled prepared to renew their attack and advanced as before this time however with greater caution evidently desiring to avoid a reception similar to the first when sufficiently near the troops the indians developed their new plan of attack it was not to advance in mass as before but fight as individuals each warrior selecting his own time and method of attack this is the habitual manner of fighting among all indians of the plains and is termed circling first the chiefs led off followed at a regular interview by warriors until the entire six or seven hundred were to be seen riding in single file as rapidly as their fleet-footed ponies could carry them preserving this order and keeping up their savage chorus of yells war-whoops and taunting epithets 
this long line of mounted barbarians was guided in such a manner as to envelop the train and escort and make the latter appear like a small circle within a larger one the indians gradually contracted their circle although maintaining the full speed of their ponies until sufficiently close to open fire upon the soldiers at first the shots were scattered and wide of their mark but emboldened by the silence of their few but determined opponents they rode nearer and fought with greater impetuosity forced now to defend themselves to the uttermost the cavalrymen opened fire from their carbines with most gratifying results the indians however moving at such a rapid gait and in single file presented a most uncertain target to add to this uncertainty the savages availed themselves to their superior almost marvellous powers of horsemanship throwing themselves upon the sides of their well-trained ponies they left no part of their persons exposed to the aim of the troopers except the head and one foot and in this posture they were able to aim the weapon either over or under the necks of their ponies thus using the bodies of the latter as an effective shield against the bullets of their adversaries at no time were the indians able to force the train and its escort to come to a halt the march was continued as an uninterrupted gait this successful defense against the indians was in a great measure due to the presence of the wagons which arranged in the order described formed a complete barrier to the charges and assaults of the savages and as a last resort the wagons could have been halted and used as a breastwork behind which the cavalry dismounted would have been almost invincible against their more numerous enemies there is nothing an indian dislikes more in warfare than to attack a foe however weak behind the breastworks of any kind any contrivance which is an obstacle to his pony is a most serious obstacle to the warrior the attack of the indians aggravated by their losses in warriors and ponies as many of the latter had been shot down was continued without cessation for three hours the supply of ammunition of the cavalry was running low the fourth troopers who had remained in charge of the led horses between the two columns of wagons were now replaced from the skirmishers and the former were added to the list of active combatants if the indian should maintain the fight much longer there was serious ground for apprehension regarding the limited supply of ammunition if only night or reinforcements would come was the prayerful hope of those who contended so gallantly against such heavy odds night was still too far off to promise much encouragement while as to the reinforcements their coming would be purely accidental at least so argued those most interested in their arrival yet reinforcements were at that moment striving to reach them comrades were in the saddle and spurring forward to their relief the indians although apparently turning all their attention to the little band inside had omitted no precaution to guard against the interference from outside parties in this instance perhaps they were more than ordinarily watchful and had posted some of their keen-eyed warriors on the high line of the bluffs which ran almost parallel to the trail over which the combatants moved from these bluffs not only a good view of the fight could be obtained but the country for miles in either direction was spread out beneath them and enabled the scouts to discern the approach of any hostile party which might be advancing fortunate for the savages that this precaution had not been neglected or the contest in which they were engaged might have become one of more equal numbers to the careless eye nothing could have been seen to excite suspicion but the warriors on the lookout were not long in discovering something which occasioned them no little anxiety dismounting from their ponies and concealing the latter in the ravine they prepared to investigate more fully the cause of their alarm that which they saw was as yet but a faint dark line on the surface of the plain almost against the horizon so faint was it that no one but an indian or a practiced frontiersman would have observed it it was fully ten miles from them and directly in their line of march the ordinary observer would have pronounced it a break or irregularity in the ground or perhaps the shadow of a cloud and its apparent permanency 
of location would have dispelled any fear as to its dangerous character. But was it stationary? Apparently, yes. The Indians discovered otherwise. By close watching, a long, faint line could be seen moving along, as if creeping stealthily upon an unconscious foe. Slowly it assumed a more definite shape, until what appeared to be a mere stationary dark line drawn upon the green surface of the plain developed itself into the searching eyes of the red man, into a column of cavalry moving at a rapid gait toward the very point they were occupying. Convinced of this fact, one of the scouts leaped upon his pony and flew with almost the speed of the wind to impart this knowledge to the chiefs in command on the plain below. True, the approaching cavalry, being still several miles distant, could not arrive for nearly two hours. But the question to be considered by the Indians was whether it would be prudent for them to continue their attack on the train, their ponies already becoming exhausted by the three hours hard riding given them, until the arrival of fresh detachment of the enemy, whose horses might be in a condition favorable to a rapid pursuit, and thereby enable them to overtake those of the Indians whose ponies were exhausted. Unwilling to incur this new risk, and seeing no prospect of overcoming their present adversaries by a sudden or combined dash, the Indians decided to withdraw from the attack, and made their escape while the advantage was yet in their favor. The surprise of the cavalrymen may be imagined at seeing the Indians, after pouring a shower of bullets and arrows into the train, withdrew to the bluffs, and immediately after continue their retreat until lost of view. The victory for the troopers, although so unexpected, was none the less welcome. The Indians contrived to carry away with them their killed and wounded. Five of their bravest warriors were known to have been sent to the happy hunting ground, while the list of their wounded was much larger. After the Indians had withdrawn and left the cavalrymen masters of the field, our wounded, of whom there were comparatively few, received every possible care and attention. Those of the detachment who had escaped unharmed were busily engaged in exchanging congratulations and relating incidents of the fight. In this manner nearly an hour had been whittled away, and far in the distance in their immediate front fresh cause for anxiety was discovered. At first the general opinion was that if it was the Indians again determined to contest their progress. Field glasses were again called into requisition and revealed, not Indians, but the familiar blue blouses of the cavalry. Never was the sight more welcome. The next moment Colonel Cook and Comstock and a few troopers applied spurs to their horses and were soon dashing forward to meet their comrades. The approaching party was none other than Colonel West's detachment, hastening to the relief of the train and its gallant little escort. A few words explained all, and told the heroes of the recent fight how it happened that reinforcements were sent to their assistance, and then was explained why the Indians had so suddenly concluded to abandon their attack and seek safety in quietly withdrawing from the field. End of chapter 7。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 8 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the morning of the 28th, the train with its escort returned to the main camp on the Republican. All were proud of the conduct of these detachments of the command, which had been brought into actual conflict with the Indians. The heroes of the late fights were congratulated heartily upon their good luck, while the comrades who had unavoidably remained in camp consoled themselves with the hope that the next opportunity might be theirs. The dispatches brought by Major Elliott from General Sherman directed me to continue my march as had been suggested up the North Republican, then strike northward and reach the Platte again at some point west of Fort Sedgwick near Riverside Station. This program was carried out. Leaving our camp on the Republican, we marched up the North Fork of that river about sixty miles, 
then turned due north and marched for the valley of the Platte. The only incident connected with this march was the painful journey under the burning July sun of sixty-five miles without a drop of water for our horses or drought animals. The march was necessarily effected in one day and produced untold suffering among the poor dumb brutes. Many of the dogs accompanying the command died from thirst and exhaustion. When the sun went down, we were still many miles from the Platte. The moon, which was nearly full at the time, lighted us on our weary way for some time, but even this was only an aggravation, as it enabled us from the high bluffs bordering the Platte Valley to see the river flowing beneath us, yet many miles beyond our reach. Taking Lieutenant Molan, Dr. Coates, and one attendant with me, and leaving the command under the temporary charge of Major Elliot, I pushed on intending, after arriving at the river, to select a good camping ground as the darkness and circumstances would permit. We then imagined ourselves within four or five miles of the river. So did it appear to us. Mile after mile was traversed by our tired horses, yet we apparently arrived no nearer our journey's end. At last, at about eleven o'clock, and after having ridden a brisk rate of nearly fifteen miles, we reached the river bank. Our first act was to improve the opportunity to quench our thirst and that of our horses. Considering the lateness of the hour and the distance we had ridden since leaving the command, it was idle to expect the latter to reach the river before daylight. Nothing was left to us but to bivouac for the night. This we did by selecting a beautiful piece of swad on the river banks for our couch, after taking our saddle blankets for covering and our saddles for pillows. Each of us attached his horse by the halter strap to the hilt of his saber, then forced the saber firmly into the ground. Both horses and riders were weary as well as hungry. At first the horses grazed upon the fresh green pasture which grew luxuriantly on the river bank, but fatigue, more powerful than hunger, soon claimed the mastery, and in a few minutes our little group, horses and men, were wrapped in the sweetest of slumber. Had we known that the Indians were then engaged in murdering men within a few minutes' ride of where we slept, and that when we awakened in the morning it would be to still find ourselves away from the command, and sleep would not have been so undisturbed. Daylight was beginning to make its appearance in the east when our little party of slumbering troopers began to arouse themselves. Those unfortunate persons who have always been accustomed to the easy comforts of civilization and who have never known what real fatigue or hunger is cannot realize or appreciate the blissful luxury of a sleep which follows a day's ride in the saddle and a half a hundred miles or more. Being the first to awake, I rose to a sitting position and took a hasty survey of our situation. Within a few feet of us flowed the Platte River. Our group, horses and men, presented an interesting subject for a painter. To my surprise, I discovered that a heavy shower of rain had fallen during the night, but so deep had been our slumber that even the rain had failed to disturb us. Each one of the party had spread his saddle blanket on the ground to serve as his couch, while for covering we had called into requisition an Indian rubber poncho, or rubber blanket, which invariably forms an important part of the plainsman's outfit. The rain, without awakening any of the party, had aroused them sufficiently to cause each one to pull his rubber blanket over his face, and thus protected he continued his repose. The appearance presented by this somber-looking group of sleepers strongly reminded me of scenes during the war, when, after a battle, the bodies of slain had been collected for burial. But this was no time to indulge in idle reveries. Arousing my comrades, we set about discovering the circumstances of our situation. First, the duties of a hasty toilet were attended to. Nothing, however, could be more simple. As we had slept in our clothes, top boots and all, we had so much less to attend to. The river flowing at our feet afforded a lavatory which, if not complete in its appointments, 
was sufficiently grand in its extent to satisfy every want it was now becoming sufficiently light to enable us to see indistinctly for almost a mile in either direction yet our eyes failed to reveal to us any evidence of the presence of the command here was fresh cause for anxiety not only as to our own situation but as to the whereabouts of the troops saddling up our horses each person acting on his own groom we waited to the clearing away of the morning mist to see the main body we had not long to wait the light was soon sufficient to enable us to scan the country with our field glasses in all directions much to our joy we discovered the bivouac of troops about three miles down the river a brisk gallop soon placed us where we desired to be and a few words explained how in the darkness the column had failed to follow us but instead had headed for the river at a point below us a portion not reaching the bank until near morning breakfast disposed of the next question was to ascertain our exact location and distance from the nearest telegraph station fortunately riverside station was near our camp and from there we ascertained that we were then about fifty miles west of fort sedgwick the party obtaining this information also learned that the indians had attacked the nearest stage station west of camp the preceding evening and killed three men the station was only a few minutes ride from the point of the river bank where myself and comrades had passed the night in such a fancied security believing that general sherman must have sent latter instructions for me to fort sedgwick than those last received from him i sent a telegraph to the officer in command at the fort making inquiry to that effect to my surprise i received a dispatch saying that the day after the departure of major elliott and his detachment from fort sedgwick with dispatches of which mention had been previously made a second detachment of equal strength viz ten troopers of the second united states cavalry under the command of lieutenant kidder and guided by a famous sioux chief named red deed had left fort sedgwick with the important dispatches for me from general sherman and that lieutenant kidder had been directed to proceed to my camp near the forks of the republican and failing to find me there he was to follow rapidly on my trail until he should overtake my command i immediately telegraphed to fort sedgwick that nothing had been seen or heard of lieutenant kidder's detachment and requested a copy of the dispatches borne by him to be sent to me by telegraph this was done the instructions of general sherman were for me to march my command as was at first contemplated across the country from the platte to the smoky hill river striking the latter at fort wallace owing to the low state of my supplies i determined to set out for fort wallace at daylight next morning great anxiety prevailed throughout the command concerning lieutenant kidder and his party true he had precisely the same number of men that composed major elliott's detachment when the latter went upon like a mission but the circumstances which would govern in the one case had changed when applied to the other major elliott an officer of experience and good judgment had fixed the strength of his escort and performed the journey before it was positively known that the indians in the section had entered upon the warpath had the attack on the commands of hamilton robbins and cook been made prior to elliott's departure the latter would have taken not less than fifty troopers as escort. After an informal exchange of opinions between the officers of my command regarding the whereabouts of Lieutenant Kidder and party, we endeavored to satisfy ourselves with the following explanation. Using the capital letter Y for illustration, let us locate Fort Sedgwick, from which post Lieutenant Kidder was sent with dispatches at the upper right point of the letter the camp of my command at the forks of the republican would be at the junction of the three branches of the letter fort wallace relatively would be at the lower termination and the point on the plat at which my command was located the morning referred to be at the upper termination of the left branch of the letter robbins and cook in going with the train to wallace for supplies had passed and returned over the lower branch after their return and that of major elliott and his party 
my entire command resumed the march for the Platte. We moved for two or three miles out on the heavy wagon trail of Robbins and Cook, then suddenly changed our direction to the right. It was supposed to be that Kidder and his party arrived at our deserted camp at the forks of the Republican about nightfall, but finding us gone, had determined to avail themselves of the moonlight night and overtake us before we should break camp the next morning. Riding rapidly in the dim light of the evening, they had failed to observe the point at which we had diverged from the plainer trail of Robinson Cook, and instead of following our trail, had continued on the former in the direction of Fort Wallace. Such seemed to be a plausible, if not the only solution, capable of being given. Anxiety for the fate of Kidder and his party was one of the reasons impelling me to set out promptly on my return. From our camp at the forks of the Republican to Fort Wallace was about eighty miles, but eighty miles of the most dangerous country infested by Indians. Remembering the terrible contest in which the command of Robbins and Cook had been engaged on this very route within a few days, and knowing that the Indians would be in all probability maintain a strict watch over the trail to surprise any small party which might venture over it, I felt in the highest degree of solicitous for the safety of Lieutenant Kidder and party. Even if he succeeded in reaching Fort Wallace unmolested, there was the reason to apprehend that, impressed with the importance of delivering his dispatches promptly, he would set out on his return at once and endeavor to find my command. Let us leave him and his detachment for a brief interval, and return to events which were more immediately connected with my command, and which bear a somewhat tragic as well as personal interest. In a previous chapter, reference has been made to the state of dissatisfaction which had made its appearance among the enlisted men. The state of feeling had been principally superinduced by inferior and insufficient rations, a fault for which no one connected with the troops in the field was responsible, but which was chargeable to persons far removed from the theater of our movements, persons connected with the supply detachments of the army. Added to this internal source of disquiet, we were then on the main line of overland travel to some of our most valuable and lately discovered mining regions. The opportunity to obtain marvelous wages as miners and the prospect of amassing sudden wealth proved a temptation sufficiently strong to make many of the men forget their sworn obligations to their government and their duties as soldiers. Forgetting for the moment that the command to which they belonged was actually engaged in war and was in a country infested with armed bodies of the enemy and that the legal penalty of desertion under such circumstances was death, Many of the men formed a combination to desert their colors and escape to the mines. The first intimation received by any person in authority of the existence of this plot was on the morning fixed for our departure from the plot. Orders had been issued the previous evening for the command to march at daylight. Upwards of forty men were reported as having deserted during the night. There was no time to send parties in pursuit, or the capture and return of a portion of them might have been effected. The command marched southward at daylight. At noon, having marched fifteen miles, we halted to rest and graze the horses for one hour. The men believed that the halt was made for the remainder of the day, and here a plan was perfected among the disaffected by which upwards of one-third of the effective strength of the command was to seize their horses and arms during the night and escape to the mountains. Had the conspirators succeeded in putting this plan into execution, it would have been difficult to say how serious the consequences might be, or whether enough true men would remain to render the march to Fort Wallace practicable. Fortunately, it was decided to continue the march some fifteen miles further before night. The necessary orders were given, and everything was being repacked for the march, when attention was called to thirteen soldiers who were then to be seen rapidly leaving the camp in the direction from which we had marched. Seven of these were mounted and were moving off at a rapid gallop. 
The remaining six were dismounted, not having been so fortunate as their fellows in procuring horses. The entire party were still within sound of the bugle, but no orders by bugle note or otherwise served to check or diminish their flight. The boldness of this attempt at desertion took every one by surprise. Such an occurrence of enlisted men deserting in broad daylight and under the immediate eyes of their officers had never been heard of. With the exception of the horses of the guard and a few belonging to the officers, all others were still grazing and unsaddled. The officer of the guard was directed to mount his command promptly, and if possible overtake the deserters. At the same time, those of the officers whose horses were in readiness were also directed to join in pursuit and leave no effort untried to prevent the escape of a single malcontent. In giving each party sent in pursuit instructions, there was no limited fixed to the measures where they were authorized to adopt in executing their orders. This, unfortunately, was an emergency which involved the safety of the entire command and required treatment of the most summary character. It was found impossible to overtake that portion of the party which was mounted, as it was afterwards learned that they had selected seven of the fleetest horses in the command. Those on foot, when discovering themselves pursued, increased their speed, but a chance of a couple of miles brought the pursuers within hailing distance. Major Elliot, the senior officer participating in the pursuit, called out to the deserters to halt and surrender. This command was several times repeated, but without effect. Finally, seeing the hopelessness of the further flight, the deserters came back to bay, and Major Elliot's renewed demand to throw down their arms and surrender. The ringleader drew up his carbine to fire at his pursuers. This was a signal for the latter to open fire, which they did successfully, bringing down three of the deserters, although two of them were worse frightened than hurt. Rejoining the command with their six captive deserters, the pursuing party reported their inability to overtake those who had deserted on horseback. The march was resumed and continued until near nightfall, by which time we had placed thirty miles between us and our last camp on the Platte. While on the march during the day, a trusty sergeant, one who had served as a soldier long and faithfully, imparted the first information which could be relied upon as to the plot which had been formed by the malcontents to desert in a body. The following night had been selected as a time for making the attempt. The best horses and arms in the command were to be seized and taken away. I believe that the summary action adopted during the day would intimidate any who might still be contemplating desertion and was confident that another day's march would place us so far in hostile and dangerous country that the risk of encountering war parties of Indians would in itself serve to deter any but large numbers from attempting to make their way back to the settlements. To bridge the following night in safety was the next problem. While there was undoubtedly a large portion of the men who could be fully relied upon to remain true to their obligations, and to render any support to their officers which might be demanded, yet the great difficulty at this time, owing to the sudden deployment of the plot, was to determine who could be trusted. This difficulty was solved by placing every officer in command on guard during the entire night. The men were assembled as usual for roll call, at tattoo, and then notified that every man must be in his tent at the signal taps, which would be sounded half an hour later, that their company officers, fully armed, would walk the company streets during the entire night, and any man appearing outside the limits of his tent between the hours of taps and reveille would do so at the risk of being fired upon after being once hailed. The night passed without disturbance and the daylight found us in the saddle and pursuing our line of march toward Fort Wallace. It is proper to here record the fact that from that date onward desertion from the command during the continuance of the expedition was never attempted. It may become necessary in order to perfect the record, borrowing a term from the War Department, 
to refer in a subsequent chapter to certain personnel and official events which resulted partially from the foregoing occurrences. Let us now turn our attention to Lieutenant Kidder and his detachment. The third night after leaving the Platte, my command encamped in the vicinity of our former camp near the forks of the Republican. So far, nothing had been learned which would enable us to form any conclusion regarding the route taken by Kidder. Comstock, the guide, was frequently appealed to for an opinion which, from his great experience on the plains, might give us some encouragement regarding Kidder's safety. But he was too cautious and careful a man, both in word and deed, to excite hopes which his reasoning could not justify. When thus appealed to, he would usually give an ominous shake of the head and avoid a direct answer. On the evening just referred to, the officers in Comstock were grouped near headquarters discussing the subject which was then uppermost in the mind of every one in camp. Comstock had been quietly listening to the various theories and surmises advanced by different members of the group, but was finally pressed to state his ideas as to Kidder's chances of escaping harm. Well, gentlemen, emphasizing the last syllable as was his manner, before man can form any idea as to how this thing is likely to end, there are several things he ought to be acquainted with. For instance, now no man need tell me any parts about Indians. If I know anything, it's Indians. I know just how they'll do anything and when they'll take to do it. But that don't settle the question, and I'll tell you why. If I'd known this young lieutenant, I mean Lieutenant Kidder, if I'd known what for sort of man he is, I could tell you mighty near to a certainty all you want to know. For you see, Injun hunting and Injun fighting is a trade all by itself, and it's like any other business a man has to know what he's about, or if he don't, he can't make a living at it. I have lots of confidence in the fighting sense of Red Beard, the Sioux chief, who is guiding the lieutenant and his men. And if that Injun can have his own way, there is a fair show for his guiding him through all right. But as I said before, the lays the difficulty. If this lieutenant, the kind of man who is willing to take advice, and if he does come from an Indian, my experience with you army folk has been alas been the youngsters among ye think you know the most, and this is particularly true if they have just come from West Point. If some of them young fellows knowed half as much as they believe they do, you couldn't tell them nothing. As to rail book learning, why I suppose they got it all, but but the fact of the matter is they couldn't tell the difference twixt the trail of a war party and one made by a hunting party to save their necks. Half of them when they first come here can't tell a squaw from a buck, just because both ride straddle. But they soon learn. But that's not neither here nor there. I told that the lieutenant were taken about as a newcomer and that this is his first scout. If that be the case, it puts a mighty uncertain look on the whole thing. And twixt you and me, gentlemen, he'll be mighty lucky if he gets through all right. Tomorrow we'll strike the Wallace Trail, and I can mighty soon tell if he has gone that way. But little encouragement was to be derived from these expressions. The morrow would undoubtedly enable us, as Comstock had predicted, to determine whether or not the lieutenant and his party had missed our trail and taken that leading to Fort Wallace. At daylight, our column could have been seen stretching out in the direction of the Wallace Trail. A march of a few miles brought us to the point of intersection. Comstock and the Delawares had galloped in advance and were about concluding a thorough examination of the various tracks to be seen in the trail when the head of the column overtook them. Well, what do you find, Comstock? was my first inquiry. They gone towards Fort Wallace, sure, was his reply, and in support of his opinion he added, The trail shows that about twelve American horses shot all round it past his walk, going in the direction of the fort, and when they went by this point they were all right because their horses were moving along easy, and there were no pony tracks behind them. 
as wouldn't be the case if the Injuns had got an eye on em. He then remarked, as if in parentheses, It would be astonishing if that lieutenant and his layouts gets into the fort without a scrimmage. He may, but if he does, it'll be a scratch of ever there was one, or I'll lose my confidence in Injuns. The opinion expressed by Comstock as to the chances of Lieutenant Kidder and the party making their way to the fort across eighty miles of danger unmolested, was in the concurrent opinion of all officers. And now that they had discovered their trail, the interest and anxiety became immeasurably increased as to their fate. The latter could not remain in doubt much longer, as two days' marching would take us to the fort. Alas, we were to solve the mystery without waiting so long. Pursuing our way along the plain, heavy trail made by Robbins and Cook, and directing Comstock and the Delawares to watch closely, that we did not lose that of Kidder and his party, we patiently but hopefully awaited further developments. How many miles we had thus passed over without incident worthy of mention, I do not now recall. The sun was high in the heavens, showing that our day's march was about half completed, when those of us who were riding at the head of the column discovered a strange-looking object lying directly in our path and more than a mile distance. It was too large for a human being, yet in color and appearance at that distance resembled no animal frequenting the plains, of which any of us were familiar. Eager to determine its character, a dozen or more of our party, including Comstock and some of the Delawares, galloped in front. Before riding the full distance, the question was determined. The object seen was the body of a white horse. Closer examination showed that it had been shot within the past few days, with the brand U.S. proved that it was a government animal. Major Elliott then remembered that while at Fort Sedgwick, he had seen one company of cavalry mounted on white horses. These and other circumstances went far to convince us that this was one of the horses belonging to Lieutenant Kidder's party. In fact, there was no room to doubt that this was the case. Almost the unanimous opinion of the command was that there had been a contest with the Indians, and this only the first evidence we should have proving it. When the column reached the point where the slain horse lay, a halt was ordered, to enable Comstock and the Indian scouts to thoroughly examine the surrounding grounds to discover, if possible, any additional evidence, such as empty cartridge shells, arrows, or articles of Indian equipment, showing that a fight had taken place. All the horse equipment, saddle, bridle, and so on, had been carried away, but whether by friend or foe could not then be determined. While the preponderance of circumstance favored the belief that the horse had been killed by Indians, there was still room to hope that he had been killed by Kidder's party, and the equipment taken away by them, for it frequently happens on a march that a horse will suddenly take ill, and be unable for the time being to proceed further. In such a case, rather than abandoning him alive, with a prospect of his recovering and falling into the hands of the Indians to be employed against us, orders are given to kill him, and this might be true of accounting for the one referred to. The scouts being unable to throw any additional light upon the question, we continued our march, closely observing the ground as we passed along. Comstock noted that instead of the trail showing that Kidder's party was moving in a regular order, as when it was first discovered, there were but two or three tracks to be seen in the beaten trail, the rest being found on the grass on the other side. We had marched two miles, perhaps, from the point where the body of the slain horse had been discovered, when we came upon a second, this one, like the first, having been killed by a bullet, and all of his equipment taken away. Comstock's quick eyes were not long in detecting pony tracks in the vicinity, and we had no longer any but the one frightful solution to offer, Kidder and his party had been discovered by the Indians, probably the same powerful and bloodthirsty band which had been resisted so gallantly by the men under Robbins and Cook, and against such overwhelming odds, the issue could not be doubtful. We were then moving over a high and level plateau, 
unbroken either by ravines or divides, and just such a locality as would be usually chosen by the Indians for attacking a party of the strength of Kidders. The Indians could here ride unobstructed and encircle their victims with a continuous line of armed and painted warriors, while the beleaguered party, from the even character of the surface of the plain, would be unable to find any break or depression from behind which they might find a successful defense. It was probably this relative condition of affairs which had induced Kidder and his doomed comrades to endeavor to push on, in the hope of finding ground favorable to their making a stand against their barbarous foes. The main trail no longer showed the footprints of Kidder's party, but instead Comstock discovered the tracks of shod horses on the grass, with here and there numerous tracks of ponies, all by their appearance proving that both horses and ponies had been moving at full speed. Kidder's party must have trusted their lives temporarily to the speed of their horses, a dangerous venture when contending with Indians. However, this fearful race for life must have been most gallantly contested, because we continued our march several miles further without discovering any evidence of the savages having gained any advantage. How painfully, almost despairingly exciting must have been this ride for life, a mere handful of brave men struggling to escape the bloody clutches of the hundreds of red visage demons who, mounted on their well-trained war ponies, were straining every nerve and muscle to wreak their hands in the life-blood of their victims. It was not death alone that threatened this little band. They were not riding simply to preserve life. They rode, and doubtless prayed, as they rode, that they might escape the savage tortures, the worse than death which threatened them. Would that their prayers have been granted! We began leaving the high plateau, and to descend into a valley, through which, at the distance of nearly two miles, meandered a small prairie stream known as Beaver Creek. The valley near the banks of the stream was covered with a dense growth of tall, wild grass, intermingled with clumps of osiers. At the point where the trail crossed the stream, we hoped to obtain more definite information regarding Kidder's party and their pursuers but we were not required to wait so long. When within a mile of the stream I observed several large buzzards floating lazily in circles through the air, and but a short distance to the left of our trail. This of itself might not have attracted my attention seriously, but for the rank stench which pervaded the atmosphere, reminding one of those horrible sensations experienced upon the battlefield when passing among the decaying bodies of the dead. As if impelled by one thought, Comstock, the Delawares, and a half a dozen officers detached themselves from the column, and separating into squads of one or two, instituted a search for the cause of our horrible suspicions. After riding in all directions through the rushes and willows, and when about to relinquish the search as fruitless, one of the Delawares uttered a shout which attracted the attention of the entire command. At the same time, he was seen to leap from his horse and assume a stooping posture, as if critically examining some object of interest. Hastening in common with many others of the party to his side, a sight met our gaze which even at this remote day makes my very blood curdle. Lying in irregular order, and within a very limited circle were the mangled bodies of poor Kidder and his party, yet so brutally hacked and disfigured as to be beyond recognition save as human beings. Every individual of the party had been scalped and his skull broken, the latter done by some weapon, probably a tomahawk, except the Sioux chief Red Bead, whose scalp had simply been removed from his head and then thrown down by his side. This Comstock informed us was in accordance with a custom which prohibits an Indian from bearing off the scalp of one of its own tribe. This circumstance then told us who the perpetrators of this deed were. They could be none other than the Sioux, led in all probability by Pawnee Killer. Red Bead, being less disfigured and mutilated than the others, 
was the only individual capable of being recognized. Even the clothes of all the party had been carried away. Some of the bodies were lying in beds of ashes with partly burned fragments of wood near them, showing that the savages had put some of them to death by a terrible tortures of fire. The sinews of the arms and legs had been cut away, the nose of every man had been hacked off, and the features otherwise defaced so that it would have been scarcely possible even for a relative to recognize a single one of the unfortunate victims. We could not even distinguish the officer from his men. Each body was pierced by from twenty to fifty arrows, and the arrows were found as the savage demons had left them, bristling in the bodies. While the details of the fearful struggle will probably never be known, telling how long or gallantly these ill-fated little band contended for their lives, yet the surrounding circumstances of ground, empty cartridge shells, and a distance from where the attack began satisfied us that Kidder and his men fought as only brave men fight when the watchword is victory or death. As the officer, his men, and his no less faithful Indian guide had shared their final dangers together, and had met the same dreadful fate at the hands of the same merciless foe, it was but fitting that their remains should be consigned to one common grave. This was accordingly done. A single trench was dug near the spot where they had rendered up their lives upon the altar of duty. Silently, mournfully, their comrades of a brother regiment consigned their mangled remains to Mother Earth, there to rest undisturbed, as we supposed, until the great day of final review. But this was not to be so. While the closest scrutiny on our part had been insufficient to enable us to detect the slightest evidence which would aid us or others in identifying the body of Lieutenant Kidder or any of his men, it will be seen hereafter how the marks of a mother's thoughtful affection were to be the means of identifying the remains of her murdered son, even though months had elapsed after his untimely death. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 9 of My Life on the Plains This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the evening of the day following, that upon which we had consigned the remains of Lieutenant Kidder and his party to their humble resting place, the command reached Fort Wallace on the Smoky Hill route. From the occupants of the fort we learned much that was interesting regarding events which had transpired during our isolation from all points of communication. The Indians had attacked the fort twice within the past few days, in both of which engagements men were killed on each side. The fighting on our side was principally under the command of Colonel Barnett's, whose forces were composed of detachments of the 7th Cavalry. The fighting occurred on the level plain near the fort, where, owing to the favorable character of the ground, the Indian had ample opportunity to display their powers both as warriors and horsemen. One incident of the fight was related, which, as correctness is being vouched for, is worthy of being here repeated. Both parties were mounted, and the fighting consisted principally of charges and countercharges, the combatants of both sides becoming at times mingled with each other. During one of these attacks, a bugler boy belonging to the cavalry was shot from his horse. Before any of his comrades could reach him, a powerfully built warrior, superbly mounted on a war pony, was seen to dash at full speed toward the spot where the dying bugler lay. Scarcely checking the speed of his pony, who seemed to divine his rider's wishes, the warrior grasped the pony's mane with one hand, and stooping low as he neared the bugler, seized the latter with the other hand and lifted him from the earth, placing him across his pony in front of him. Still maintaining the full speed of his pony, he was seen to retain the body of the bugler but a moment, then cast it to the earth. The Indians being routed soon after and driven from the field, our troops, many of whom had witnessed the strange and daring action of the warrior, 
recovered possession of the dead, where the mystery became solved. The bugler had been scalped. Our arrival at Fort Wallace was most welcome, as well as opportune. The Indians had become so active and numerous that all travel over the Smoky Hill route had ceased. Stages had been taken off the route, and many of the stage stations had been abandoned by the employees, the latter fearing a repeat of the lookout station massacre. No dispatches or mail had been received at the fort for a considerable period, so that the occupants might well have been considered as undergoing a state of siege. Adding to this embarrassment, which were partly unavoidable, an additional, and under the circumstances a more frightful danger, stared the troops in the face. We were over two hundred miles from the terminus of the railroad over which our supplies were drawn, and a still greater distance from the main depots and supplies. It was found that the reserve of the stores at the post was well nigh exhausted, and the commanding officer reported that he knew of no fresh supplies being on the way. It is difficult to account for such a condition of affairs. Someone must surely have been the fault, but it is not important here to determine who or where the parties were. The officer commanding the troops in my absence reported officially to headquarters that the bulk of the provisions issued to his men consisted of rotten bacon and hard bread that was no better. Cholera made its appearance among the men, and deaths occurred daily. The same officer, in officially commenting upon the character of the provisions issued to his troops, added, The low state of vitality in the men resulting from the long confinement of this scanty and unwholesome food will, I think, account for the great mortality among the cholera cases. And I believe that unless we can obtain a more abundant and better supply of rations than we have had, it will be impossible to check this fearful epidemic. I decided to select upward of a hundred of the best mounted men in my command, and with this force open a way through Fort Harker, a distance of two hundred miles, where I expected to obtain abundant supplies, from which point the latter could be conducted, well protected against the Indians by my detachment back to Fort Wallace. Owing to the severe marching of the past few weeks, the horses of the command were generally in an unfit condition for further service without rest. So that after selecting upward of a hundred of the best and remaining might for the time be regarded as unserviceable, such they were in fact. There was no idea or probability that the portion of the command to remain in camp near Fort Wallace would be called upon to do anything but rest and recuperate for their late marches. It was certainly not expected that they would be molested or called out by the Indians, nor were they. Regarding the duties to be performed by the picked detachment as being by far the most important, I chose to accompany it. The immediate command of the detachment was given to Captain Hamilton, of whom mention had been previously made. He was assisted by two other officers. My intention was to push through from Fort Wallace to Fort Hayes, a distance of about 150 miles, as rapidly as was practicable, then, being beyond the most dangerous portion of the route, to make the remainder of the march to Fort Harker with half a dozen troopers, while Captain Hamilton, with his command, should follow leisurely. Under this arrangement, I hope to have a train loaded with supplies at Harker, and in readiness to start for Fort Wallace by the time Captain Hamilton should arrive. Leaving Fort Wallace about sunset on the evening of the 15th of July, we began our ride eastward, following the line of the overland stage route. At that date, the Kansas Pacific Railway was only completed as far westward as Fort Harker. Between Forts Wallace and Harker, we expected to find the stations of the Overland Stage Company at intervals of from 10 to 15 miles. In time of peace, these stations are generally occupied by a half a dozen employees of the route, embracing the stablemen and relays of drivers. 
They were well supplied with firearms and ammunition, and every facility for defending themselves against the Indians. The stables were also the quarters for the men. They were usually built of stone, and no one would naturally think that against Indians no better defense work would be required. Yet such was not the case. The hay and the other combustible materials usually contained in them enabled the savages, by shooting prepared arrows, to easily set them on fire, and thus drive the occupants out to the open plain, where their fate would soon be settled. To guard against such an emergency, each station was ordinarily provided with what on the plains is termed a dugout. The name implies the character and description of the work. The dugout was commonly located but a few yards from one of the corners of the stable, and was prepared by excavating the earth so as to form an opening not unlike a cellar, which was usually about four feet in depth and sufficiently roomy to accommodate at close quarters half a dozen persons. This opening was then covered with earth, and loopholed on all sides at a height of a few inches above the original level of the ground. The earth was thrown on the top until the dugout resembled an ordinary mound of earth, some four or five feet in height. To the outside observer, this means apparently were provided for egress or ingress, yet such was not the case. If the entrance had been made above ground, rendering it necessary for the defenders to pass from the stable unprotected to their citadel, the Indians would have posted themselves accordingly, and picked them off one by one as they should emerge from the stable. To provide against this danger, an underground passage was constructed in each case, leading from the dugout to the interior of the stable. With these arrangements for the defense, a few determined men could withstand the attacks of an entire tribe of savages. The recent depredations of the Indians had so demoralized the men at the various stations that many of the latter were found deserted, their former occupants having joined their forces with those of other stations. The Indians generally burned the deserted stations. Marching by night was found to be attended with some disadvantages. The men located at the stations which were still occupied, having no notice of our coming, and having seen no human beings for several days except the war parties of the savages who had attacked them from time to time, were in a chronic state of alarm, and held themselves in readiness for defense at a moment's notice. The consequence was that as we pursued our way in the stillness of the night, and we were not familiar with the location of the various stations, we generally rode into close proximity before discovering them. The station men, however, were generally on alert, and as they did not wait to challenge us or be challenged, but it took it for granted that we were Indians. Our first greeting would be a bullet whistling over our heads, sometimes followed by a perfect volley from a dugout. In such a case, nothing was left for us to do but to withdraw the column to a place of security, and then for one of our numbers to creep up stealthily in the darkness to a point within hailing distance. Even this was an undertaking attended by no little danger, as by this time the little garrison of the dugout would be thoroughly awake, and every man at his post, his finger on the trigger of his trusty rifle, and straining both eye and ear to discover the approach of the hateful redskins, who alone were believed to be the cause of all this ill-timed disturbance of their slumbers. Huddled together, as they necessarily would be in the contracted limits of their subterranean citadel, and all sounds from without being deadened and rendered indistinct by the heavy roof of earth and the few apertures leading to the inside, it is not strange that under the circumstances it would be difficult for the occupants to distinguish between the voice of an Indian and that of a white man. Such was, in fact, the case and no sooner would the officer sent forward for that purpose hail the little garrison and endeavor to explain who we were, than guided by the first sound of his voice, they would respond promptly with their rifles. In some instances we were in this manner put to considerable delay, 
and all this was at times most provoking, it was not a little amusing to hear the description given by the party sent forward of how closely he hugged the ground when endeavoring to establish friendly relations with the stage people. Finally, when successful and in conversation with the latter, we inquired why they did not recognize us from the fact that we hailed them in unbroken English, they replied that the Indians resorted to so many tricks that they had determined not to be caught, even by that one. They were somewhat justified in this idea, as we knew that among the Indians who were with them on the war path, there was at least one full-blooded who had been educated within the limits of civilization, graduated at a popular institution of learning, and only exchanged his civilized mode of dress for the paint, blanket, and feathers of savage life after he had reached the years of manhood. Almost at every station we received intelligence of Indians having been seen in the vicinity within a few days of our arrival. We felt satisfied that they were watching our movements, although we saw no fresh signs of Indians until we arrived near Downer's Station. Here, while stopping to rest our horses for a few minutes, a small party of our men, who had without authority halted some distance behind, came dashing into our midst and reported that twenty-five or thirty Indians had attacked them some five or six miles in the rear, and had killed two of their number. As there was a detachment of infantry guarding the station, and time being important, we pushed on toward our destination. The two men reported killed were left to be buried by the troops on duty at the station. Frequent halts and brief rests were made along our line of march, Occasionally we would halt long enough to indulge in a few hours' sleep. About three in the morning, on the morning of the 18th, we reached Fort Hayes, having marched about 150 miles in 55 hours, including all halts. Some may regard this as a rapid rate of marching. In fact, a few officers of the Army, who themselves have made many long marches, principally in ambulances and railroad cars, are of the same opinion. It was far above the usual rate of a leisurely made march, but during the same season, and with a larger command, I marched sixty miles in fifteen hours. This was officially reported, but occasioned no remark. During the war, and at the time of the enemy's cavalry under General J. E. B. Stewart, made its famous raid around the Army of the Potomac in Maryland, a portion of our cavalry, accompanied by horse artillery in attempting to overtake them, marched over ninety miles in twenty-four hours. A year subsequent to the events narrated in this chapter, I marched a small detachment eighty miles in seventeen hours, every horse accompanying the detachment completing the march in as a fresh condition apparently as when the march began. Leaving Hamilton and his command to rest one day at Hayes, and then to follow on leisurely to Fort Harker, I continued my ride to the latter post accompanied by Colonels Cook and Custer and two troopers. We reached Fort Harker at two o'clock that night, having made the ride in sixty miles without change of animals in less than twelve hours. As this was the first telegraph station, I immediately sent telegrams to headquarters and to Fort Sedgwick, announcing the fate of Kidder and his party. General A. J. Smith, who was in command of this military district, had his headquarters at Harker. I at once reported to him in person, and acquainted him with every incident worthy of mention, which had occurred in connection with my command since leaving him weeks before. Arrangements were made for the arrival of Hamilton's party, and for a train containing supplies to be sent back under their escort. Having made my report to General Smith as my next superior officer, and there being no occasion for my presence until the train and escort should be in readiness to return, I applied for and received authority to visit Fort Riley, about ninety miles east of Harker by rail, where my family was then located. No movements against Indians of any marked importance occurred in General Hancock's department during the remainder of this year. 
extensive preparations had been made to chastise the indians both in this department and in that of general augers on the north but about that date at which this narrative has arrived a determined struggle between the adherents of the indian ring and those advocating stringent measures against the hostile tribes resulted in the temporary ascendancy of the former owing to this ascendancy the military authorities were so hampered and restricted by instructions from washington as to be practically powerless to inaugurate or execute any decisive measures against the indians their orders requiring them to simply act on the defensive it may not be uninteresting to go back to the closing month of the preceding year the great event in indian affairs of that month and year was that fort phil kearney massacre which took place within a few miles of the fort bearing that name and in which a detachment of troops numbering in all ninety-four persons were slain and not one escaped or was spared to tell the tale the alleged grievance of the indians prompting them to this outbreak was the establishment by the government of a new road of travel to montana and the locating of military posts along this line they claimed that the building and use of this road would drive all the game out of their best hunting grounds when once war was determined upon by them it was conducted with astonishing energy and marked success between the twenty sixth of july and the twenty first of december of the same year the indians opposing the establishment of this new road were known to have killed ninety-one enlisted men five officers and fifty-eight citizens besides wounding twenty more and capturing and driving off several hundred head of valuable stock and during this period of less than six months they appeared before fort phil kearney in a hostile array of fifty-one separate occasions and attacked every train and individual attempting to pass over the montana road it has been stated officially that at the three posts established for the defense of the montana road there were the following reduced amounts of ammunition fort c f smith ten rounds per man fort phil kearney forty five rounds per man at fort reno thirty rounds per man and that there were but twelve officers on duty at the three posts many of the enlisted men of which were raw recruits the force being small and the amount of labor necessary in building new posts being very great but little opportunity could be had for drill or target practice the consequence was the troops were totally lacking in the necessary preparations to make a successful fight as the massacre at fort phil kearney was one of the most complete as well as terrible butcheries connected with our entire indian history some of the details as subsequently made evident are here given on the sixth of december the wood train was attacked by indians about two miles from the fort colonel fetterman with about fifty mounted men was sent to rescue the train he succeeded in this but only after a severe fight with the indians and after suffering a loss of one officer lieutenant bigham of the cavalry and one sergeant who were decoyed from the main body into an ambuscade this affair seemed to have given the indians great encouragement and induced them to form their plans for the extensive massacre which was to follow on the twenty first the wood train was again assailed and as before the party was sent out from the fort to its relief the relieving party consisted of infantry and cavalry principally the former numbering in all ninety-one men with three officers captain brown of the infantry lieutenant grumond of the cavalry and colonel fetterman of the infantry in command colonel fetterman sailed forth promptly with his command to the rescue of the train he moved out rapidly keeping to the right of the wood road for the purpose as is supposed of getting in the rear of the attacking party he had advanced across the piney and a few indians appeared on his front and flanks and kept showing themselves just above rifle range until they finally disappeared beyond lodge trail ridge when colonel fetterman reached the lodge trail ridge the picket signaled the fort that the indians had retreated and that the train had moved toward the timber 
About noon, Colonel Fetterman's command, having thrown out skirmishes, disappeared over the crest of Lodge Trail Ridge, firing at once commenced, and was heard distinctly at the fort. From a few scattering shots, it increased in rapidity until it became a continuous and rapid fire of musketry. A medical officer was sent from the post to join the detachment, but was unable to do so, Indians being encountered on the way. After the firing had become quite heavy, showing that a severe engagement was taking place, Colonel Carrington, the commander of the post, sent an officer and about 75 men to reinforce Colonel Fetterman's party. These reinforcements moved rapidly toward the point from which the sound of the firing proceeded. The firing continued to be heard during their advance, diminishing in rapidity and number of shots until they had reached a high summit overlooking the battlefield, when one or two shots closed all sound of conflict. From this summit, a full view could be obtained of the Pino Valley beyond, in which Fetterman's command was known to be, but not a single individual of this ill-fated band could be seen. Instead, however, the valley was seen to be overrun by Indians, estimated to number fully 3,000 warriors. Discovering the approach of the reinforcements, the Indians beckoned them to come on, but without awaiting their arrival commenced retreating. The troops then advanced to a point where the savages had been seen collecting in a circle, and there found the dead naked bodies of Colonel Fetterman, Captain Brown, and about sixty-five of their men. All of the bodies lay in a space not exceeding thirty-five feet in diameter. A few American horses lay dead nearby, all with their heads toward the fort. The spot was by the roadside, and beyond the summit of a hill rising to the east of the Pino Creek. The road after ascending this hill followed the ridge for nearly three-quarters of a mile, and then descended abruptly into the Pino Valley. About midway between the point where these bodies lay and that where the road begins to descend was the dead body of Lieutenant Grumman, and at the point where the road leaves the ridge to descend to the Pino Valley were the dead bodies of three citizens and a few of the old, long-tried and experienced soldiers. Around this little group were found a great number of empty cartridge shells. More than fifty were found near the body of a citizen who had used a Henry rifle, all going to show how stubbornly these men had fought, and that they had fought with telling effect on their enemies was evidenced by the fact that within a few hundred yards in front of their position, ten Indian ponies lay dead, and near them were sixty-five pools of dark and clotted blood. Among the records of the Indian Department in Washington, there is on file a report of one of the peace commissioners sent to investigate the circumstances of this frightful slaughter. Among the conclusions given in this report, it is stated that the Indians were massed to resist Colonel Fetterman's advance along Penal Creek on both sides of the road, that Colonel Fetterman formed his advance lines on the summit of the hill overlooking the creek and valley, with a reserve near where the large number of dead bodies lay. That the Indians, in large force, attacked him vigorously in this position, and were successfully resisted for a half an hour or more, that the command then being short of ammunition, and seized with a panic at this event, and the great numerical superiority of the Indians, attempted to retreat toward the fort, that the mountaineers and old soldiers who had learned that a movement from Indians in an engagement was equivalent to death remained in their first position and were killed there. That immediately upon the commencement of the retreat the Indians charged upon and surrounded the party, who could not now be formed by their officers, were immediately killed. Only six men of the whole command were killed by balls and Two of these, Colonel Fetterman and Captain Brown, no doubt inflicted this death upon themselves or each other by their own hands, for both were shot through the left temple, and powder was burnt into the skin and flesh upon the wound. These officers had asserted that they would never be taken alive by the Indians. The difficulty, as further explained by this commissioner, was that the officer commanding the Phil Kearney district was furnished no more troops for a state of war than had been provided for a state of profound peace. In regions where all was peace, 
as at laramie in november twelve companies were stationed while in regions where all was war as at phil kearney there were only five companies allowed the same criticism regarding the distribution of troops would be justified if applied to a much later date. The Indians invariably endeavored to conceal their exact losses, but they acknowledged afterwards to have suffered a loss of twelve killed on the field, sixty severely wounded, several of whom afterwards died, and many others permanently maimed. They also lost twelve horses killed outright, and fifty-six so badly wounded that they died within twenty-four hours. The intelligence of this massacre was received throughout the country with universal horror, and awakened a bitter feeling toward the savage perpetrators. The government was implored to inaugurate measures looking for their prompt punishment. This feeling seemed to be shared by all classes. The following dispatch sent by General Sherman to General Grant immediately upon receipt of the news of the massacre briefly but characteristically expresses the views of the lieutenant general of the army st louis december twenty eighth eighteen sixty six general just arrived in time to attend the funeral of my adjutant general sawyer i have given general instructions to general cook about the sioux i do not yet understand how the massacre of colonel fetterman's party could have been so complete we must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to their extermination, men, women, and children. Nothing less will reach the root of this cause. Signed, W. T. Sherman, Lieutenant General. The old trouble between the war and the interior departments as to which should retain control of the Indian question was renewed with increased vigor. The Army accused the Indian Department, and justly too, of furnishing the Indian arms and ammunition. Prominent exponents of either side of the question were now slow in taking upon their pens in advocacy of their respected views. In the succeeding chapter, testimony will be offered from those high in authority, now the highest, showing that among those who had given the subject the most thoughtful attention, the opinion was unanimous in favor of the abolition of the civil Indian agents and licensed traders, and of the transfer of the Indian Bureau from the Interior Department back to the War Department where it originally belonged. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 10, Part 1 of My Life on the Plains this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The winter of 1867 through 68 was a period of comparative idleness and quiet, so far as the troops guarding the military posts on the plains and frontier were concerned. The Indians began their periodical depredations against the frontier settlers and overland immigrants and travelers early in the spring of 1868 and continued them with but little interruption or hindrance from any quarter until late in the summer and fall of that year general sully an officer of considerable reputation as an indian fighter was placed in command of the district of the upper arkansas which embraced the kansas frontier and those military posts on the central plains most intimately connected with the hostile tribes general sully concentrated a portion of the troops of his command consisting of detachments of the seventh and tenth cavalry and third infantry at points on the arkansas river and set on foot various scouting expeditions but all to no purpose the indians continued as usual not only to elude the military forces directed at them but to keep up their depredations upon the settlers of the frontier Great excitement existed along the border settlements of Kansas and Colorado. The frequent massacres of the frontiersmen and utter destruction of their homes created a very bitter feeling on the part of the citizens of Kansas towards the savages, and from the governor of the state down to its humblest citizen, appeals were made to the authorities of the general government to give protection against the Indians or else allow the people to take the matter into their own hands 
and pursue retaliatory measures against the hereditary enemies. General Sheridan, then in command of that military department with headquarters at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, were fully alive to the responsibilities of his position, and in his usual effective manner set about organizing victory. As pretended but not disinterested friends of the Indians frequently acquit the latter of committing unprovoked attacks on helpless settlers and others who have never in the slightest degree injured them, and often deny even that the Indians have been guilty of any hostile acts which justify the adoption of military measures to ensure the protection and safety of our frontier settlements, the following tabular statement is here given. This statement is taken from official records on file at the Headquarters Military Division of the Missouri, and, as it states, gives only those murders and other depredations which were officially reported, and the white people mentioned as killed are exclusive of those slain in warfare. I am particular in giving time, place, etc., of each occurrence, so that those who hitherto have been believed that the Indians were a creature who could do no wrong may have ample opportunity to judge of the correctness of my statements. Many other murders by the Indians during this period no doubt occurred, but occurring as they did over a wide and sparsely settled tract of country were never reported to the military authorities. The mass of troops being concentrated and employed along the branches of the upper Arkansas by General Sully, thus leaving the valleys of the Republican Solomon and Smoky Hill Rivers comparatively without troops, and the valleys of the upper Republican being, as we have in previous chapters learned, a favorite resort and camping ground for the hostile tribes of the upper plains, General Sherman determined that, while devoting full attention to the Kiowas, Comanches, Apaches, Arapahoes, and Southern Cheyennes to be found south of the Arkansas, he would also keep an eye out for the Sioux, Upper Cheyennes and Arapahoes, and the Dog Soldiers, usually infesting the valley of the Upper Republican and Solomon Rivers. The Dog Soldiers were a band of warriors principally composed of Cheyennes, but made up of turbulent and uncontrollable spirits of all the tribes. Neither they nor their leaders had ever consented to the ratification of any of the treaties to which their brothers of the other tribes had agreed. Never satisfied, except when at war with the white man, they were by far the most troublesome, daring, and warlike band to be found on the plains. Their warriors were all fine-looking braves of magnificent physique, and in appearance and demeanor more nearly conformed to the ideal warrior than those of any other tribe. How they came by their name, the dog soldiers, I never was able to learn satisfactorily. One explanation is that they are principally members of the Cheyenne tribe, and were at first known as the Cheyenne soldiers. The name of the tribe Cheyenne was originally Chain, the French word for dog, hence the term dog soldiers. To operate effectually against these bands, General Sheridan was without the necessary troops. Congress, however, had authorized the employment of detachments of frontier scouts to be recruited from among the daring spirits always to be met with on the border. It was upon a force raised from this class of our western population that General Sheridan relied for material assistance. Having decided to employ frontiersmen to assist in punishing the Indians, the next question was the selection of a suitable leader. The choice, most fortunately, fell upon General George A. Forsyth, Sandy, then Acting Inspector General of the Department of Missouri, who, eager to render his country an important service, and not loath to share in the danger and excitement attended upon such an enterprise, set himself energetically to work and raise the equipment for his command in the field. But little time was required under Forsyth's stirring zeal to raise the required number of men. It was wisely decided to limit the number of frontiersmen to fifty. This enabled Forsyth to choose only good men 
and the size of the attachment, considering that they were to move without ordinary transportation, in fact were to almost adopt the Indian style of warfare, was as large as could be without being cumbersome. Last but not least, it was to be composed of men who, from their leader down, were intent on accomplishing an important purpose. They were not out of any holiday tour or pleasure excursion. Their object was to find Indians, a difficult matter for a large force to accomplish, because the Indians are the first to discover their presence and take themselves out of the way. Whereas with a small or moderate-sized detachment, there is some chance, as Forsyth afterwards learned, of finding Indians. Among all officers of the army, old or young, no one could have been found better adapted to becoming the leader of an independent expedition such as this was proposed to be than General Forsyth. This is more particularly true considering the experiences which awaited this detachment i had learned to know him very well when we rode together in the shenandoah valley sometimes in one direction and sometimes but rarely in the other and afterwards in the closing struggle around petersburg and richmond when his chief had been told to press things general forsyth sandy as his comrades familiarly termed him was an important member of the press in fact, one of the best terms to describe him by is irrepressible, for, no matter how defeat or disaster might stare us in the face, and as I have intimated caused us to ride the other way, Sandy always contrived to be of good cheer, and to be able to see things coming of a better day. This quality came into good play in the terrible encounter which I am about to describe. The frontiersmen of the Kansas border, stirred up by numerous massacres committed in their midst by the savages, were only too eager and willing to join in an enterprise which promised to afford them the opportunity to visit just punishment upon their enemies. Thirty selected men were procured at Fort Harker, Kansas, and twenty more at Fort Hayes, sixty miles further west. In four days the command was armed, mounted, and equipped, and at once took the field. Lieutenant F. H. Beecher, of the 3rd Regular Infantry, a nephew of the distinguished divine of the same name, and one of the ablest and best young officers on the frontier, was second in command, and a surgeon was found in the person of Dr. John S. Movers of Hayes City in kansas a most competent man in his profession and one who had a large experience during the war of the rebellion as a surgeon of one of the volunteer regiments from the state of new york sharp grover one of the best guides and scouts the plains afforded was the guide of the expedition while many of the men had at different times served in the regular and volunteer forces for example the man selected to perform the duties of first sergeant of the detachment was Brevet Brigadier General W. H. H. McCall, United States Volunteers, who commanded a brigade at the time of the Confederate forces attempted to break the Federal lines at Fort Hell in front of Petersburg in the early spring of 1865, and was breveted for gallantry on that occasion. As a general thing, the men composing the party were just the class eminently qualified to encounter the dangers which were soon to confront them. They were brave, active, hardy, and energetic, and while they required a tight rein held over them, when they were properly handled, capable of accomplishing about all that any equal number of men could do under the same circumstances. The party left Fort Hayes on the 29th day of August, 1868, and under special instruction from Major General Sheridan, commanding the department, took a northwesterly course, scouting the country to the north of the Saline River, crossing the South Fork of the Solomon, Bow Creek, North Fork of the Solomon, Prairie Dog Creek, and then well out toward the Republican River, and swinging around in the direction of Fort Wallace, made that post on the eighth day from their departure. 
Nothing was met with notice, but there were frequent indications of large camps of Indians, which had evidently been abandoned only a few days or weeks before the arrival of the command. Upon arriving at Fort Wallace, General Forsyth communicated with General Sheridan and proceeded to refit his command. On the morning of September 10th, a war party, small, Indians attacked a train near Sheridan, a small railroad town some eighty miles beyond Fort Wallace, killed two teamsters, and ran off a few cattle. As soon as the information of this reached Fort Wallace, Fourth Sight started his command for the town of Sheridan, where he took the trail of the Indians and followed it until dark. The next morning it was resumed, till the Indians, finding themselves closely pursued, scattered in many directions, and the trail became so obscure as to be lost. Determined, however, to find the Indians this time, if they were in the country, he pushed on to Short Nose Creek, hoping to find them in that vicinity. Carefully scouting in every direction for the trail, and still heading north as far as the Republican River, the command finally struck the trail of a small war party on the south bank of that stream, and followed it up to the forks of that river. This is familiar ground, perhaps, to some of my readers, as it was here Pawnee Killer and his band attacked our camp early one morning in the summer of 67, and hurried me from my tent without attending me time to attend to my toilet. Continuing on the trail and crossing to the north bank, Forsyth found the trail growing consistently larger, as various smaller ones entered it from the south and north, and finally it developed into a broad and well-beaten road, along which large droves of cattle and horses had been driven. This trail led up to the Arikache Fork of the Republican River, and consistent indications of Indians in the way of moccasins, jerked buffalo meat, and other articles were found every few miles, but no Indians were seen. On the evening of the eighth day from Fort Wallace, the command halted, about five o'clock in the afternoon and went into camp at or near the little island in the river a mere sand spit of earth formed by the stream dividing as a little rift of earth that was rather more gravelly than the sand in its immediate vicinity and coming together again about a hundred yards further down the stream which just here was about eight feet wide and two and three inches deep the watercourses in this part of the country in the dry season are mere threads of water meandering along the broad sandy bed of the river, which during the months of May and June is generally full to its banks, and that time capable of floating an ordinary ship, while later in the season there is not enough water to float the smallest rowboat. In fact, in many places the stream sinks into the sand and disappears for a considerable distance finally making its way up to the surface and flowing on again until it disappears and reappears many times in the course of a long day's journey. In camping upon the bank of the stream at this point, which at that time was supposed by the party to be Delaware Creek, but which was afterwards discovered to be a rickety fork of the Republican River, the command made the usual preparations for passing the night. This point was but a few marches from the scene of Kidder's massacre, having already been out from Fort Wallace eight days and not taking any wagons with them. Their supplies began to run low, although they had been husbanded with great care. During the last three days, game had been very scarce, which fact convinced Forsyth and his party that the Indians whose trail they had been following had scourged the land and country and driven off every kind of game by their hunting parties. The following day would see the command out of supplies of all kinds, but feeling assured that he was within striking distance of the Indians, Forsyth determined to push on until he found them and fight them, even if he could not whip them, in order that they might realize that their rendezvous was discovered and that the government was at last in earnest when it said that they were to be punished for their depredations on the settlements. After posting their pickets and partaking of the plainest suppers, Forsyth's little party disposed of themselves on the ground to sleep, little dreaming who was to sound their reveille in so unceremonious a manner. 
At dawn on the following day, September 17, 1868, a guard gave the alarm, Indians. Instantly every man sprang to his feet, and with the true instinct of the frontiersman, grabbed his rifle with one hand, while with the other he seized his lariat, that the Indians might not stampede the horses. Six Indians dashed up towards the party, rattling bells, shaking buffalo robes, and firing their guns. The four pack mules belonging to the party broke away and were last seen galloping over the hills. Three other animals made their escape, as they had only been hobbled in direct violation of the orders which directed that all animals of the command should be regularly picketed to a stake or picket pinned firmly into the ground. A few shots caused the Indians to shear off and disappear in a gallop over the hills. Several of the men started in pursuit, but were instantly ordered to rejoin the command, which was ordered to saddle up with all possible haste. Foresight feeling satisfied that the attempt to stampede the stock was but the prelude to a general and more determined attack. Scarcely were the saddles thrown on the horses and the girths tightened, when Grover, the guide placing his hand on Foresight's shoulder, gave vent to his astonishment as follows. Oh, heavens, General, look at the Indians. Well might he be excited. From every direction they dashed towards the band, over the hills from the west and the north, along the river on the opposite bank, everywhere and in every direction they made their appearance. Finally mounted in full war paint, their long scalp lock braided with eagle feathers, and with all the paraphernalia of a barbarous war party, with wild whoops and exultant shouts, on they came. There was but one thing to do. Realizing that they had fallen into a trap, Forsyth, who had faced danger too often to hesitate in an emergency, determined that if he came to a Fort Fetterman affair, described in a preceding chapter, he should at least make the enemy bear their share of the loss. He ordered his men to lead their horses to the island, tie them to the few bushes that were growing there in a circle, throw themselves upon the ground in the same form, and make the best fight they could for their lives. In less time than it takes to pen these words, the order was put into execution. Three of the best shots in the party took position in the grass under the bank of the river, which covered the north end of the island. The others formed in a circle inside of the line of animals, and throwing themselves upon the ground began to reply to the fire, of which the Indians, which soon became hot and galling in the extreme. Throwing themselves from their horses, the Indians crawled up to within a short distance of the island and opened a steady and well-directed fire upon the party. Armed with the best quality of guns, many of them having the latest pattern breech loaders with fixed ammunition, as proof of this, many thousand empty shells of Spencer and Henry rifle ammunition were found on the ground occupied by the Indians after the fight. They soon made sad havoc among the men and horses. As it grew lighter and the Indians could be distinguished, Grover expressed the greatest astonishment at the number of warriors which he placed at nearly one thousand. Other members of the party estimated them at an even greater number. Forsyth expressed the opinion that there could be not more than four or five hundred, but in this it seems he was mistaken, and some of the Brules, Sioux, and Cheyennes have since told him that their war party was nearly nine hundred strong, and was comprised of Brules, Sioux, Cheyennes, and dog soldiers, Furthermore, that they had been watching him for five days previous to their attack, and had called in all the warriors they could get to their assistance. The men of Forsyth's party began covering themselves at once by using case and pocket knives in the gravelly sand, and soon had thrown up quite a little earthwork consisting of detached mounds in the form of a circle. About this time Forsyth was wounded by a mini-ball, which, striking him in the right thigh, raged upwards, inflicting an exceedingly painful wound. Two of his men had been killed, and a number others wounded. Leaning over to give directions to some of his men who were fighting too rapidly, and in fact becoming a little too nervous for their own good, Forsyth was again wounded, this time in the left leg, 
the ball breaking and badly shattering the bone midway between the knee and ankle. About the same time, Dr. Movers, the surgeon of the party, who, owing to the hot fire of the Indians, was unable to render surgical aid to his wounded comrades, had seized his trusty rifle and was doing capital service, was hit in the temple by a bullet, and never spoke but one intelligible word again. Matters were now becoming desperate, and nothing but cool, steady fighting would avail to mend them. The hills surrounding the immediate vicinity of the fight were filled with women and children who were chanting war songs and filling the air with whoops and yells. The medicine men, a sort of high priests, and older warriors rode around the outside of the combatants, being careful to keep out of range, and encouraged their young braves by beating a drum, shouting Indian chants, and using derisive words toward their adversaries, whom they cursed roundly for skulking like wolves, and dared to come out and fight like men. Meanwhile, the scouts were slowly but surely counting game, and more than one Indian fell to the rear badly wounded by the rifles of the frontiersmen. Within an hour after opening of the fight, the Indians were fairly frothing at the mouth with rage at the unexpected resistance they met, while the scouts had now settled down to earnest work and obeyed to the letter the orders of Forsyth, who off reiterated command was, Fire slowly, aim well, keep yourselves covered, and above all, don't throw away a single cartridge. Taken all in all, with very few exceptions, the men behaved superbly, obedient every word of command, cool, plucky, determined, and fully realizing the character of their foes. They were a match for their enemies thus far at every point. About nine o'clock in the morning, the last horse belonging to the scouts was killed, and one of the redskins was heard to exclaim in tolerably good English, There goes the last damned horse anyhow, a proof that some of the savages had at some time been intimate with the whites. Shortly after nine o'clock, a portion of the Indians began to form in a ravine just below the foot of the island, and soon about one hundred and twenty dog soldiers, the banditti of the plains, supported by some three hundred or more other mounted men, made their appearance, drawn up just beyond rifle shot below the island, and headed by the famous chief Roman Nose, prepared to charge the scouts. Superbly mounted, almost naked, although in full war dress, and painted in the most hideous a manner, with their rifles in their hands, and formed with a front of about sixty men, they awaited the signal of their chief to charge, with apparently the greatest confidence. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 10, Part 2 of My Life on the Plains this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Roman Nose addressed a few words to the mounted warriors, and almost immediately afterward the dismounted Indians surrounding the island poured a perfect shower of bullets into the midst of Forsyth's little party. Realizing that a crisis was at hand and hot work was before him, Forsyth told his men to reload every rifle, and to take and load the rifles of the killed and wounded of the party, and not to fire a shot until he ordered to do so. A few moments, the galling fire of the Indians rendered it impossible for any of the scouts to raise or expose any part of their person. This was precisely the effect which the Indians desired to produce by the fire of their riflemen. It was this that the mounted warriors under the leadership of Roman Nose were waiting for. The Indians had planned their assault in a manner very similar to that usually adopted by civilized troops in assailing a fortified place. The fire of the Indian riflemen performed the part of the artillery on such occasions in silencing the fire of the besieged and preparing the way for the assaulting column. Seeing that the little garrison was stunned by the heavy fire of the dismounted Indians, 
and rightly judging that now, if ever, was the proper time to charge them, Roman Nose and his band of mounted warriors, with a wild ringing war whoop echoed by the women and children on the hills, started forward. On they came, presenting even to the brave men awaiting the charge a most superb sight. Brandishing their guns, echoing back the cries of encouragement of their women and children on the surrounding hills, and confident of victory, they rode bravely and recklessly into the assault. Soon they were within the range of the rifles of their friends, and of course the dismounted Indians had to slacken their fire for fear of hitting their own warriors. This was the opportunity for the scouts, and they were not slow to seize it. Now, shouted Forsyth, now, echoed Beecher, McCall, and Grover, and the scouts springing to their knees and casting their eyes coolly along the barrels of their rifles, opened on the advancing savages as deadly a fire as the same number of men ever yet sent forth from an equal number of rifles. Unchecked, undaunted, on dashed the warriors, steadily rang the clear, sharp reports of the rifles of the frontiersmen. Roman Nose, the chief, is seen to fall dead from his horse, then Medicine Man is killed, and for an instant the column of braves, now within ten feet of the scouts, hesitates falters. A ringing cheer from the scouts perceived the effect of their well-directed fire, and the Indians began to break and scatter in every direction, unwilling to rush to a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the men who, although outnumbered, yet knew how to make such effective use of their rifles. A few more shots from the frontiersmen and the Indians are forced back beyond range, and their first attack ends in defeat. Forsyth turns to Grover anxiously and inquires, Can they do better than that, Grover? I've been on the plains, General, since I was a boy, and never saw such a charge as that before. I think they have done their level best, was the reply. All right, responds Sandy. Then we are good for them. So close did the advance warriors of the attacking column come in the charge that several of their dead bodies now lay within a few feet of the entrenchments. The scouts had also suffered a heavy loss in this attack. The greatest and most irreparable was that of Lieutenant Beecher, who was mortally wounded and died at sunset of that day. He was one of the most reliable and efficient officers doing duty on the plains, modest, energetic, and ambitious in his profession. Had he lived, undoubtedly would have had a brilliant future before him and had opportunities such as it is offered by a great war as ever occurred, Lieutenant Beecher would have without a doubt achieved great distinction. The Indians still kept up a continuous fire from their dismounted warriors, but as the scouts by this time were well covered by their miniature earthworks, it did little execution. At two o'clock in the afternoon the savages again attempted to carry the island by a mounted charge and again at sunset but having been deprived of their best and most fearless leader by the fall of roman nose they were not so daring or impulsive as in the first charge and were both times repulsed with heavy losses at dark they ceased firing and withdrew their forces for the night this gave the little garrison on the island an opportunity to take a breathing spell and foresight to review the situation and sum up how he had fared the result was not consoling his trusted lieutenant beecher was lying dead by his side his surgeon movers was mortally wounded two of his men killed four mortally wounded four severely and ten slightly here out of a total of fifty-one were twenty-three killed and wounded his own condition his right thigh fearfully lacerated and his left leg badly broken only rendered the other discouraging circumstances doubly so. As before stated, the Indians had killed all of his horses early in the fight. His supplies were exhausted, and there was no way of dressing the wounds of himself or comrades, as the medical stores had been captured by the Indians. He was about 110 miles from the nearest post, and the savages were all around him. The outlook could scarcely have been less cheering, but Forsyth's disposition and pluck incline him to speculate more upon that which is, or may be gained, 
than to repine at that which is irrevocably lost. This predominant trait in his character now came into good play. Instead of wasting time in vain regrets over the advantages gained by his enemies, he quietly set about looking upon the chances in his favor, and let the subject be what it may, I will match Sandy against any equal number for making a favorable showing of the side which he exposes and advocates. To his credit account, he congratulated himself and comrades first upon the fact that they had beaten off their foes, second, water could be had inside their entrenchments by digging a few feet below the surface, then for food, horse and mule meat. To use Sandy's expression, was lying around loose in any quantity, and last but most important of all, he had plenty of ammunition. Upon these circumstances and facts, Forsyth built high hopes of successfully contending against any renewed assault of the savages. Two men, Trudeau and Stillwell, both good scouts and familiar with the plains, were selected to endeavor to make their way through the cordon of Indians and proceed to Fort Wallace, 110 miles distant, and report the condition of Forsyth and party and act as guides to the troops, which would be at once sent to the relief of the besieged scouts. It was a perilous mission, and called for the display of intrepid, daring, cool judgment, and unflinching resolution, besides a thorough knowledge of the country, as much of their journey would necessarily be made during the darkness of night to avoid discovery by wandering bands of Indians who no doubt would be on the alert to intercept just a party going for relief. Forsyth's selection of the two men named was a judicious one. Stillwell, I afterwards knew well, having employed him as a scout with my command for a long period, and the time referred to, however, he was a mere beardless boy of perhaps nineteen years, possessing a trim, lithe figure which was set off to great advantage by the jaunty suit of buckskin which he wore, cut and fringed according to the true style of the frontiersman. In his waist belt he carried a large size revolver and hunting knife. These, with his rifle, constituted his equipment. A capital shot, whether afoot or on horseback, and a perfect horseman, this beardless boy on more than one occasion proved himself a dangerous foe to the wily red man. We shall not take final leave of Stillwell in this chapter. These two men, Trudeau and Stillwell, after receiving Forsyth's instructions in regards to their dangerous errand, and being provided with his compass and map, started as soon as it was sufficiently dark on their long, weary tramp over a wild desert country thickly infested with deadly enemies after their departure the wounded were brought in the dead animals unsaddled and the horse blankets used to make the wounded as comfortable as possible the earthworks were strengthened by using the dead animals and saddles a well was dug inside the entrenchments and large quantities of horse and mule meat were cut up and buried in the sand to prevent it from putrefying it began to rain, and the wounded were rendered less feverish by their involuntary but welcome bath. As it was expected, the night passed without incident or disturbance from the savages, but early the next morning the fight was renewed by the Indians, again surrounding the island as before, and opening fire from the rifles of their dismounted warriors. They did not attempt to charge the island as they had done the previous day, when their attempts in this direction had cost them too dearly. But they were none the less determined and eager to overpower the little band which had been the cause of such heavy loss to them already. The scouts, thanks to their efforts during the night, were now well protected, and suffered but little from the fire of the Indians, while the latter, being more exposed, paid the penalty whenever affording the scouts a chance with their rifles. The day was spent without any decided demonstration on the part of the red man, except to keep up as constant a fire as possible on the scouts, and to endeavor to provoke the latter to reply as often as possible, the object, no doubt, being to induce the frontiersmen to exhaust their supply of ammunition. But they were not to be led into this trap. 
Each cartridge they estimated as worth to them one Indian, and nothing less would satisfy them. On the night of the 18th, two more men were selected to proceed to Fort Wallace, as it was not known whether Trudeau and Stidwell had made their way safely through the Indian lines or not. The last two selected, however, failed to elude the watchful eye of the Indians, and were driven back to the island. This placed a gloomy look on the probable fate of Trudeau and Stilwell, and left the little garrison in anxious doubt, not only as to the safety of the two daring messengers, but as to their own final relief. On the morning of the 19th, the Indians promptly renewed the conflict, but with less energy than before. They evidently did not desire or intend to come too close to the quarters again with their less numerous but more determined antagonists, but aimed on at the previous day to provoke harmless fire from the scouts, and then, after exhausting their ammunition in this manner, overwhelm them in mass by numbers and finish them with tomahawks and scalping knives. This style of tactics did not operate as desired, but there is little doubt that some of the Indians who had participated in the massacre of Fetterman and his party a few months before, when the three officers and ninety-one men were killed outright, were also present and took part in the attack upon Forsyth and his party, and they must have been not a little surprised to witness the stubborn defiance offered by this little party, which even at the beginning numbered but little over fifty men. About noon, the women and children who had been constant and excited spectators of the fight from the neighboring hilltops began to withdraw. It is rare indeed that in an attack by Indians their women and children are seen. They are usually sent to a place of safety until the result of the contest is known. But in this instance, with the overwhelming numbers of savages and the recollection of the massacre of Fetterman and his party, there seemed that the Indians to be but one result expected, and that a complete, perhaps bloodless victory for them, and the women and children were permitted to gather as witness of their triumph, and perhaps at the close would be allowed to take part by torturing those of the white men who should be taken alive. The withdrawal of the women and children regarded as a favorable sign by the scouts. Soon after, and as a last resort, the Indians endeavored to hold the parley with foresight by means of a white flag. But this device was too shallow and of too common adoption to attract the frontiersmen, the object simply being to accomplish by stratagem and perfidy what they had failed in by superior numbers and open warfare. Everything now seemed to indicate that the Indians had enough of the fight, and during the night of the third day, it was plainly evident that they had about decided to withdraw from the contest. Forsyth now wrote the following dispatch, and after nightfall, confident it is to be two of his best men, Donovan and Plyley, and they, notwithstanding the discouraging result of the last attempt, set out to try and get through to Fort Wallace with it, which they successfully accomplished. On Delaware Creek, Republican River, September 19th, 1868. To Colonel Bankhead, or Commanding Officer, Fort Wallace. I sent you two messengers on the night of the 17th, instant informing you of my critical condition. I tried to send two more last night, but they did not succeed in passing the Indian pickets and returned. If the others have not arrived, then hasten at once to my assistance. I have eight badly wounded and ten slightly wounded men to take in, and every animal I had was killed save seven, which the Indians stampeded. Lieutenant Beecher is dead, and acting assistant Surgeon Movers probably cannot live the night out. He was hit in the head Thursday, and has spoken but one rational word since. I am wounded in two places in the right thigh and my left leg broken below the knee. The Cheyenne numbered 450 or more. Mr. Grover says they never fought so before. They were splendidly armed with Spencer and Henry rifles. We killed at least 35 of them and wounded many more, besides killing and wounding a quantity of their stock. They carried off most of their kill during the night, but three of their men fell into our hands. I am on a little island and have still plenty of ammunition left. We are living on mule and horse meat and are entirely out of rations. 
If it was not for so many wounded, I would come in and take the chances of whipping them if attacked. They are evidently sick of their bargain. I had two of the members of my company killed on the 17th, namely William Wilson and George W. Colner. You had better start with not less than 75 men and bring all the wagons and ambulances you can spare. Bring a six-pound howitzer with you. I can hold out here for six days longer if absolutely necessary, but please lose no time. Very respectively, your obedient servant, George A. Forsyth, U.S. Army, Commanding Company, Scouts. P.S. My surgeon, having been mortally wounded, none of my wounded have had their wounds dressed yet, so please bring out a surgeon with you. A small party of warriors remained in the vicinity, watching the movements of the scouts. The main body, however, had departed. The well men, relieved of the constant watching and fighting, were now able to give some attention to the wounded. Their injuries, which had grown very painful, were rudely dressed. Soup was made out of horse flesh, and shelters were constructed, protecting them from the heat, damp, and wind. On the sixth day, the wounds of the men began to exhibit more decided and alarming signs of neglect. Maggots infested them, and the first traces of gangrene had set in. To multiply the discomforts of the situation, the entire party was almost overpowered by the intolerable stench created by the decomposing bodies of the dead horses. Their supply was nearly exhausted. Under these trying circumstances, Forsyth assembled his men. He told them they knew their situation as well as he. There were those who were helpless, but aid must not be expected too soon. It might be difficult for the messengers to reach the fort, or there might be some delay by their losing their way. Those who wished to go should do so, and leave the rest to take their chances. With one voice they resolved to stay, and if all hope vanished, they die together. At last the supply of jerked horse meat was exhausted, and the chances of getting more were gone. By this time the carcasses of the animals were a mass of corruption. There was no alternative. Strips of putrid flesh were cut and eaten. The effect of this offensive diet was nauseating in the extreme. An experiment was made with a view of improving the unpalatable flesh, using gunpowder as salt, but to no purpose. The men allayed only their extreme cravings of hunger, trusting that supper might reach them before all was over. On the morning of September 25th, the sun rose on Forsyth and his famished party with unusual splendor, and the bright colors of the morning horizon seemed like a rainbow of promise to their weary, longing spirits. Hope, grown faint with long waiting, gathered renewed strength from the brightness of nature. The solitary plain receding in all directions possessed a deeper interest than ever before, though it still showed no signs of life, and presented the same monotonous expanse upon which the heroic band had gazed for so long and many trying days. Across the dim and indefinable distance which swept in all directions, the eye often wandered, and wondered what might be the revelations of the next moment. Suddenly, several dark figures appeared faintly on the horizon. The objects were moving. The question uppermost in the minds of all was, are they savages or messengers of relief? As on such occasions of anxiety and suspense, time wore heavily. Minutes seemed like hours. Yet each moment brought the sufferers nearer the realization, whether this was their doom or their escape therefrom. Over an hour had elapsed since the objects first came in sight, and yet the mystery remained unsolved. Slowly but surely they developed themselves until finally they approached sufficiently near for their characters, friends, or foes to be unmistakably established. To the joy of the weary watchers, the parties approaching proved to be troops. Relief was at hand. The dangers and anxieties of the past few days were ended, and death either by starvation or torture at the hands of the savages 
no longer stared them in the face. The strong set up a shout such as men seldom utter. It was the unburdening of the heart, of the weight of despair. The wounded lifted their fevered forms and fixed their glaring eyes upon the now rapidly approaching succor, and in their delirium involuntarily but feebly reiterated the acclamations of their comrades. The troops arriving for the relief were a detachment from Fort Wallace, under the command of Colonel Carpenter of the regular cavalry, and had started from the fort promptly upon the arrival of Trudeau and Stillwell, with intelligence of the condition and peril in which Forsyth and his party were. When Colonel Carpenter and his men reached the island, they found its defenders in a most pitiable condition. Yet the survivors were determined to be plucky to the last. Forsyth himself, with rather indifferent success, affected to be reading an old novel that he had discovered in a saddlebag. But Colonel Carpenter said his voice was a little unsteady, and his eyes somewhat dim, when he held out his hand to Carpenter and bade him a welcome to Beecher's Island, a name that has since been given to the battleground. During the fight, Forsyth counted thirty-two dead Indians within rifle range of the island, Twelve Indian bodies were subsequently discovered in one pit and five in another. The Indians themselves confessed to loss of about seventy-five killed in action, and when their proclivity for concealing or diminishing the number of their slain in battle is considered, we can readily believe that their actual loss in the fight must have been much greater than they would have had us believe. Of the scouts... Lieutenant Beecher, Surgeon Movers, and six of the men were either killed outright or died of their wounds. Eight more were disabled for life. Of the remaining twelve who were wounded, nearly all recovered completely. During the fight, innumerable interesting incidents occurred, some laughable and some serious. On the first day of the conflict, a number of young Indian boys from fifteen to eighteen years of age crawled up and shot about fifty arrows into the circle in which the scouts lay. One of these arrows struck one of the men, Frank Harrington, full in the forehead. Not being able to pull it out, one of his companions lying in the same hole with him cut off the arrow with his knife, leaving the iron arrowhead sticking from his frontal bone. In a moment a bullet struck him in the side of the head, glancing across his forehead, impinged upon the arrowhead, and the two fastened together fell to the ground. A queer but successful piece of amateur surgery. Harrington wrapped a cloth around his head, which bled profusely, and continued fighting as if nothing had happened. Howard Morton, another of the scouts, was struck in the head by a bullet, which finally lodged in the rear of one of his eyes, completely destroying its sight forever. But Morton never faltered but fought bravely until the savages finally withdrew. Hudson Farley, a young stripling of only eighteen, whose father was mortally wounded in the first day's fight, was shot through the shoulder, yet never mentioned the fact until dark, when the list of wounded was called for. McCall, the first sergeant, Villette, Clark, Farley, the elder, and others who were wounded, continued to bear their full share of the fight, notwithstanding their great sufferings, until the Indians finally gave up and withdrew. These incidents, of which many similar ones might be told, only go to show how remarkable character of the men who composed Forsyth's party. Considering this engagement in all its details and with all its attendant circumstances, remembering that Forsyth's party, including himself, numbered all but fifty-one men, and that the Indians numbered about seventeen to one, this fight was one of the most remarkable, and at the same time successful contests in which our forces on the plains have ever been engaged. And the whole affair, from the moment of the first shot, was fired until the beleaguered party was finally relieved by Colonel Carpenter's command, was wonderfully an exhibition of daring courage, stubborn bravery, and heroic endurance, under circumstances of greatest peril and exposure. In all probability, there will never occur in our future hostilities with the savage tribes of the West a struggle 
the equal of that in which we were engaged the heroic men who defended so bravely beecher's island forsyth the gallant leader after a long period of suffering and leading the life of an invalid for nearly two years finally recovered from the effects of his severe wounds and is now i am happy to say as good as new contently awaiting the next war to give him renewed excitement end of chapter ten part two This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 11, Part 1 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The winter of 1867 through 68 found me comfortably quartered at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, on the banks of the Missouri. A considerable portion of my regiment had been ordered to locate at that post in the fall and make that their winter quarters. General Sheridan, then commanding the military department, had also established his headquarters there, so that the post became more than ever the favorite military station in the West. I had not been on duty with my regiment since my rapid ride from Fort Wallace to Fort Harker in July, nor was I destined to serve with it in the field for some time to come. This, at a time, seemed a great deprivation for me, but subsequent events proved most conclusively that it was for all the best, and the result could not have been to me more satisfactory than it was, showing as it did that the best laid plans of mice and men, etc. But I am anticipating those who have read the tabulated list of depredations committed by the indians as given in the article describing general forsyth's desperate fight on the arikache fork may have noticed the name of william comstock in the column of killed comstock was a favorite and best-known scout on the central plains frequent reference has been made to him in preceding numbers particularly in the description of the attack of the indians on the detachment commanded by robbins and cook strange as it may seem when his thorough knowledge of the indian character is considered he fell victim to their treachery and barbarity the indians were encamped with their village not far from big spring station in western kansas and were professedly at peace still no one familiar with the deceit and bad faith invariably practiced by the indians when free to follow the bent of their inclinations ought to have thought of trusting themselves in their power yet comstock with all his previous knowledge and experience did that which he would certainly have disapproved in others he left the camp of the troops which was but a few miles from the indian village and with but a single companion rode to the latter and spent several hours in friendly conversation with the chiefs nothing occurred during their visit to excite suspicion the indians assumed a most peaceable bearing toward them and were profuse in their demonstration of friendship when the time came for comstock and his comrade to take their departure they were urged by the indians to remain and spend the night in the village the invitation was declined and after the usual salutations the two white men mounted their horses and set out to return to their camp comstock always carried in his belt a beautiful white-handled revolver and wore it on this occasion this had often attracted the covetous eyes of savages and while in the village propositions to barter for it had been made by more than one of the warriors comstock invariably refused all offers to exchange it no matter how tempting once before when riding together at the head of the column in pursuit of indians comstock who had observed that i carried a revolver closely resembling his remarked that i ought to have the pair and then laughingly added that he would carry his until we found the indians and after giving them a sound whipping he would present me with the revolver Frequently during the campaign, when on the march and while sitting around the evening campfire, Comstock would refer to his promise concerning the revolver. 
after hunting Indians all summer, but never finding them, just when we desired them, Comstock was not infrequently joked upon the condition under which he was to part with his revolver, and fears were expressed that if he carried it until we caught and whipped the Indians, he might be forced to go armed for a long time. None of us imagined then that the revolver, which was so often the subject of jest, and of which Comstock was so proud, would be the pretext for his massacre. Comstock and his companion rode out of the village in the direction of their own camp, totally unconscious of coming danger, and least of all from these whose guests they had just been. They had proceeded about a mile from the village when they observed about a dozen of the young warriors galloping after them. Still suspecting no unfriendly design, they continued their ride until joined by the young warriors. The entire party then rode in company until, as was afterward apparent, the Indians succeeded in separating the two white men, the one riding in front, the other Comstock following in the rear, each with Indians riding on either side of them. At a preconcerted signal, a combined attack was made by the savages upon the two white men. Both the latter attempted to defend themselves, but the odds and the suddenness of the attack deprived them of all hope of saving their lives. Comstock was fatally wounded at the first onslaught, and soon after was shot from his horse. His companion, being finally mounted, wisely entrusted his life to the speed of his horse, and soon outstripped his pursuers and reached camp, but with a few slight wounds. The Indians did not seem disposed to press him as closely as their usual custom, but seemed only anxious to secure Comstock. He, after falling to the ground severely wounded, was completely riddled by steel-pointed arrows and his scalp taken. The principal trophy, however, in the opinion of the savages, was a beautifully finished revolver with its white ivory handle, and, as they afterward confessed when peace was proclaimed with their tribe, it was to obtain this revolver that the party of young warriors left the village and followed Comstock to his death. Thoroughly reliable in his reports, brave, modest, and preserving in character, with a remarkable knowledge of the country and the savage tribes infesting it, he was the superior of all men who were scouts by profession with whom I have had any experience. While sitting in my quarters one day at Fort Leavenworth late in the fall of 1867, a gentleman was announced whose name recalled a sad and harrowing sight. It proved to be the father of Lieutenant Kidder, whose massacre with that of his entire party of eleven men was described in preceding pages. It will be remembered that the savages had hacked, mangled, and burned the bodies of Kidder and his men to such an extent that it was impossible to recognize the body of a single one of the party, even the clothing had been removed so that we could not distinguish the officer from his men or the men from each other by any fragment of their uniform or insignia of their grade. Mr. Kidder, after introducing himself, announced the object of his visit. It was to ascertain the spot where the remains of his son lay buried, and after procuring suitable military escort to proceed to the grave and disinter his son's remains, preparatory to transferring them to a resting place in Dakota, of which territory he was at that time one of the judiciary. It was a painful task I had to perform when I communicated to the father the details of the killing of his son and followers, and equally harassing to the feelings was it to have to inform him that there were no possible chances of his being able to recognize his son's remains. Was there not the faintest mark or fragment of his uniform by which he might be known? inquired the anxious parent. Not one was the reluctant reply. And yet since I still recall the appearance of the mangled and disfigured remains, there was a mere trifle which attracted my attention, but it could not have been your son who wore it. What was it? eagerly inquired his father. It was simply the collar band of one of those ordinary check overshirts so commonly worn on the plains, the color being black and white, the remainder of the garment, as well as all other articles of the dress, 
having been torn or burned from the body. Mr. Kidder then requested me to repeat the description of the collar and material of which it was made. Happily, I had some cloth of similar appearance, and upon exhibiting this to Mr. Kidder, to show the kind I meant, he declared that the body I referred to could be no other than that of his murdered son. He went on to tell us how his son had received his appointment in the army, but a few weeks before his lamentable death, he only having reported for duty with his company a few days before being sent out on the scout which terminated his life, and how before leaving home to engage in the military service, his mother, with that thoughtful care and tenderness which only a mother can feel, prepared some articles of wearing apparel, among others a few shirts made from the checkered material already described. Mr. Kidder had been to Fort Sedgwick on the Platte, from which post his son had last departed, and there learned that on leaving the post he wore one of the checkered shirts, and put an extra one in his saddle pockets. Upon this trittling link of evidence, Mr. Kidder proceeded four hundred miles west to Fort Wallace, and there, furnished with military escort, visited the grave containing the bodies of the twelve massacred men. Upon disinterring the remains, a body was found as I had described it, bearing the simple checked collar band. The father recognized the remains of his son, and thus, as was stated at the close of a preceding chapter, was the evidence of a mother's love that made the means by which her son's body was recognized and reclaimed when all others had failed. The winter and spring of 1868 were uneventful, so far as Indian hostilities or the movements of troops were concerned. To be on the ground when its services could be made available in the case of Indians becoming troublesome, the 7th Cavalry left its winter quarters at Fort Leavenworth in April, and marched 290 miles west to a point near the present site of Fort Hayes, where the troops established their summer rendezvous in camp. It not being my privilege to serve with the regiment at that time, I remained at Fort Leavenworth some time longer, and later in the summer repaired to my home in Michigan. There, amid the society of friends, to enjoy the cool breezes of the Erie, until the time came which would require me to go west. In the meantime, until I can relate some of the scenes which were enacted under my own eye, and which were afterwards the subject of excited and angry comment, as well as emphatic and authoritative approval, it will not be uninteresting to examine into some of the cases which led to the memorial winter campaign of 1868-69, to including the Battle of the Washita, and the reader may also be enabled to judge as to what causes the people of the frontier are most indebted for the comparatively peaceful condition of the savage tribes of the plains during the past three years. The question may also arise as to what influence the wild nomadic tribes of the West are most likely to yield and become peaceable, inclined toward their white neighbors, willing to forego their accustomed raids and attacks upon the frontier settlements, and content to no longer oppose the advance of civilization. Whether this desirable condition of affairs can be permanently at best secured by the display and exercise of strong but just military power, or by the extension of the olive branch, or one hand and government annuities on the other, or by a happy combination of both, has long been one of the difficult problems whose solution was baffled the judgment of our legislators from the formation of the government to the present time. My firm conviction, based upon an intimate and thoroughly analysis of the habits, traits, and characters, and natural instinct of the Indian, and strengthened and supported by the almost unanimous opinion of all persons who have made the Indian problem a study, and have studied it not from a distance but in immediate contact with all the facts bearing thereupon, it is that the Indian cannot be elevated to the great level where he can be induced to adopt any policy or mode of life varying from those to which he has ever been accustomed, by any method of teaching, argument, reasoning, or coaxing, which is not preceded and followed closely in reserve by a superior physical force. 
In other words, the Indian is capable of recognizing no controlling influence but that of stern, arbitrary power. To assume that he can be guided by appeals to his ideas of moral right and wrong, independent of threatening or final compulsion, is to place him far above his more civilized brothers of the white race, who, in the most advanced stage of refinement and morality, still find it necessary to employ force, sometimes resort to war, to exact justice from a neighboring nation. And yet there are those who will argue that the Indian, with all his lack of moral privileges, is so superior to the white race as to be capable of being controlled by his savage traits and customs and induced to lead a proper life, simply by being politely requested to do so. The campaign of 1868 through 69 under the direction of General Sherman, who had entire command of the country infested by five troublesome and warlike tribes, the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches, was fruitful in variable results. At the same time, the opponents of a war policy raised the cry that the military were making war on friendly Indians. One writer, an Indian agent, even asserted that the troops had attacked and killed Indians half-civilized, who have fought on the side of the government during the war with the Confederate States. It was claimed by the adherents of the Peace Party that the Indians above had been guilty of no depredations against the whites and have done nothing deserving of the exercise of military power. I believe it is a rule and evidence that a party coming into court is not expected to impeach his own witness. I propose to show by the official statement of the officers of the Indian Department, including some of those who were loudest and most determined in their assertions of the innocence of the Indians after prompt punishment had been administered by the military, that the Indian tribes whose names have been given were individually and collectively guilty of unprovoked and barbarous assaults on the settlers of the frontier, that they committed these depredations at the very time they were receiving arms and other presents from the government, and that no provocation had been offered either by the government or the defenseless citizens of the border. In other words, by those advocating the Indian side of the dispute, it will be clearly established that a solemn treaty had been reluctantly entered into between the Indians and the government, by which the demands of the Indians were complied with, and the conditions embraced in the treaty afterwards faithfully carried out on the part of the government, and that the very time that the leading chiefs and old men of the tribes were pledging themselves and their people that they will not attack any persons at home or traveling, or disturb any property belonging to the people of the United States, or to persons friendly there within, and that they will never capture or carry off from the settlements women or children, and they will never kill or scalp white men or attempt to do them harm. The young men and warriors of these same tribes embrace the sons of the most prominent chiefs and signers of the treaty, who are actually engaged in devastating the settlements on the Kansas frontier, murdering men, women, and children, and driving off stock. Now to the evidence. First, glance at the following brief summary of the terms of the treaty which was ratified between the government and the Cheyennes and Arapahoes on the 19th of August, 1868, and signed and agreed to by all the chiefs of these tribes known or claiming to be prominent and men of influence among their own people. As the terms of the treaty are almost identical with those contained in most of the treaties made with other tribes, excepting the limits and location of reservations, it will be interesting for purpose of reference. First, peace and friendship shall forever continue. Second, whites or Indians committing wrongs will be punished according to the law. Third, the following district of country to wit, commencing at the point where the Arkansas River crosses the 37th parallel of north latitude, thence west on said parallel, then said line being the southern boundary of the state of Kansas, to the Cimarron River, 
sometimes called the Red Fork of the Arkansas River, thence down said Cimarron River in the middle of the main channel thereof, to the Arkansas River, thence up the Arkansas River in the middle of the main channel thereof, to the place of beginning, is set apart for the Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians. Fourth, the said Indians shall have the right to hunt on the unoccupied lands of the United States, so long as game may be found thereon, and so long as peace subsists among the whites and Indians on the border of the hunting districts. Fifth, is a provision for the selection and occupation of lands for those of said Indians who desire to commence farming on said reserve, and for expenditures for their benefit. Sixth, the United States further provides an additional distribution of clothing for a term of years. The treaty with the Kiowas, Comanche, and Apache tribes ratified August 25, 1868, embrace substantially the same provisions as those just quoted, excepting that relating to their reservation, which was as follows. Commencing at a point where the Washita River crosses the 98th meridian west from Greenwich, thence upon the Washita River in the middle of the main channel, thereof to a point 30 miles west of Fort Cobb, as now established, thence due west to the north folk of the Red River, providing said line strikes said river east of the 100th meridian of the west longitude, if not, then only to said meridian line, and then south on said meridian line to the said north fork of the Red River, thence down said north fork, in the middle of the main channel thereof, from the point where it may be first intersected by the lines above described, to the main Red River, thence down said river in the main channel thereof, to its intersection with the 98th meridian of longitude west of Greenwich, thence north on said meridian line to the place of the beginning. To those who propose to follow the movements of the troops during the winter campaign of 1868 through 69, it will be well to bear in mind the limits of the last name reservation, as the charge was made by the Indian agents, that the military had attacked the Indians where the latter were peacefully located within the limits of their reservation. To show that the government thought its civil agents were doing everything required of it to satisfy the Indians, and that the agent of the Cheyennes and Arapahoes was firmly of the opinion that every promise of the government had not only been faithfully carried out, but that the Indians themselves had no complaint to make, the following letter from the agent to the superintendent of Indian Affairs is submitted. Fort Larn, Kansas, August 10, 1868. Sir, I have the honor to inform you that I yesterday made the whole issue of annuity goods, arms, and ammunition to the Cheyenne chiefs, the Arapahoes and the Apaches had received their portions in July, and people of their nation, they were delighted at receiving the goods, particularly the arms and ammunition, and never before have I known them to be better satisfied and express themselves as being so well contented previous to the issue. I made them a long speech following your late instruction with reference to what I said to them. They have now left for their hunting grounds, and I am perfectly satisfied that there will be no trouble with them this season and consequently with no Indians of my agency. I have the honor to be, with much respect, your obedient service, E. W. Winecoop, United States Indian Agent, Honorable Thomas Murphy, Superintendent, Indian Affairs. The italics are mine, but I desire to invite attention to the confidence and strong reliance placed in these Indians by a man who was intimately associated with them, interested in their welfare and supposed to be able to speak authoritatively as to their character and intentions. If they could deceive him, it is not surprising that other equally well-meaning persons further east should be equally misled. The above letter is dated August 10, 1868. The following extract is from a letter written by the same party and to the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, dated at the same place on the 10th of September, 1868, exactly one month after his positive declaration that the Cheyennes were perfectly satisfied and there will be no trouble with them this season. 
Here is the extract referred to. Subsequently, I received permission from the department to issue them their arms and ammunition, which I accordingly did. But a short time before the issue was made, a war party had started north from Cheyenne Village on the war path against the Pawnees, and they, not knowing of the issue, and smarting under their supposed wrongs committed by the outrages on the Saline River, which have led to the present unfortunate aspect of affairs. The United States troops are now south of the Arkansas River in hot pursuit of the Cheyennes, an effect of which I think will be to plunge other tribes into difficulty and finally culminate in a general Indian war. It will be observed that no justification is offered for the guilty Indians, except that they had been aware of the wise and beneficial intention of the government to issue them a fresh supply of arms. They might have delayed their murderous raids against the defenseless settlers until after the issue. Fears are also expressed that other tribes may be plunged into difficulty, but by the same witness and others it is easily established that the other tribes referred to were represented prominently in the war party which had devastated the settlements on the Saline. First, I will submit an extract of a letter dated Fort Larn, August 1, 1968, from Thomas Murphy, Superintendent of Indian Affairs, and to the Honorable N. G. Taylor, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Washington, D.C. Sir, I have the honor to inform you that I held a council today with the Arapahoes and Apache Indians, at which I explained to them why their arms and ammunition had been withheld, that the white settlers were now well armed and determined that no more raids should be made through their country by large bodies of Indians, and that while whites were friendly and well disposed towards the Indians, yet if the Indians attempted another raid such as they recently made on the Kaw Reservation, I feared themselves and the whites would have a fight, and they'd bring on war. The head chief of the Arapahoes, Little Raven, replied that no more trips would be made by his people into the settlements, that their hearts were good toward the whites, and they wished to remain at peace with them. I told them I would now give them their arms and ammunition, that I hoped they would use them for the sole purpose of securing food for themselves and families and that in no case would I ever hear of their using these arms against their white brethren. Little Raven and the other chiefs then promised that these arms should never be used against the whites, and Agent Winecop then delivered the Arapahoes 100 pistols, 80 Lancaster rifles, 20 kegs of powder, one and a half kegs of lead, and 15,000 caps, and to the Apaches he gave 40 pistols, 20 Lancaster rifles, 3 kegs of powder, and one half keg of lead and five thousand caps, for which they seemed much pleased. I would have remained here to see the Cheyennes, did I deem it important to do so. From what I can learn, there will be no trouble whatsoever with them. They will come here, get their ammunition, and leave immediately to hunt buffalo. They are well and peacefully disposed toward the whites, and unless some unlooked-for event should transpire to change their present feelings, they will keep their treaty pledges. This certainly reads well, and at Washington or further east would be regarded as a favorable indication of the desire for peace on the part of the Indians. The reader is asked to remember that the foregoing letters and extracts are from professed friends of the Indian and advocates of what is known as the peace policy. The letter of Superintendent Murphy was written the day of Council, August 1. Mark his words of advice to Little Raven as to how the arms were to be used, and note Little Raven's reply containing his strong promises of maintaining friendly relations with the whites. Yet, the second night following the issue of the arms, a combined war party of Cheyennes and Arapahoes, numbering over 200 warriors, almost the exact number of pistols issued at the council, left the Indian village to inaugurate a bloody raid in the Kansas settlement and among the Arapahoes was the son of Little Raven. By reading the speech made by this chief in the council referred to by Mr. Murphy, a marked resemblance will be detected to the stereotype responses delivered by Indian chiefs visiting the authorities of Washington, 
or when imposed upon the credulous and kind-hearted people who assemble at Cooper Institute periodically to listen to these untutored orators of the plains. The statements and promises uttered in one instance are fully and reliable as those listened to so breathlessly in the others. Regarding the raid made by the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes, it will be considered sufficient, perhaps, when I base my statement upon the following. Report of an interview between Colonel E. W. Weinkopp, United States Indian agent, and the Little Rock, a Cheyenne chief, held at Fort Larne, Kansas, August 19, 1868, in the presence of Lieutenant S. M. Robbins, 7th United States Cavalry, John S. Smith, United States Interpreter, and James Morrison, Scout for Indian Agency. Questioned by Colonel Weinkopp, Six nights ago, I spoke to you in a regard to the depredations committed on the saline. I told you to go and find out by whom these depredations were committed, and to bring me straight news. What news do you bring? Little Rock. I took your advice and went there. I am now here to tell all I know. This war party of Cheyennes, which left the camp of these tribes above the forks of the Walnut Creek about the 2nd or 3rd of August, went out against the Pawnees, crossed the Smoky Hill about Fort Hayes, and thence proceeded to the Saline, where there were ten lodges of Sioux in the Cheyenne camp when this war party left, and about twenty men of them, and four Arapahoes accompanied the party. End of chapter 11, part 1
the troops immediately charged the indians and the pursuit was continued a long time the indians having the two children their horses becoming fatigued dropped the children without hurting them soon after the children were dropped the pursuit ceased but the indians continued up on the saline a portion of the indians afterwards returned to look for the children but they were unable to find them after they had proceeded some distance up the saline the party divided the majority going north towards the settlements on the solomon but thirty of them started toward their village supposed to be some distance northwest of fort larned another small party returned to black kettle village from which party i got this information i am fearful that before this time the party that started north had committed a great many depredations questioned by colonel winecoop do you know the names of the principal men of this party that committed the depredations besides white antelope's brother answer by little rock there were medicine arrow's oldest son named tall wolf red nose who was one of the men who outraged the woman Big Head's son named Porcupine Bear and Sandhill's brother, known as the Bear that Goes Ahead. Question by Colonel Winecoop. You told me the nations want peace. Will you, in accordance with your treaty stipulations, deliver up the men whom you have named as being the leaders of the party who committed the outrages named? Answer by Little Rock. I think that the only men who ought to suffer and be responsible for these outrages are White Antelope's brother and Red Nose, the men who ravished the woman. And when I return to the Cheyenne camp to assemble the chiefs and head men, I think those two men will be delivered upon you. Question by Colonel Winecoop. I consider the whole party guilty, but it being impossible to punish all of them, I hold the principal men whom you mentioned responsible for all. They had no right to be led and governed by two men. If no depredations had been committed after the outrage on the woman, the two men whom you had mentioned alone would have been guilty. Answer by Little Rock. After your explanation, I think you demand for the men is right. I am willing to deliver them up and will go back to the tribe and use my best endeavors to have them surrendered. I am but one man, and cannot answer for the entire nation. Other questions and answers of similar import followed. The terms of the interview between Colonel Winecoop and Little Rock were carefully noted down and transmitted regularly to his next superior officer, Superintendent Murphy, who, but a few days previous, and within the same month, had officially reported to the Indian Commissioner at Washington that peace and good will will reign undisturbed between the indians under his charge and the whites even he with a strong leaning towards the adoption of morbid measures of a peaceful character and his disinclination to believe the indians could meditate evil towards their white neighbors was forced as his next letter shows to alter his views of the superintendent indian affairs atchison kansas August twenty second, eighteen sixty eight. Sir, I have the honor herewith to transmit a letter of the nineteenth instituted from Agent Winecoop, enclosing report of a talk which he had with Little Rock, a Cheyenne chief, whom he had sent to ascertain the facts relative to the recent troubles on the Solomon and Saline rivers in this state. The agent's letter and report are full and explain themselves. I fully concur in the views expressed by the agent that the innocent Indians who are trying to keep in good faith their treaty pledges be protected in the manner indicated by him, while I earnestly recommended that the Indians who have committed these gross outrages be turned over to the military and that they be severely punished. When I reflect that at the very time these Indians were making such loud professions of friendship at Larned, receiving their annuities, and so on, they were then contemplating and planning this campaign, I can no longer have confidence in what they say or promise. War is surely upon us, and in view of the importance of the case, I earnestly recommend that Agent Winecoop be furnished promptly with the views of the Department, and the full instructions be given him for his 
further action very respectfully your obedient servant thomas murphy superintendent indian affairs hon c e mix acting commissioner of indian affairs washington d c what were the recommendations of agent winecoop referred to in mr murphy's letter they were as follows let me take those indians whom i know to be guiltless and desirous of remaining at peace and locate them with their lodges and families at some good place that i may select in the vicinity of this post larned and let these indians be entirely subsisted by the government until this trouble is over and be kept within certain bounds and let me be furnished with a small battalion of united states troops for the purpose of protecting them from their own people and from being forced by them into war let those who refuse to respond to my call and come within the bounds prescribed be considered at war and let them be properly punished by this means if war takes place which i consider inevitable we can be able to discriminate between those who deserve punishment and those who do not otherwise it will be a matter of impossibility this proposition seems from its wording to be not only a feasible one but based on the principles of justice to all concerned and no doubt would be so interpreted by the theorizers of the indian question who study its merits from afar before acting upon colonel winecoop's plan it was in the regular order referred to general sherman at that time commanding the military division of the missouri in which the indians referred to were located his endorsement in reply briefly disposed of the proposition by exposing its absurdity headquarters military division of the missouri st louis missouri september nineteenth eighteen sixty eight i now regard the cheyennes and arapahoes at war and that it will be impossible for our troops to discriminate between the well-disposed and the warlike parts of these bands unless an absolute separation be made i prefer that the agents collect all of the former and conduct them to their reservation within the indian territory south of the kansas there to be provided for under the supervision say about old fort cobb i cannot consent to their being collected and held near fort larned so long as agent winecoop remains at fort larned the vagabond part of the indians will cluster around him for support and beg of the military the vital part of these tribes are committing murders and robberies from kansas to colorado and it is an excess of generosity on our part to be feeding and supplying the old young and feeble while their young men are at war i do not pretend to say what should be done with these but it will simplify our game of war already complicated enough by removing them well away from our field of operations i have the honor to be your obedient servant w t sherman lieutenant general commanding again on the twenty sixth of the same month general sherman in a letter to general schofield and the secretary of war writes the annuity goods for these indians kiowas comanches should be sent to fort cobb and the indian agent for these indians should go there at once and if the secretary of the interior has any contingent fun out of which he could provide food or if he could use as a part of the regular appropriation for food instead of clothing it may keep these indians from joining the hostile cheyennes and arapahoes the latter should receive nothing and now that they are at war i propose to give them enough of it to satisfy them to their heart's content and general sheridan will not relax until his efforts till the winter will put them at our mercy he reports that he can already account for about seventy dead indians and his forces are right in among these hostile indians on the upper republican and on the head of the canadian south of fort dodge still another letter from general sherman to the secretary of war argues the case as follows all cheyennes and arapahoes are now at war admitting that some of them have not done acts of murder rape and so on still they have not restrained those who have nor have they on demand given up the criminals as they agreed to do 
The treaty made at Medicine Lodge is therefore already broken by them, and the War Department should ask the concurrence of the Indian Department or invoke the superior orders of the President against any goods whatsoever, even clothing, going to any part of the tribes named until this matter is settled. As military commander, I have the right, unless restrained by superior orders, to prevent the issue of any goods whatsoever to Indians outside of these reservations, and if the agency for the Cheyennes and Arapahoes be established at or near Fort Cobb, the agent should, if possible, be able to provide for and feed such as may go there for their own volition, or who may be driven there by our military movements. I have dispatched General Hazen to the frontier with a limited amount of money wherewith to aid the said agents to provide for the peaceful parts of those tribes this winter, while en route to and after their arrival at their new homes. No better time could be possibly chosen than the present for destroying or humiliating those bands that have so outrageously violated their treaties and begun a devastating war without one particle of provocation, and after a reasonable time given for the innocent to withdraw. I will solicit an order from the President declaring all Indians who remain outside of their lawful reservations to be outlaws, and commanding all people, soldiers, and citizens to proceed against them as such. We have never heretofore been in a condition to adopt this course, because until now we could not clearly point out to these Indians where they may rightfully go to escape the consequences of hostile acts of their fellows. The right to hunt buffaloes secured by the treaties could also be regulated so as to require all parties desiring to hunt to procure from the agent a permit, which permit should be endorsed by the commanding officer of the nearest military post. But I think this treaty, having been clearly violated by the Indians themselves, this hunting right is entirely lost to them, if we so declare it. The foregoing extracts from the letter and official correspondence which passes between high dignitaries of the government, who were supposed to not only be thoroughly conversant with the Indian affairs, but to represent the civil and military phase of the question, will, when read in connection with the statements of the superintendent and agents of the Indians, and that the chief Little Rock gave the reader some idea of the origin and character of the difficulties between the whites and Indians in the summer and fall of 1868, tabulated list of depredations by the Indians accompanying the chapter description of General Forsythe's campaign, will give more extended information in a condensed form. While Forsythe was moving his detachment of scouts through the valleys of the Republican in the northwestern portion of Kansas, General Sheridan had also arranged to have a well-equipped force operating south of the Arkansas River, and in this way to cause the two favorite haunts of the Indians to be overrun simultaneously, and thus prevent them, when driven from one haunt, from fleeing in safety and unmolested to another. The expedition, intended to operate south of the Arkansas, was comprised of the principal portion of the 7th Cavalry and a few companies of the 3rd Regular Infantry, the entire force under the command of Brigadier General Alfred Sully, an officer of long experience among the Indians, and one who had in times gone by achieved no little distinction as an Indian fighter, and at a later date became a partial advocate of the adoption of the peace policy. General Sully's expedition, after being thoroughly equipped and supplied, under his personal supervision, with everything needed in a campaign such as what was to be undertaken, crossed the Arkansas River about the first of September at Fort Dodge, and, marching a little west of south, struck the Cimarron River, where they first encountered Indians. From Cimarron, the troops moved in a southeasterly direction, one day's march to Beaver Creek, the savages opposing and fighting them during the entire day. That night, the Indians came close enough to fire into the camp, an unusual proceeding in Indian warfare, as they rarely molest troops during the hours of night. 
The next day General Sully directed his march down the valley of the Beaver. But just as his troops were breaking camp, the long wagon train having already pulled out, and the rear guard of the troops having barely got into their saddles, a party of between two and three hundred warriors, who had evidently in some inexplicable manner contrived to conceal their approach until the proper moment, dashed into the deserted camp within a few yards of the rear of the troops, and succeeded in cutting off a few led horses and two cavalrymen, who, as is so often the case, had lingered a moment behind the column. General Sully and staff were at that moment near the head of the column a mile or more from camp. The general, as was his custom on the march, being comfortably stowed away in his ambulance. Of course it was impossible that he or his staff, from their great distance from the scene of the actual attack, could give the necessary orders in the case. Fortunately, the acting adjutant of the cavalry, Brevet Captain A. E. Smith, was riding at the rear of the column and witnessed the attack of the Indians. Captain Hamilton of the cavalry was also present in command of the rear guard. Wheeling his guard to the right about, he once prepared to charge the Indians and to attempt to rescue the two troopers who were being carried off as prisoners before his very eyes. At the same time, Captain Smith, as representative of the commanding officer of the cavalry, promptly took the responsibility of directing a squadron of cavalry to wheel out of column and advance in support of Captain Hamilton's guard. With this hastily formed detachment, the Indians, still within pistol range but moving off with their prisoners, were gallantly charged and so closely pressed that they were forced to relinquish possession of one of their prisoners, but not before shooting him through the body and leaving him on the ground, as they supposed mortally wounded. The troops continued to charge the retreating Indians, upon whom they were gaining, determined if possible, to effect the rescue of their remaining comrade. They were advancing down one slope while the Indians just across the ravine were endeavoring to escape with their prisoner up the opposite ascent, when a peremptory order reached the officers commanding the pursuing forces to withdraw their men and reform the column at once. Delaying only long enough for an ambulance to arrive from the train in which to transport their wounded comrade, the order was obeyed. Upon rejoining the column, the two officers named were summoned before the officer commanding their regiment, and after a second-hand reprimand, were ordered in arrest and their sabers taken from them, for leaving the column without orders. The attempted and half-successful rescue of their comrades and the repulse of the Indians to the contrary notwithstanding. Fortunately, wiser and better nature counsels prevailed in a few hours, and the regimental commander was authorized to release the two officers from their brief durance. Their sabers were restored to them, and they became, as deserved, the recipients of numerous complimentary expressions from their brother officers. The terrific fate awaiting the unfortunate trooper carried off by the Indians spread a deep gloom throughout the command. All were too familiar with the horrid customs of the savages to hope for a moment that the captive would be reserved for aught but a slow, lingering death from torture, the most horrible and painful which savage, bloodthirsty minds could suggest. Such was, in truth, his sad fate, as we learned afterwards when peace was established with the tribes, then engaged in war. Never shall I forget the consummate coolness and particularity of detail with which some of the Indians engaged in the affair related to myself and party, the exact process by which the captured trooper was tortured to death, how he was tied to a stake, strips of flesh cut from his body, arms and legs, burning brands thrust into the bleeding wounds, the nose, lips and ears cut off, and finally, when the loss of blood, excessive pain and anguish, the poor, bleeding, almost senseless mortal fell to the ground exhausted. Younger Indians were permitted to rush in and dispatch him with their knives. The expedition proceeded on down the valley of Beaver Creek, the Indians contesting every step of the way. In the afternoon, about three o'clock, the troops arrived at the ridge of the Sand Hills, a few miles southeast of the present site of Camp Supply, where quite a determined engagement took place with the savages, 
the three tribes, Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Kiowas, being the assailants. The Indians seemed to have reserved their strongest efforts until the troops and train had advanced well into the sand hills, when a most obstinate and well-coordinated resistance was offered to further advancement of the troops. It was evident to many of the officers, and no doubt to the men, that the troops were probably nearing the location of the Indian villages, and that this last display of opposition to their further advance was to save the villages. The character of the country immediately about the troops was not favorable to the operations of a cavalry. The surface of the rolling plain was cut up by irregular and closely located sand hills, too steep and sandy to allow the cavalry to move with freedom, yet capable of being easily cleared of savages by troops fighting on foot. The Indians took post on the hilltops and began harassing fire on the troops and train. Had the infantry been unloaded from the wagons promptly, instead of adding to the great weight and sinking the wheels sometimes almost to the axles, and had they, with the assistance of a few of the dismounted cavalry, been deployed on both sides of the train, the latter could have been safely conducted, though what was then decided to be impassable sand hills, but which were a short time afterward provided to be perfectly practicable and once beyond the range of the sand hills but a short distance the village of the attacking warriors would have been found exposed to an easy and important capture probably terminating the campaign by compelling a satisfactory peace captain yates with his single troop of cavalry was ordered forward to drive the indians away this was a proceeding which did not seem to meet with favor from the savages Captain Yates could drive them whenever he encountered them, but it was only to cause the redskins to appear in increased numbers at some other threatened point. After contending in this non-effective manner for a couple of hours, the impression arose in the minds of some that the train could not be conducted through the sand hills in the face of the strong opposition offered by the Indians. The order was issued to turn about and withdraw, this order was executed, and the troops and train followed by the exultant Indians retired a few miles to the beaver and encamped for the night on the ground now known as Camp Supply. Captain Yates had caused to be brought off the field when his troop was ordered to retire the body of one of his men who had been slain in the fight by the Indians. As the troops were to continue their backward movement next day, it was impossible to transport the dead body further. Captain Yates ordered the preparations made for entering the camp that night. But knowing that the Indians would thoroughly search the deserted campground almost before the troops should get out of sight, and would be quick with their watchful eyes to detect a grave, and if successful in discovering it, would unearth the body in order to obtain the scalp, directions were given to prepare the grave after nightfall and the spot selected would have baffled the eye of any one but that of an Indian. The grave was dug under the picket line, to which the seventy or eighty horses of the troops would be tethered during the night, so that their constant tramping and pawing could be completely covered up and obliterate all traces of the grave containing the body of the dead trooper. The following morning, even those who had performed the sad rites of burial to their fallen comrade could scarcely have been able to indicate the exact location of the grave. Yet, when we returned to that point a few weeks afterward, it was discovered that the wily savages had found the grave, unearthed the body, and removed the scalp of their victim on the day following the internment. Early on the morning succeeding the fight in the sand hills, General Sully resumed his march toward Fort Dodge, Indians followed and harassing the movements of the troops until about two o'clock in the afternoon, when apparently satisfied with their success in forcing the expedition back, thus relieving their villages and themselves from the danger which had threatened them, they fired their parting shots and rode off in triumph. That night, the troops camped on the Bluff Creek from which point General Sully proceeded to Fort Dodge on the Arkansas, leaving the main portion of the command in camp on Bluff Creek where we shall see them again.
End of chapter 11, part 2. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 12 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In a late chapter, I promised to submit testimony from those high in authority, now the highest, showing that among those who had given the subject a most thoughtful attention, the opinion was unanimous in favor of the abolition of the civil Indian agents and licensed traders, and the transfer of the Indian Bureau back to the War Department where it originally belonged. The question as to which cabinet minister, the Secretary of War or the Secretary of the Interior, should retain control of the Bureau regulating Indian affairs, has long been and is still one of unending discussion and is far more important to the country than the casual observer might imagine. The Army as a unit, and from the motives of peace and justice, favors giving this control to the Secretary of War. Opposed to this view is a large, powerful, and at times unscrupulous party, many of whose strongest adherents are dependent upon the fraudulent practices and profits of which the Indian is the victim for the acquirement of dishonest wealth. Practices and profits which only exist so long as the Indian Bureau is under the supervision of the Interior Department. The reasons in favor of the War Department having the control of the government of the Indians exists at all times. But the struggle for the control seems to make its appearance like an epidemic at certain periods and for a brief time. It will attract considerable comment and discussion both in and out of Congress, then disappear from public view. To a candid, impartial mind, I believe the reasons why the Indians should be controlled by the Department of War, the department which must assume the reins of power when any real control is exercised, are convincing. It may be asked, then why, if the reasons are so convincing, are not proper representations made to the authorities at Washington and the transfer secured. This inquiry seems natural enough, but the explanation is sufficiently simple. The Army officers, particularly those stationed on the frontier, have but little opportunity, even had they the desire, to submit their views or recommendations to Congress as a body or to members individually. When impressed with ideas whose adoption is deemed essential to the government, the usual and recognized mode of presenting them for consideration is by written communications forwarded through the immediate and superior commanders, until laid before the Secretary of War, by whom, if considered sufficiently important, they are submitted to the President and by him to Congress. Having made this recommendation and furnished the department with his reasons, therefore, an officer considers that he has discharged his duty in the premises and responsibility of the adoption or rejection of his ideas then rests with a superior power. Beyond the conscientious discharge of his duty, he has no interest, certainly none of a pecuniary nature, to serve. In the periodical contests which prevail between the military and the civil aspirants for the control of the Indian Bureau, the military contexts themselves, as above stated, with a brief and unbiased presentation of their views, and having submitted their argument to the proper tribunal, no further steps are taken to influence the decision. Not so with those advocating the claims of the civil agents and traitors to public recognition, the preponderance of testimony and the best of the argument rest with the military. But there are many ways of illustrating that the battle is not always to the strong nor the race to the swift. The ways Congress are sometimes peculiar, and not to employ a more expressive term. Under the Constitution of the United States there are but two houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, and most people residing within the jurisdiction of its laws suppose this to be the extent of the legislative body. 
but to those acquainted with the internal workings of that important branch of government there is still a third house of congress better known as the lobby true its existence is neither provided for nor recognized by law yet it exists nevertheless and so powerful although somewhat hidden is its influence upon other branches of government that almost any measure it is interested in becomes law it is sometimes remarkable that those measures which are plainly intended to promote the public interest are seldom agitated or advocated in the third house while those measures of doubtful propriety or honesty usually secure the almost undivided support of the lobby there are a few prominent questions connected with the feeble policy of the government which can do assemble so powerful and determined a lobby as a proposed interference with the system of civilian superintendents agents and traders for indians let but some member of congress propose to inquire into the workings of the management of the indians or propose a transfer of the bureau to the war department and the leaders of the combination opposed raise a cry which is as effective as rallying their supporters as was the signal of roderick dew from almost every state and territory the retainers of the bureau flock to the national capital why this rallying of the clans is there any principle involved with the few yes with the many no then why this determined opposition to any interference with the management of indians i remember making this inquiry years ago and the answer then which is equally applicable now was there is too much money in the indian question to allow it to pass into other hands this i believe to be the true solution of our difficulties with the indians at the present day it seems almost incredible that a policy which is claimed and represented to be based on sympathy for the red man and a desire to secure to him his rights is shaped in reality and manipulated beyond the scenes with the distinct and sole object of reaping a rich harvest by plundering both the government and the indians to do away with the vast army of agents traders and civilian employees which is a necessity appendage of the civilian policy would be to deprive many members of congress a vast deal of patronage which they now enjoy there are few if any more comfortable or desirable places of disposing of a friend who has rendered valuable political service or electoring aid than to secure him to the appointment of indian agent the salary of an agent is comparatively small men without means however eagerly accept the position and in a few years at furthest they almost invariably retire in wealth who ever heard of a retired indian agent or trader in limited circumstances how do they realize fortunes upon so small a salary in the disposition of the annuities provided for the indians by the government the agent is usually the distributing medium between himself and the indian there is no system of accountability no vouchers given or received no books kept in fact no record except the statement which the agent chooses to forward to the superintendent the indian has no means for knowing how much in value or how many presents of any particular kind the government the great father as he is termed it has sent him for knowledge on this point he must accept the statement of the agent the goods sent by the government are generally those which would most please an indian fancy the indian traders usually keeps goods of smaller character the trader is most frequently a particular friend of the agent and associated with him in business and in many instances holds his position of trader at the instance of the agent there are always located near each other the trader is usually present at the distribution of annuities if the agent instead of distributing to the indians all of the goods intended for them by the government only distributes one half and retains the other half who is to be the wiser 
not the indian defrauded though he may be for he is ignorant of how much is coming to him the word of the agent is his only guide he may complain a little express some disappointment at the limited amount of presents and intimate that the great father has dealt out annuities with a sparing hand but the agent explains it by referring to some depredations which he knows the tribe may have been guilty of in the past or if he is not aware of any particular instance of guilt he charges them with generally having committed such acts knowing one can scarcely go amiss in accusing a tribe of occasionally slaying a white man and ends up in his charge by informing them that their great father learning of these little irregularities in their conduct and being pained greatly thereat felt compelled to reduce their allowance of blankets sugar coffee and so on when at the same time the missing portion of said allowance is safely secured in the storehouse of the agent near by well but how can he enrich himself in this manner it may be asked by simply and unseen by indians transferring the unused or unissued portion of the annuities from his government storehouse to the trading establishment of his friend the trader there the boxes are unpacked and their contents spread out for barter with the indians the latter in gratifying their wants are forced to purchase from the trader at prices which are scores of times the values of the article offered i have seen indians dispose of buffalo robes to traders which were worth from fifteen to twenty dollars each and get in return only ten to twenty cups of brown sugar the entire value of which did not exceed two or three dollars this is one of the many ways agents and traders have amassed sudden wealth i have known the head chiefs of a tribe to rise in a council in the presence of other chiefs and officers of the army and accuse his agent then present of these or similar dishonest practices it is to be wondered at that the position of the agent or trader among the indians is greatly sought after by men of determination to become rich but not particular as to the manner of doing so or is it to be wondered at that army officers who are made aware of the injustice done to the indians are yet powerless to prevent it and who trace many of our difficulties with the indians to these causes should urge the abolishment of a system which has proven itself so fruitful in fraud and dishonest dealing towards those whose interest it should be their duty to protect in offering the testimony which follows and which to those at all interested in the subject of our dealings with the indians must have no little weight i have given that of men whose interest in the matter could only spring from experience and a supposed thorough knowledge of the indian character and a desire to do justice to him as well as to the government at the present writing a heavy cloud protending a general indian war along our entire frontier from the british possessions on the north to the mexican border on the south hangs threateningly over us whether it will really result in war or the isolated acts of barbarity remains to be seen but enough is known to prove that the day has not yet arrived when the lawless savage of the plains is prepared or willing to abandon his favorite pastime of war and depredation upon the defenseless frontier and instead to settle quietly down and study the arts and callings of a quiet and peaceful life it is impossible for the indian to comprehend the forces of any law or regulation which is not backed up by a power sufficiently strong to compel its observance this is not surprising as a large portion of their white brethren are equally obtuse general sheridan showed his thorough appreciation of the indian character in an endorsement recently written by him upon a complaint relating to indian depredations forwarded from one of his subordinates to the war department general sheridan writes we can never stop the wild indians from murdering and stealing until we punish them if a white man in this country commits a murder we hang him if he steals a horse we put him in the penitentiary if an indian commits these crimes we give him better fare and more blankets i think i may say with reason that under this policy the civilization of the wild red man will progress slowly 
as might naturally be expected a massacre like that at fort phil kearney in which ninety-one enlisted men and three officers were slain outright and no one left to tell the tale excited discussion and comment throughout the land and raised inquiry as to who was responsible for this lamentable affair the military laid the blame at the door of the indian bureau with its host of civil agents and traders and accused the latter of supplying the indians with the arms and ammunition which were afterward turned against the whites the supporters of the indian bureau not only did not deny the accusation but went so far as to claim that all our difficulties with the indians could be traced to the fact that the military commanders particularly generals hancock and cook had forbidden the traders from furnishing the indians with arms and ammunition this was the official statement of the commissioner of indian affairs in the spring of eighteen sixty seven it was a rather queer complaint upon which to justify a war that because the government would not furnish the savages with implements for murdering its subjects in approved modern method these same savages would therefore be reluctantly forced to murder and scalp such settlers and travelers as fell in their paths in the old-fashioned tomahawk bow and arrow style the commissioner of indian affairs in his report to the secretary of the interior in the spring of eighteen sixty seven labored hard to find a justification for the indians in their recent outbreak at fort phil kearney the withholding of arms and ammunition from the indians seemed to be the principal grievance as the views of the commissioner find many supporters in quarters remote from the scene of the indian depredations and among persons who still cling to the traditionary indian as wrought by the pen of cooper and the ideal red man i quote the commissioner's words in order issued by general cook at omaha on the thirty first of july last in relation to arms and ammunition has had a very bad effect i am satisfied that such orders are not only unwise but really cruel and therefore calculated to produce the very worst effect indians are men and when hungry will like others resort to any means to obtain food and as the chase is their only means of subsistence, if you deprive them of power of procuring it you certainly produce great dissatisfaction if it were true that arms and ammunition could be accumulated by them to war against us it would certainly be unwise to give it to them but this is not the fact no indian will buy two guns one he absolutely needs and has no means of taking care of powder he necessarily will take when offered to him but a very limited quantity it is true that formerly they hunted with bows and arrows killing buffalo antelope and deer with the same but to hunt successfully with bow and arrow requires horses and as the valleys of that country are now more or less filled with white men prospecting for gold and silver their means of subsisting their horses have passed away and now they have but few horses i mention these facts so as to place before the country as briefly as possible the condition as well as the wants of the indians unfortunately for the commissioner his premises were entirely wrong and his conclusions necessarily so it is a difficult task to prove that men whose habits instincts and training incline them to deeds of murder will be less apt to commit these deeds provided we place in their hands every implement and facility for their commission yet such an effect was the reasoning of the commissioner where or from whom he could have obtained the opinions he expressed it is difficult to understand he certainly derived no such ideas from a personal knowledge of indians themselves how well his statements bear examination if it were true that arms and ammunition could be accumulated by them to war against us it would certainly be worse to give it to them but this is not the fact no indian will buy two guns on the contrary every person at all familiar with the conduct of the indians know that there is no plan or idea which they study more persistently than that of accumulating arms and ammunition and in the successful execution of this plan they have collected 
and are today collecting arms and ammunition of the latest and most approved pattern. The supply of arms and ammunition is not obtained for the purpose of hunting, no matter how bountifully the Indian may be supplied with firearms. His favorite and most successful mode of killing the buffalo, his principal article of food, is with the bow and arrow. It is at the same time the most economical mode, as arrows, after being lodged in the bodies of the buffalo, may be recovered unimpaired and be used repeatedly. No Indian will buy two guns. If the Honorable Commissioner had added the words, provided he can steal them, his statement would be heartily concurred in. From a knowledge of the facts, I venture the assertion that there is scarcely an Indian on the plains, no matter how fully armed and equipped, but would gladly barter almost anything he owns of proper value in exchange for good arms and ammunition. Even if his personal wants in this respect are satisfied, the Indian is too shrewd at driving a bargain to throw away any opportunity of possessing himself of arms or ammunition, as among his comrades he is aware that no other article of trade command the prices that are paid for the implements of war. An Indian may not desire two guns for his own use, but he will buy or procure one gun and one or more revolvers as part of his equipment for war. And there are a few chiefs and warriors of the plains who today are not the possessors of at least one breech-loading rifle or carbine and from one or two revolvers. This can be vouched for by any officer who has been brought in contact with the hostile Indians of late years. As to the Indian of not having proper means to care for his ammunition, experts have shown that when he goes into action he carries a greater number of rounds of ammunition than do our soldiers, and in time of peace he exercises far better care of his supply than do our men. The Army declared itself almost unanimously against the issue of arms to the Indians, while the traders, who were looking to the profits and other of the Indian Bureau, proclaimed loudly in favor of the issue, unlimited and unrestrained. General Hancock, commanding at that time one of the most important and extensive of the Indian departments, issued orders to his subordinates throughout the Indian country similar to the order referred to of General Cook. The order simply required post commanders and other officers to prevent the issue or sale of arms and ammunition to any Indian of the plains. As we were then engaged in hostilities with nearly all tribes, it would have been simply assisting our enemies not to adopt this course. A spontaneous outcry came from the traitors who were to be affected by this order, an outcry that did not cease until it resounded in Washington. General Hancock reported his action in the matter to his next superior officer, at that time Lieutenant General Sherman. General Sherman at once sent the following letter to General Hancock, emphatically approving the course of the latter and reiterating the order. Headquarters Military Division of the Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, January 26, 1867. General I have at this moment received your letter of January 22nd about the sale of arms and ammunition to the Indians by traitors and agents. We, the military, are held responsible for the peace of the frontier, and it is an absurdity to attempt it if the Indian agents and traitors can legalize and encourage such dangerous a traffic. I regard the paper enclosed, addressed to Mr. D. A. Butterfield, and signed by Charles Bogey, W. R. Irwin, J. H. Leavenworth, and others, as an outrage upon our rights and supervision of the matter, and I now authorize you to disregard that paper, and at once stop the practice of keeping the issue and sales of arms and ammunition under the rigid control and supervision of the commanding officers of the posts and districts near which the Indians are. If the Indian agents may, without limit, supply the Indians with arms, I would not expose our troops or trains to them at all, but would rather withdraw our soldiers who already have a Herculean task on their hands. This order is made for this immediate time, but I will, with all expedition, send these papers with a copy of this to General Grant, in hope that he will lay it before the President who alone can control both war and Indian departments, 
under whom at present this mixed control of indian question now rests in law and practice your obedient servant w t sherman lieutenant general commanding general w s hancock commanding department of the missouri this was before the peace policy had become supreme or the appointment of the agents from the society of friends had been discovered as a supposed panacea for all our indian difficulties general sherman as stated in his letter forwarded all the papers relating to the arms question to the headquarters of the army general grant then in command of the army forwarded them to the secretary of war accompanied by a following letter which clearly expresses his views then held headquarters army of the united states washington d c february one eighteen sixty seven sir the enclosed papers just received from general sherman are respectfully forwarded and your special attention invited they show the urgent necessity for an immediate transfer of the indian bureau to the war department and the abolition of the civil agents and licensed traders if the present practice is to be continued i do not see that any course is left open to us but to withdraw our troops to the settlements and call upon congress to provide means and troops to carry on formidable hostilities against the indians until all the indians or all the whites on the great plains and between the settlements on the missouri and the pacific slope are exterminated the course general sherman pursued in this matter in disregarding the permits of mr bogey and others is just right i will instruct him to enforce his order until it is countermanded by the president or yourself i would also respectfully ask this matter be placed before the president and his disapproval of licensing the sale of arms to indians asked we have treaties with all tribes of indians from time to time if the rule is to be followed that all tribes with which we have treaties and pay annuities can produce such articles without stint or limit it will not be long before the matter becomes perfectly understood by the indians and they avail themselves of it be equipped themselves for war they will get the arms either by making treaties themselves or through tribes who have such treaties i would respectfully recommend that copies of the enclosed communications be furnished to the military commander of each house of congress very respectfully your obedient servant u s grant general hon e m stratton secretary of war in response to a request from general grant to furnish the department with a statement of his views on the question of a transfer of the indian bureau from the interior to the war department general john pope whose great experience among and knowledge of the indians of the plains eminently qualified him to judge the real merits of the question wrote an able letter briefly stating the prominent reasons favoring the proposed changes as a question of the transfer of the indian bureau from the control of the interior to that of the war department is consistently being brought up and after the failure of the present policy it is most likely to be raised again the arguments advanced by general pope being these generally maintained by the army and still having full force are here given washington d c january twenty fifth eighteen sixty seven general in compliance with your suggestions i have the honor to submit the following leading reason why the indian bureau should be retransferred to the war department the views which i shall submit are by no means original but are well settled opinions of every officer of the army who has had the experience on the subject and are and have been entertained for years by nearly every citizen of the territories not directly or indirectly connected with the present system of indian management under the present circumstances there is a divided jurisdiction over indian affairs while the indians are officially at peace according to the treaties negotiated with them by civil officers of the indian bureau the military forces stationed in the indian country have no jurisdiction over the indians and of consequence no certain knowledge of their feelings or purpose and no power to take any action either of a precautionary or aggressive character the first that is known of indian hostilities is a sudden report that the indians have commenced a war and have devastated many miles of settlements or massacred parties of immigrants or travelers 
By the time such information reaches the military commander, the worst has been accomplished, and the Indians have escaped from the scene of the outrage. Nothing is left to the military except pursuit, and generally unavailing pursuit. The Indian agents are careful never to locate their agencies at the military post for reasons very well understood. It is not in human nature that two sets of officials responsible to different heads and not in accord with either opinion or purpose should act together harmoniously, and instead of combined there is very certain to be conflicting action. The results are what might be expected. It would be far better to devolve the whole management of Indian affairs upon one or the other department, so as to secure at least consistent and uniform policy. At war, the Indians are under the control of the military, and peace under the control of civil officers. Exactly what constitute Indian hostilities is not agreed on. Besides this, as soon as the military forces, after a hard campaign, conducted with great hardship and at large expense, have succeeded in forcing the Indians into such a position that punishment is possible. The Indian agent, anxious for manifest reasons to negotiate a treaty, at once interferes to protect, as he expresses it, the Indians from the troops, and arrests the further prosecution of the military expedition just at the moment when results are to be obtained by it and the whole labor and cost of the campaign are lost. The Indian makes a treaty to avoid immediate danger by the troops without the slightest purpose of keeping it, and the agent knows very well that the Indian does not intend to observe it. While the army is fighting the Indians at one end of the line, Indian agents are making treaties and furnishing supplies at the other end, which supplies are at once used to keep up the conflict. With this divided jurisdiction and responsibility, it is impossible to avoid these unfortunate transactions. If the Indian Department, as at present constituted, were given sole jurisdiction of the Indians and the troops removed, it is certain that a better condition of things would be obtained than now exists, since the whole responsibility of Indian wars and their results to unprotected citizens would belong to the Indian Bureau alone, without the power of shifting the responsibility of consequences upon others. The military officer is a representative of force, a logic which the Indian understands, and with which he does not invest the Indian agent. It is a fact which can be easily authenticated that the Indians in mass prefer to deal entirely with military commanders, and would unanimously vote for the transfer of the Indian Department to the War Department. In this, they are mainly influenced by the knowledge that they can rely upon what the military commander tells or promises them, as they see he has the power to fulfill his promise. The first and great interest of the Army officer is to preserve the peace with the Indians. His home during the life is to be at the military post in Indian country, and aside from the obligations of duty, his own comfort and quiet and the possibility of escaping arduous, harassing field service against the Indians at all seasons of the year, accompanied by frequent changes of station which render it impossible for him to have his family with him, render a state of peace with Indians the most desirable of all things to him. He therefore omits no proper precautions, and does not fail to use all proper means or just treatment, honest distribution of annuities, and fair dealing to secure quiet and friendly relations with the Indian tribes in his neighborhood. His honest distribution of the annuities appropriated to the Indians is further secured by his life commission in the army, and the odium which would blast his life and character by any dishonest act. If dismissed from the service for such malfeasance, he would publicly be branded by his own profession and would be powerless to attribute his removal from office to any but true cause. The Indian agent, on the other hand, accepts his office for a limited time and for a specific purpose, and he finds it easy when he has secured his ends. The Rapid Acquisition of Money 
to account for his removal from office on political grounds or the personal enmity of some other official or his department superior in rank to himself. The eagerness to secure an appointment as an Indian agent on a small salary manifested by many persons of superior ability ought to of itself be a warning to Congress as to the objects sought by it. It is a common saying in the West that next to, if not indeed before, the Council to Liverpool, the Indian agency is the most desirable office in the gift of the government. Of course, the more treaties an Indian agent can negotiate, the larger the appropriation of money and goods which passes through the hands, and the more valuable his office. An Indian war on every other day, with treaty-making on intermediate days, would be therefore the condition of affairs most satisfactory to such Indian agents. I by no means say that all Indian agents are dishonest. In truth, I know some who are very sincere and honorable men, who try to administer their office with fidelity to the government, but that the mass of Indian agents on the frontier are truly only to their own personal and pecuniary interests. I am very sure no one familiar with the subject will dispute. I repeat, then, that a condition of peace with the Indians is above all things desirable to the military officers stationed in their country, something very like the reverse to the Indian agent. The transfer of the Indian Bureau to the War Department would at once eliminate from our Indian system the formidable army of Indian superintendents, agents, sub-agents, special agents, jobbers, contractors, and hangers-on who now infest the frontier states and territories and save to the government annually a sum of money which I will not venture to estimate. The Army officer detailed to perform the duty in their place would receive no compensation in addition to their Army pay. Previous to the creation of the Interior Department and the transfer of the Indian Bureau to that department, Army officers performed well and honestly the duties of Indian agents, and it is only necessary to refer to our past history to demonstrate that our relations at that time with the Indians were far more friendly and satisfactory than they have been since. The military are absolutely necessary in the Indian country to protect the lives and property of our citizens. The Indian agents and superintendents are not necessary, since their duties have been and can be faithfully and efficiently performed by the Army officers stationed with the troops. Harmonious and concerted action can never be secured while both parties are retained. The military are necessary the civilian officers are not, and it is essential that one or the other be displaced. I cannot see what doubt exists to which party must give way. These are only the general reasons for the retransfer of the Indian Bureau to the War Department, reasons which are well understood by every one familiar with the subject. In order that any policy, whatever, may be consistently and efficiently pursued, a change in our present administration of Indian affairs is absolutely essential. The retransfer of the Indian Bureau to the War Department is believed to be the first step toward a reformation, and until that step is taken, it is useless to expect any improvement in the present condition of our Indian relations. I am, General, respectfully your obedient servant, John Pope, Brevet Major General, U.S. Army. General U.S. Grant, General-in-Chief, Washington, D.C. General Grant was at that time so impressed with the importance of General Pope's letter that he forwarded it to the Secretary of War with the request that it might be laid before both branches of Congress. It might be urged that the above letters and statements are furnished by officers of the Army who are exponents of but one side of the question, Fortunately, it is possible to go outside the military circle and introduce testimony which should be considered impartial and free from bias. At this particular period in the discussion of the Indian question, Colonel E.S. Parker, a highly educated and thoroughly cultivated gentleman, was asked to submit a plan for the establishment of a permanent and perpetual peace and for settling all matters of differences between the United States and the various Indian tribes. Colonel Parker is well known as a distinguished chief of the once powerful Six Nations, 
and since the time referred to has been better known as Commissioner of Indian Affairs during the early part of the present administration. Being an Indian, his sympathies must be supposed to have been on the side of his own people, and in his endeavor to establish a permanent peace, he would recommend no conditions prejudicial or unjust to their interests. He recommended, first, transfer of the Indian Bureau from the Interior Department back to the War Department or military branch of the government, where it originally belonged until within the last few years. The condition and disposition of all Indians west of the Mississippi River has developed in consequence of the great and rapid influx of immigration by reason of the discovery of the precious metal throughout the entire West, renders it of the utmost importance that the military supervision should be extended over to the Indians. Treaties have been made with a very large number of tribes, and generally reservations have been provided as homes for them. Agents appointed from civil life have generally been provided to protect their lives and property, and to attend to the prompt and faithful observance of treaty stipulations. But as the hardy pioneer and adventurous miner advanced into the inhospitable regions occupied by the Indians in search of the precious metals, they found no rights possessed by the Indians that they were bound to respect. The faith of treaties solemnly entered into was totally disregarded, and Indian territory wantonly violated. If any tribe remonstrated against the violation of their natural and treaty rights, members of the tribe were inhumanely shot down, and the whole treated as mere dogs. Retaliation generally followed, and bloody Indian wars have been the consequence, costing many lives and much treasure. In all, troubles arising in this manner to civil agents have been totally powerless to avert the consequences, and when too late the military has been called in to protect the whites and punish the Indians, when if in the beginning the military had had the supervision of the Indians, their rights would not have been improperly molested, or if disturbed in their quietude by any lawless whites, a prompt and summary check to any further aggression could have been given. In cases where the government promises the Indians the quiet and peaceable possession of a reservation, and precious metals are discovered or found to exist upon it, the military alone can give the Indians a need of protection and keep the adventurous miner from encroachment upon the Indians until the government has come to some understanding with them. In such cases, a civil agent is absolutely powerless. Most of the Indian treaties contain stipulations for the payments to Indians or annuities, either of money or goods, or both, and agents are appointed to make these payments whenever the government furnishes them in the means. I know of no reason why officers of the Army could not make all these payments as well as civilians. The expense of agencies would be saved, and I think the Indians would be more honestly dealt with. An officer's honor and interest are at stake, which impels him to discharge his duty honestly and faithfully. While civil agents have none of these incentives, the ruling passion with them being generally to avoid all trouble and responsibility and to make as much money as possible out of their offices. In the retransfer of this bureau, I would provide for the complete abolishment of the system of the Indian traders, which, it, in my opinion, is a great evil to Indian communities. I would make the government the purchaser of all articles usually brought in by Indians, giving them a fair equivalent for the same in money or goods at cost prices. In this way, it would be an easy matter to regulate the sale or issue of arms and ammunition to Indians, a question which of late has agitated the minds of the civil and military authorities. If the entry of large numbers of Indians to any military post is objectionable, it can be easily arranged that only limited numbers shall be admitted daily. Colonel Parker next quotes from the messages of Washington and Jefferson, showing that they had favored the exclusion of civil agents and traders. His recommendation then proceeds. It is greatly to be regretted that this benefit of humane policy has not been adhered to, for it is a fact not to be denied that at this day Indian trading licenses are very much sought after, 
and when once obtained, although it may be for a limited period, the lucky possessor is considered as having already made his fortune. The eagerness also with which the Indian agencies are sought after, and large fortunes made by the agents in a few years, notwithstanding the inadequate salary given, is presumptive evidence of frauds against the Indians and the government. Many other reasons might be suggested why the Indian Department should altogether be under military control, but a familiar knowledge of the practical working of the present system would seem to be the most convincing proof of the propriety of the measure. It is pretty generally advocated by the most familiar with our Indian relations, and so far as I know, the Indians themselves desire it. Civil officers are not usually respected by the tribes, but they fear and regard the military and will submit to their consuls' advice and dictation when they would not listen to a civil agent. In discussing the establishment of reservations, the locating of the Indians upon them, Colonel Parker said, It may be imagined that a serious obstacle would be presented to the removal of the Indians from their homes on account of the love they bear for the graves of their ancestors. This, indeed, would be the least and last objection that would be raised by any tribe. Much is said in books about the reverence paid by Indians to the dead and their antipathy to deserting their ancestral graves. Whatever may have been the customs for the dead in the ages gone by, and whatever pilgrimages have been made by those to the graves of their loved and distinguished dead, none of any consequence exists at the present day. They leave their dead without any painful regrets or shedding of tears. And how could it be otherwise with a people who have had such indefinite and vague ideas of a future state of existence, to my mind, it is unnatural to assume or suppose that the wild and untutored Indian can have more attachment for his home or love for the graves of his ancestors than the civilized and enlightened Christian. I regret that I cannot in this brief space give all the suggestions and recommendations submitted by this eminent representative of the red man, displaying as they do sound judgment and thorough mastery of his subject, in regard to the expense of his plan, he says, I believe it to be more economical than any other plan that could be suggested. A whole army of Indian agents, traders, contractors, jobbers, and hanger oners would be dispensed with, and from them would come the strongest opposition to the adoption of this plan, as it would effectually close them from the corrupt sources of their wealth. General Grant, then commanding the army, must have approved at that time of the views of the distinguished Indian, for a few years later, on entering upon the duties of the President of the United States, he appointed him Commissioner of Indian Affairs, thus giving Colonel Parker an opportunity to inaugurate the system, which he had urged as being the most conducive to the welfare of his people, and tending to restrain them from acts of war. The influences brought to bear by the exponents of the peace policy, as it was termed, were too powerful to be successfully resisted, and Colonel Parker felt himself forced to resign his position, for the reasons, as stated by him, that the influences operating against him were so great that he was unable to give effect to the principles which he believed should prevail in administering the affairs of his important bureau. The latter part of the summer and fall of 1867 was not characterized by active operations either upon the part of the troops or that of the Indians. A general council of all the tribes infesting the southern plains was called to assemble on Medicine Lodge Creek. This council was called in furtherance of a plan of pacification proposed by Congress with a view to uniting and locating all the tribes referred to on a reservation to be agreed upon. Congress provided that the tribes invited to the council should be met by a peace commission on the part of the government, composed of members of each house of Congress, distinguished civilians, and officers of the army of high rank. At this council, all the southern tribes assembled, 
presents in profusion were distributed among the indians the rule of distribution i believe being as usual that the worst indians received the greatest number of valuable presents an agreement was entered into between the indians and the representatives of the government reservations embracing a large extent of the finest portions of the public lands were fixed upon to the apparent satisfaction of all concerned and the promise of the indians to occupy them and to keep away from the settlements and lines of travel was made without hesitation this was the beginning of the promised era of peace the lion and the lamb had agreed to lie down together but the sequel proved that when they got up again the lamb was missing This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 13, Part 1 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Comrades, leave me here a little, while as yet tis early morn. Leave me here, and when you want me, sound upon the bugle horn. In this instance, however, the bugle whose summoning's note I was supposed to be listening for was one of peculiar structure, and its tones could only be rendered effective when prompted by the will of the director at Washington. In other words, I was living in involuntary but unregretful retirement from active service. I had spent the winter of 1867-68 to 68 most agreeably with many of my comrades at Fort Leavenworth but in the spring was forced to see them set out for their summer rendezvous for operations against the indians and myself compelled by superior authority or rather by circumstances over which i had no control to remain in the rear a non-combatant in every sense of the word so much so that i might have been eligible to election as an honorary member of some one of those preponderous departments referred to by general hazen in the school and the army as holding military rank wearing a uniform but living in complete official separation from the line except that i was not divided from it in heart and sympathy it is a happy disposition that i can content itself in all phases of fortune by the saying that that which cannot be cured must be endured I had frequent recourse to this and summer consoling expressions in the endeavor to reconcile myself to the separation for my command. For fear some of my readers may not comprehend my situation at the time, I will briefly remark in parentheses and by the way of note of explanation that for precisely what I have described in some of the preceding chapters, the exact details of which would be out of place here, it had apparently been deemed necessary that my connection with certain events and transactions, every one of which had been fully referred to heretofore, should be submitted to an official examination in order to determine if each and every one of my acts had been performed with due regard to the customs of war in like cases. To enter into a review of the proceedings which followed would be to introduce into these pages matters to personal character to interest the general reader. I will suffice to say that I was placed in temporary retirement from active duty, and this result seemed satisfactory to those parties most intimately concerned in the matter. When, in the spring of 1868, the time arrived for the troops to leave their winter quarters and march westward to the plains, the command with which I had been associated during the preceding year left its station at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and marched westward about 300 miles, there to engage in operations against the Indians. While they, under the command of General Sully, were attempting to kill Indians, I was studying the problem of how to kill time in the most agreeable manner. My campaign was a decided success. I established my base of operations in the most beautiful little town on the western shores of Lake Erie, from which I projected various hunting, fishing, and boating expeditions. 
with abundance of friends and companions and ample success time passed pleasantly enough yet withal there was a constant longing to be with my comrades in arms in the far west even while aware of the fact that their campaigns were not resulting in any material advantage i had no reason to believe that i would be permitted to rejoin them until the following winter it was on the evening of the twenty fourth of september and when about to break bread at the house of a friend in the little town referred to that i received the following telegram headquarters department of the missouri in the field fort hayes kansas september twenty fourth eighteen sixty eight general g a custer monroe michigan generals sherman sully and myself and nearly all the officers of your regiment have asked for you and i hope the application will be successful can you come at once eleven companies of your regiment will move about the first of october against the hostile indians from medicine lodge creek toward the wichita mountains p h sheridan major general commanding the reception of this dispatch was a source of unbounded gratification to me not only because i saw the opportunity of being actively and usefully employed open before me but there were personal considerations inseparable from the proposed manner of my return which in themselves were in the highest degree agreeable so much so that i felt forbearing toward each and every one who whether intentionally or not had been a party to my retirement and was almost disposed to favor them with a copy of the preceding dispatch accompanied by an expression of my hearty thanks for the unintentional favor they had thrown my way knowing that the applications of general sherman and sheridan and the other officers referred to would meet with favorable reply from the authorities of washington i at once telegraphed general sherman that i would start to join him by the next train not intending to wait the official order which i knew would be issued by the war department the following day found me on the railway train hastening to the plains as fast as the iron horse could carry me the expected order from washington overtook me that day in the shape of an official telegram from the adjutant general of the army directing me to proceed at once and report for duty to general sheridan at fort leavenworth i halted in my journey long enough to cause my horses to be shipped by rail to fort hayes nor must i admit to other faithful companions of my subsequent marches and campaigns named buker and meida two splendid specimens of scottish stagehound who were destined to share the dangers of an indian campaign and finally meet death in a tragic manner the one by the hand of a savage the other by an ill-directed bullet from a friendly carbine arriving at fort hayes on the morning of the thirtieth i found general sheridan who had transferred his headquarters temporarily from fort leavenworth to that point in order to be nearer the field operations and better able to give his personal attention to the conduct of the coming campaign my regiment was at the time on or near the arkansas river in the vicinity of fort dodge and about three easy marches from fort hayes after remaining at general sheridan's headquarters one day and receiving his instructions i set out with a small escort across the country to fort dodge to resume command of my regiment arriving at fort dodge without incident i found general sully who was at that time in command of the district in which my regiment was serving with the exception of a few detachments the main body of the regiment was encamped on bluff creek a small tributary of the arkansas the camp being some thirty miles southeast of fort dodge taking with me the detachment at the fort i proceeded to the main camp arriving there in the afternoon i had scarcely assumed my command when a band of indians dashed close up to our camp and fired upon us this was getting into active service quite rapidly i was in the act of taking my seat for dinner my right having given me a splendid relish for the repast and when the shouts and firings of the savages informed me that more serious duties were at hand every man flew to arms and almost without command rushed to oppose the enemy 
Officers and men provided themselves with rifles or carbines and soon began delivering a deliberate but ineffective fire against the Indians. The latter, as usual, was merely practicing their ordinary ruse de guerre, which was to display a very small venturesome force in the expectation that tempting pursuit by an equal or slightly superior force and, after having led the pursuing force well away from the main body, to surround and destroy it by the aid of overwhelming numbers previously concealed in a ravine or ambush until the proper moment. On this occasion, the stratagem did not succeed. The Indians, being mounted on their fleetest ponies, would charge in single file past our camp, often riding within easy carbine range of our men, displaying great boldness and unsurpassable horsemanship. The soldiers, unaccustomed to firing at such rapidly moving objects, were rarely able to inflict serious damage upon their enemies. Occasionally a pony would be struck and brought to the ground, but the rider always succeeded in being carried away upon the pony of a comrade. It was interesting to witness their marvelous abilities as horsemen. At the same time, one could not but admire the courage they displayed. The ground was level, open, and unobstructive. The troops were formed in an irregular line of skirmishes, dismounted, the line extending a distance of perhaps two hundred yards. The Indians had a rendezvous behind a hillock on the right side, which prevented them from being seen or disturbed by the soldiers. Starting out singly, or by twos and threes, the warriors would suddenly leave the cover of the hillock and with war whoops and taunts dash over the plain in a line parallel to that occupied by the soldiers, and within easy carbine range of the latter. The pony seemed possessed of this design, and wished his dusky rider as he seemed to fly unguided by the bridle rein or spur. The warrior would fire a load and fire again as often as he is able to do, while dashing along through the shower of leaden bullets fired above, beneath, in front, and behind him by the excited troopers, until finally, when the aim of the latter improved and the leaden messengers whistled uncomfortably close, the warrior would be seen to cast himself over the opposite side of his pony until his foot on the back and his face over the neck of the pony were all that could be seen, the rest of his person being completely covered by the body of the pony. This maneuver would frequently deceive the recruits among the soldiers, having fired probably about the time the warrior was seen to disappear. The recruit would shout exultingly, a call that the attention of his comrades that he had the lucky shot. The old soldiers, however, were not so easily deceived, and often afterwards would remind their less experienced companion of the terrible fatality of his shots. After finding that their plan to induce a small party to pursue them did not succeed, the Indians withdrew their forces, and concealment being no longer necessary, we were enabled to see their full numbers, as that portion of them which had hitherto remained hidden behind a bluff rode boldly out into the open plain. Being beyond rifle range, they contented themselves with taunts and gestures of defiance, then rode away. From the officers of the camp I learned that the performance of the Indians which had occupied our attention on this afternoon was of almost daily occurrence, and that the savages, from having been allowed to continue in their course unmolested, had almost reduced the camp to a state of siege. So true had this become that at no hour of the day was it safe for individuals to pass beyond the chain of sentinels which enveloped the immediate limits of the camp. Before it became known that the Indians were so watchful and daring, many narrow escapes were made, and many laughable, although serious incidents occurred, laughable, however, only to those who were not the parties most interested. Two of these serio-comic affairs now recur to me. There was a beautiful, clear stream of water named Bluff Creek running through camp, which supplied bathing facilities to the officers and men a privilege which few allowed to pass unimproved. Whether to avoid the publicity attending localities near camp, or to seek a point in the bed of the stream where the water was fresh and undisturbed, or from a motive different from either of the two, 
Two of our young officers mounted their horses one day without saddles and rode down the valley of the stream, perhaps a mile or more, in search of a bathing place. Discovering one to their taste, they dismounted, secured their horses, and, after disposing of their apparel on the greensward covering the banks, were soon floating and floundering in the water, like a pair of young porpoises. How long they had been enjoying this healthful recreation, or how much longer they might have remained, is not necessarily the story. One of them, happening to glance toward the horses, observed the latter in a state of great trepidation. Hastening from the water to the bank, he discovered the cause of the strange conduct on the part of the horses, which was nothing more or less than a party of about thirty Indian warriors, mounted and steadily making their way towards a bathing party, evidently having their eyes on the latter, and intent upon their capture. Here was a condition of affairs that was at least unexpected, as it was unwelcome. Quickly calling out to his companion, who was still in the water unconscious of approaching danger, the one on the shore made haste to unfasten their horses and prepare for flight. Fortunately, the Indians who were now within a few hundred yards of the two officers were coming from the direct opposite camp, leaving the line of retreat of the officers open. No sooner did the warriors find that their approach was discovered than they put their ponies to their best speed, hoping to capture the officers before the latter could have time to mount and get their horses under way. The two officers, in the meantime, were far from idle. No flesh bruises or bathing towels were required to restore a healthy circulation, nor was time wasted in an idle attempt to make a toilet. If they had sought their bathing ground from the motives of retirement or delicacy, no such sentiments were exhibited now. For, catching up their wardrobe from the ground in one hand and seizing the bridle rein with the other, one leap, and they were on their horses' backs and riding towards camp for dear life. They were not exactly in the condition of Flora McFlimsy, with nothing to wear, but to all intents and purposes might have well have been so. Then followed a race which, but for the risk occurred by two of the riders, might well be compared to that of John Gilpin. Both of the officers were experienced horsemen. But what experienced horseman would willingly care to be thrust upon the bare back of a flying steed minus all apparel, neither boots, breeches, nor saddle, not even the spurs and shirt collar which are said to constitute the full uniform of a Georgian colonel, and when so disposed of to have three or four score of hideously painted and feathered savages, well mounted and near at hand, straining every nerve and urging their fleet-footed war ponies to their highest speed, in order that the scalps of the experienced horsemen might be added to the other human trophies which graced their lodges. Truly this was one of the occasions when the personal appearance is nothing and a man's a man for that, so at least through our amateur Mazapas as they came dashing toward camp, ever and anon casting anxious glances over their shoulders at the pursuers, who, despite every exertion of the former, were surely overhauling their pale-faced brothers. To the pursued the camp seemed a long way in the distance, while the shouts of the warriors, each time seeming nearer than before, warned them to urge their steeds to their fastest pace. In a few moments the occupants of camp discovered the approach of this strangely appearing party, it was an easy matter to recognize the warriors, but who could name the two who rode at the front? The pursuing warriors, seeing that they were not likely to overtake and capture the two knights of the bath, slackened their pace and set a volley of arrows after them. A few moments later, and the two officers were safe inside the lines, where they lost no time in making their way to their tents to attend to certain matters relating to their toilet which the sudden appearance of their dusky visitors had prevented. It was a long time before they ceased to hear allusions made by their comrades to the cut and style of their riding suit. The other affair to which I have alluded occurred about the same time, but in different direction from camp. One of the officers who was commanding a troop concluded one day that it would be safe to grant permission to a part of his command to leave camp for the purpose of hunting buffalo, and obtaining fresh meat for the men. 
the hunting party being strong enough to protect itself against almost any ordinary war party of indians that might present itself left camp at an early hour in the morning and set out in the direction which the buffalo were reported to be the forenoon passed away noon came and still no signs of the return of the hunters the small hours of the afternoon began to come and go and still no tidings from the hunters who were expected to return to camp after an absence of two or three hours the officer to whose troop they belonged and who was of exceedingly nervous temperament began to regret having accorded them permission to leave camp knowing that indians had been seen in the vicinity the hunting party had gone by a route across the open country which carried them up a long but very gradual ascent of perhaps two miles beyond which on the level plain the buffalo were supposed to be herding in large numbers anxious to learn something concerning the whereabouts of his men and believing he could obtain a view of the country beyond which might prove satisfactory the officer whose suspense was now constantly increasing determined to mount his horse and ride to the summit of the ridge beyond which his men had disappeared in the morning taking no escort with him he leisurely rode off guided by the trail made by the hunters the distance to the crest proved much farther than it seemed from the eye before starting the ride of over two miles had to be made before the highest point was reached but once there the officer felt well repaid for his exertion for in the dim deceptions of a beautiful mirage he saw what to him was his hunting party leisurely returning toward camp thinking they were still a long distance from him and would not reach him for a considerable time he did what every prudent cavalry man would have done under similar circumstances dismounted and allowed his horse an opportunity to rest at the same time he began studying the extended scenery from which his exalted position lay spread in all directions beneath him the camp seemed nestling among the banks of the creek at the base of the ridge appeared as pleasant relief to the monotony of the view which otherwise was undisturbed having scanned the horizon in all directions he turned to watch the approach of his men when behold instead of his own trusty troopers returning laden with fruits of chase the mirage had disappeared and he saw a dozen well-mounted warriors riding directly towards him at full speed they were still far enough away to enable him to mount his horse and have more than an even chance to outstrip them in the race to camp but no time was to be thrown away the beauties of natural scenery had for the last time at least lost their attraction camp never seemed so inviting to him heading his horse towards the camp and gathering the reins in one hand and holding his revolver in the other the officer set out to make his escape judgment had to be employed in riding this race for the distance being fully two miles before a place of safety could be reached his horse not being high bred and accustomed to going such a distance at full speed might if forced too rapidly at first fail before reaching camp acting upon this idea tight rein was held as much as speed kept in reserve as safely would permit this enabled the indians to gain on the officer but at no time did he feel that he could not elude his pursuers his principal anxiety was confined to the character of the ground care being taken to avoid the rough and broken places a single misstep or stumble on the part of his horse and his pursuers would be upon him before he could rise the sensations he experienced during that flying ride could not have been inviolable soon the men in the camp discerned his situation and seized their carbines hastening out to his assistance the indians were soon driven away and the officer again found himself among his friends the hunters also made their appearance shortly after while supplied with game they had not found the buffalo as near the camp as they expected and after finding them they were carried by a long pursuit in a different direction from that taken by them in the morning hence their delay in returning to camp these and similar occurrences added to the attack made by the indians on the camp the afternoon i joined proof that unless we were to consider ourselves as actually besieged and were willing to accept the situation some decisive course must be adopted to punish the indians for their temerity
No offensive measures had been attempted since the infantry and cavalry forces of General Sully had marched up the hill and then, like the forces of the King of France, had marched down again. The effect of this movement, in which the Indians gained a decided advantage, was to encourage them in their attempts to annoy and disturb the troops, not only by prowling about camp in considerable numbers and rendering it unsafe, as has been seen, to venture beyond the chain of sentinels, but by waylaying and intercepting all parties passing between camp and the base of supplies at Fort Dodge. Knowing from my recent interview with General Sheridan that the activity was to characterize the future operations of our troops, particularly those of the cavalry, and that the sooner a little activity was exhibited on our part, the sooner perhaps we might be freed from the aggression of the Indians. I returned from the afternoon skirmish to my tent and decided to begin offensive movements that same night, as soon as darkness should conceal the march of the troops. It was reasonable to infer that the war parties, which had become so troublesome in the vicinity of camp, and made their appearance almost daily, had a hiding place or a rendezvous on some of the many small streams which flowed within a distance of twenty miles of the point occupied by the troops, and it was barely possible that if a simultaneous movement was made by several well-conducted parties with a view of the scouting up and down the various streams referred to, the hiding place of the Indians might be discovered and their forays in the future broken up. It was deemed almost prudent, and to promise the greatest chance of successes, to make these movements at night, during the hours of daylight. The Indians no doubt kept close watch over everything transpiring in the vicinity of the camp, and no scouting party could have taken its departure in daylight unobserved by the watchful eyes of the savages. Four separate detachments were at once ordered to be in readiness to move immediately after dark, each detachment numbered about one hundred cavalry, well-mounted and well-armed. Guides who knew the country well were assigned to each, and each party was commanded and accompanied by a zealous and efficient officer. The country was divided into four sections, and to each detachment was assigned one of the sections, with orders to thoroughly scout the streams running through it. It was hoped that some one of these parties might, if in no other way, stumble upon a campfire or other indication of the rendezvous of the Indians, but subsequent experience only confirmed me in the opinion that the Indians seldom, if ever, permit hostile parties to stumble upon them, unless the stumblers are the weaker party. Before proceeding further in my narrative, I will introduce to the reader a personage who is destined to appear at different intervals and upon interesting occasions as the campaign proceeds. It is usual on the plains, and particularly during the time of active hostilities, for every detachment of troops to be accompanied by one or more professional scouts or guides. These guides are employed by the government at a rate of compensation far in excess of that paid to the soldiers, some of the most experienced receiving pay about equal to that of a subaltern in the line. They constitute a most interesting as well as useful and necessary portion of our frontier population. Who they are, whence they come, or whither they go, their names even, except such as they choose to adopt or which may be given them, are all questions which none but themselves can answer. As their usefulness to the service depends not upon the unraveling or either of these mysteries, but little thought is bestowed upon them. Do you know the country thoroughly, and can you speak any of the Indian languages, constitutes the only examination which civil or uncivil service reforms demands on the plains. If the evidence of these two important points is satisfactory, the applicant for the vacancy in the Corps of Scouts may consider his position as secured, and the door to congenial employment most often leading to a terrible death opens before him. They are almost invariably men of very superior judgment or common sense, with education generally better than that of the average frontiersman. Their most striking characteristics are love of adventure, a natural and cultivated knowledge of the country without recourse to maps, deep hatred of the Indian, 
and an intimate acquaintance with all the habits and customs of the latter, whether pertaining to peace or war, and last but most necessary to their calling, a skill in the use of firearms and the management of a horse. The possessor of these qualifications, and more than the ordinary amount of courage, may feel equal to discharge the dangerous and trying duties of a scout. In concentrating the cavalry, which had hitherto been operating in small bodies, it was found that each detachment brought with it the scouts who had been serving with them. When I joined the command, I found quite a number of these scouts attached to various portions of the cavalry, but each acting separately. For the purpose of organization, it was deemed best to unite them into a separate detachment under the command of one of their own number. Being unacquainted personally with the merits or demerits of any of them, the selection of a chief had necessarily to be made somewhat at random. There was one among their number whose appearance would have attracted the notice of any casual observer. He was a man of about forty years of age, perhaps older, over six feet in height, and possessing a well-proportioned frame. His head was covered with a luxurious crop of long, almost black hair, strongly inclined to curl, and so long as to fall carelessly over his shoulders. His face, as least so much of it as was not concealed by the long, waving brown beard and mustache, was full of intelligence and pleasant to look upon. His eye was undoubtedly handsome, black and lustrous, with an expression of kindness and mildness combined. On his head was generally to be seen, whether asleep or awake, a huge sombrero or black slouch hat. A soldier's overcoat with its large circular cape, a pair of trousers with the legs tucked in the top of his long boots, usually constituted the outside makeup of the man who I selected as chief scout. He was known by the euphemous title of California Joe. No other name seemed ever to have been given to him, and no other name ever seemed necessary. His military armament consisted of a long breech-loading Springfield musket, from which he was inseparable, and a revolver and hunting knife, both the latter being carried in his waist belt. His mount completed his equipment for the field, being instead of a horse a finely formed mule, and in whose speed and endurance he had every confidence. Scouts usually prefer a good mule to a horse, and wisely, too, for the reason that in making their perilous journeys, either singularly or twos or threes, celerity is one principal condition to success. The object with a scout is not to overrun or overwhelm the Indians, but to avoid them both by secrecy and caution in his movements. On the plains, at most seasons of the year, the horse is incapable of performing long or rapid journeys without being supplied with forage on the route. This must be transported, and in the case of scouts would necessarily be transported on the back of the horse, thereby adding materially to the weight which must be carried. The mule will perform a rapid and continuous march without forage being able to subsist on grazing to be obtained in nearly all the valleys of the plains during the greater portion of the year. California Joe was an inveterate smoker who was rarely seen without his stubby, dingy-looking briarwood pipe in full blast. The endurance of his smoking powers was only surpassed by his loquacity. His pipe frequently became exhausted and required refilling but California Joe seemed never to lack for material or disposition to carry on a conversation, principally composed of personal adventures among the Indians, episodes in mining life or experience in overland journeying before the days of steam engines and palace cars rendered a trip across the plains a comparatively uneventful one. It was evident from the scraps of information volunteered from time to time that there was but little of the western country from the Pacific to the Missouri River, with which California Joe was not intimately acquainted. He had lived in Oregon years before, and had become acquainted from time to time with most of the officers who have served on the plains or on the Pacific coast. I once inquired of him if he had ever seen General Sheridan. What? General Sheridan? Why, bless my soul, I know Sheridan way up in Oregon more than fifteen years ago, and he was only a second lieutenant of infantry. 
He was quartermaster of the fort, or something of that sort, and I had the contract for furnishing wood to the post, and would you believe it? End of chapter 13, part 1. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 13, Part 2 of My Life on the Plains. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I had kind of a sneaking notion that he'd hurt somebody if they'd ever turn him loose. Lord, but ain't he old lightning. This was a man whom, upon a short acquaintance, I decided to appoint as chief of the scouts. This thrust of professional greatness as the sequel will prove was more than California Joe aspired to, or, considering some of his undeveloped traits, was equal to. But I am anticipating. As the four detachments already referred to were to move as soon as it was dark, it was desirable that the scouts should be at once organized and assigned. So, sending for California Joe, I informed him of his promotion, and of what was expected of him and his men. After this official portion of the interview had been completed, it seemed proper to Joe's mind that a more intimate acquaintance between us should be cultivated, as we never met before. His first interrogatory addressed to me in furtherance of this idea was frankly put as followed. See here, General, in order that we have no misunderstanding, I'd just like to ask you a few questions. Seeing that I had somewhat of a character to deal with, I signified my perfect willingness to be interviewed by him. Are you an ambulance man or a horse man? Pretending not to discover his meaning, I requested him to explain. I mean, do you believe in catching Indians in ambulances or on horseback? Still assuming ignorance, I replied, Well, Joe, I believe in catching Indians wherever we can find them, whether they are found in ambulances or on horseback. This did not satisfy him. They ain't what I'm driving at. Suppose you have the Indians and really want to have a tussle with them. Would you start after them on horseback or... Would you climb into an ambulance and be hauled after him? That's the point I'm heading for. I answered that I would prefer the method on horseback, provided I really desired to catch the Indians. But if I wished them to catch me, I would adopt the ambulance system of attack. This reply seemed to give him complete satisfaction. You hit the nail square on the head. I've been with them on the plains when they started out after the Injuns on wheels, just as if there was a going to a town funeral in the States, and they stood about as many chances of catching Indians as a six-mule team would of catching a pack of thieving coyotes just as much. Why, that sort of work is only for fun, for the Injuns. They don't want anything better. You ought to have seen how they peppered it to us, and we ain't doing nothing at a time. Some of them was afraid the mules was going to stampede and run off with the train and all our forage and grub, but that was impossible. For besides the big loads of corn and bacon and baggage in the wagons we had in them, there war from eight to a dozen infantry men piled in besides them. You ought to have heard the quartermaster in charge of the train trying to drive the infantry men out of the wagons and get them into the fight. I spec he was an Irishman by his talk, for he said to him, Get out of them wagons! Get out of them wagons! You'll have me tried for disobedience of orders for marching them men in wagons when I've orders but for at. How long I might have been detained listening to California Joe's recital of the incidents of the first campaign, sandwiched here and there by his peculiar but generally correct ideas, of how to conduct an Indian campaign properly. I do not know. Time was limited, and I had to remind him of the fact to induce himself to shorten the conversation. It was only deferred, however, as on every occasion thereafter, 
California Joe would take his place at the head of the column on the march, and his newest companion was made the receptacle of a fresh installment of Joe's facts and opinions. His career as chief scout was the briefest of nature. Everything being in readiness, the four scouting columns, the men having removed their sabers to prevent the clanging and detection, quietly moved out of camp as soon as it was sufficiently dark and set out in different directions. California Joe accompanied that detachment whose prospects seemed best for encountering the Indians. The rest of the camp soon afterwards returned to their canvas shelter, indulging in all manner of surmises and conjectures of the likelihood of either or all of the scouting parties meeting with success. As no tidings would probably be received in camp until a late hour of the following day, Taps, the usual signal from the bugle for lights out, found the main camp in almost complete darkness, with only here and there a straying glimmering of light from the candle of some officer's tent, who was probably reckoning in his own mind how much he was losing, or perhaps gaining, by not accompanying one of the scouting parties. What were the chances of success to the four detachments which had departed on this all-night's ride? next to nothing. Still, even if no Indians could be found, the expeditions would accomplish this much. They would leave their fresh trail all over the country within a circuit of twenty miles of our camp, trails which the practiced eyes of Indians would be certain to fall upon in daylight and inform them for the first time that an effort was being made to disturb them, if nothing more. Three of the scouting columns can be disposed of now by the simple statement that they discovered no Indians, nor the remains of any camps or lodging places indicating the recent presence of a war party on any of the streams visited by them. The fourth detachment was the one that California Joe had accompanied as scout. What a feather it would be in his hat if after the failure of the scouts accompanying the other columns to discover Indians, the party guided by him should pounce upon the savages by the handsome fight settle a few of the old scores charged against them. The night was passing away uninterrupted by any such event, and but a few hours more intervened before daylight would make its appearance. The troops had been marching constantly since leaving camp. Some were almost asleep in their saddles when the column was halted and word was passed along from man to man that the advance guard had discovered signs indicating the existence of Indians near at hand. Nothing more was necessary to dispel all sensations of sleep, and to place every member of the command on the alert. It was difficult to ascertain from the advance guard, consisting of a non-commissioned officer and a few privates, precisely what they had seen. It seemed that in the valley beyond, into which the command was about to descend, and which could be overlooked from the position the troops then held, something unusual had been seen by the leading troopers, just as they had reached the crest. What this mysterious something was, or how it produced, no one could tell. It appeared simply for a moment, and then only as a bright flash of light of varied colors, how far away it was it was impossible to determine in the heavy darkness of night. A hasty consultation of the officers took place at the head of the column, when it was decided that in the darkness which then reigned, it would be unwise to move the attack of an enemy until something more was known of the numbers and position of the foe. As the moon would soon rise and dispel one of the obstacles of conducting a careful attack, it was determined to hold the troops in readiness to act upon a moment's notice, and at the same time send a picked party of men under the guidance of California Joe to crawl as close to the supposed position of the Indians as possible and gather all the information available. But where was California Joe all this time? Why was he not at the front with his service where it would be more likely to be in demand? Such a search made for him all along both flanks of the column, but on careful inquiry it seemed that he had not been seen for some hours, and 
then at a point many miles from that which the halt had been ordered. This was something remarkable, and admitted of no explanation, unless, perhaps, California Joe had fallen asleep during the march, and been carried away from the column. But this theory gained no supporters. His absence at this particular time, when his advance and services might prove so invaluable, was regarded as most unfortunate. However, the party to approach the Indian camp was being selected, when a rifle shot broke out from the stillness of the scene, surrounded in the direction of a mysterious appearance, which had first attracted the attention of the advance troopers. Another moment, and the most powerful yells and screams rose in the same direction, as if a terrible conflict was taking place. Every carbine was advanced ready for action. Each trigger was carefully sought. No one is yet being able to divine the cause of this sudden outcry, when in a moment who should come charging wildly up to the column, now dimly visible by the first rays of the moon, but California Joe, shouting and striking wildly to the right and left as if beset by a whole tribe of warriors. Here, then, was the solution of the mystery. Not then, but in a few hours everything was rendered clear. Among the other traits or peculiarities of his character, California Joe numbered an uncontrollable fondness for strong drink. It was one of his greatest weaknesses, a weakness to which he could only be kept from yielding by keeping all intoxicating drink beyond his reach. It seemed from an after-development of the affair that the sudden elevation of California Joe, unsought and unexpected as it was to the position of chief scout, was rather too much good fortune to be borne by him in a quiet and undemonstrable manner. Such a profusion of greatness had not been thrust upon him so often as to render him secure from being affected by its preferment. At any rate, he deemed the event deserving of celebration, professional duties to the contrary notwithstanding, and before proceeding on the night expedition, had filled his canteen with a bountiful supply of the worst brand of whiskey such as is only attainable on the frontier. He perhaps did not intend to indulge to that extent which might disable him from properly performing his duties, but in this, like many other good men whose appetites are stronger than their resolutions, he failed in his reckoning. As the liquor which he imbibed from time to time after leaving camp began to produce the natural or unnatural effect, Joe's independence greatly increased until the only part of the expedition which he recognized as at all important was California Joe. His mule, no longer restrained by his hand, gradually carried him away from the troops until the latter were left far in the rear. This was the relative position when the halt was ordered. California Joe indulged in drink sufficiently for the time being, concluded that the best thing would be to smoke, nothing would be better to cheer him on his lonely night ride. Filling his ever-present briarwood with tobacco, he next proceeded to strike a light, employed for this purpose, a storm or tempest match, it was the bright and flashing colors of this which had been so suddenly attracted to the attention of the advance guard. No sooner was his pipe lit than the measure of his happiness was complete, his imagination picturing him to himself perhaps as leading into a grand Indian fight. His mule by this time had turned toward the troops, and when California Joe set up his unearthly howls and began his imaginary charge into an Indian village, he was carried at full speed straight to the column, where his good fortune alone prevented him from receiving a volley before he was recognized as not an Indian. His blood was up, all the efforts to quiet or suppress him proved unavailing, until finally the officer in command was forced to bind him hand and foot, and in this condition secure him on the back of his faithful mule. In this sorry plight, the chief scout continued until the return of the troops to camp, when he was transferred to the tender mercies of the guard as prisoner for misconduct. 
Thus ended California Joe's career as chief scout. Another was appointed in his stead, but we must not banish him from our good opinion yet. As a scout, responsible only for himself, he will reappear in these pages with a record which rebounds to his credit. Nothing was accomplished by the four scouting parties except perhaps to inspire the troops with the idea that they were no longer to be kept acting merely on the defensive, while the Indians no doubt learned the same fact and at the same time. The cavalry had been lying idle except when attacked by the Indians for upward of a month. It was reported that the war parties, which had been so troublesome for some time, came from the direction of Medicine Lodge Creek, a stream running in the same general direction as Bluff Creek, and about two marches from the latter in a northeasterly direction. It was on this stream, Medicine Lodge Creek, that the great peace council had been held with all the southern tribes with whom we had been, and were then at war the government being represented at the council by senators and other members of Congress, officers high in rank in the army, and prominent gentlemen selected from the walks of civil life. The next move, after the unsuccessful attempt in which California Joe created the leading sensation, was to transfer the troops across from Bluff Creek to Medicine Lodge Creek, and to send scouting parties up and down the latter in search of our enemies. This movement was made as soon after the return of the four scouting expeditions sent out from Bluff Creek. As our first day's march was to be a short one, we did not break camp on Bluff Creek until a late hour in the morning. Soon, everything was in readiness for the march, and like a traveling village of Bedouins, the troopers and their train of supplies stretched out into column. First came the cavalry, moving in column of fours, Next came the immense wagon train, containing the tents, forage, rations, and extra ammunition of the command, a very necessary but unwieldy portion of the mounted military force. Last of all came the rear guard, usually consisting of about one company. On this occasion it was a company commanded by the officer, whose narrow escape from the Indians while in search of a party of his men, who had gone buffalo hunting, had been already described in this chapter. The conduct of the Indians on this occasion proved that they had been keeping an unseen but constant watch on everything transpiring in or about the camp. The column had scarcely straightened itself out in commencing the march, and the rear guard had barely crossed the limits of the deserted camp, when out from a ravine nearby dashed a war party, of fully fifty well-mounted, well-armed warriors. Their first onslaught was directed against the rear guard, and a determined effort was made to drive them from the train, and thus place the latter at their mercy to be plundered of its contents. After disposing of flankers for the purpose of resisting any efforts which might be made to attack the train from either flank, I rode to where the rear guard were engaged to ascertain if they required reinforcements. At the same time, orders were given for the column of troops and train to continue the march, as it was not intended that so small a party as that attacking us should delay our march by any vain effort on our part to ride them down or overhaul them when we knew they could outstrip us if the contest was to be decided by a race. Joining the rear guard, I had an opportunity to witness the Indian mode of fighting in all its perfection. Surely no race of men, not even the famous Cossacks, could display more wonderful skill and feats of horsemanship than the Indian warrior on his native plains, mounted on his well-trained war pony, voluntarily running the gauntlet of his foes, drawing and receiving the fire of hundreds of rifles, and in return sending back a perfect shower of arrows, or, more likely still, well-directed shots from some souvenir of a peace commission in the shape of an improved breech loader The Indian warrior is capable of assuming positions on his pony, the latter at full speed, 
which no one but an Indian could maintain for a single moment without being thrown to the ground. The pony, of course, is perfectly trained and seems possessed of the spirit of his rider. An Indian's wealth is most generally expressed by the number of his ponies. No warrior or chief is of any importance or distinction who is not the owner of a herd of ponies numbering from twenty to many hundreds. He has, for each special purpose, a certain number of ponies that are kept as pack animals, being the most inferior, and in quality and value, than the ordinary riding ponies used on the march or about camp, or when visiting neighboring villages. Next in consideration is the buffalo pony, trained to the hunt, and only employed when dashing into the midst of the huge buffalo herds, when the object is either food from the flesh, or clothing and shelter for the lodges, to be made from the buffalo hide. Last, or rather first, considering its value and importance, is the war pony, the favorite of the herd, fleet of the foot, quick in intelligence, and full of courage. It may be safely asserted that the first place in the heart of the warrior is held by his faithful and obedient war pony. Indians are extremely fond of bartering, and are not behind hand in catching the points of a good bargain. They will sign treaties, relinquishing their lands, and agree to forsake the burial grounds of their forefathers. They will part for due consideration with their bow and arrows, and their accompanying quiver, handsomely wrought in dressed furs. Their lodges even may be purchased at a not unfair valuation, and it is not an unusual thing for a chief or warrior to offer the exchange of his wife or daughter for some article which may have taken his fancy. This is no exaggeration, but no Indian of the plains has ever been known to trade, sell, or barter away his favorite war pony. To the warrior his battle horse is the apple of his eye. Neither love nor money can induce him to part with it. To see them in battle, or to witness how one almost becomes part of the other, one might well apply to the warrior the lines. But this gallant had witchcraft in it, he grew into his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse, as he had been encorpsed and demonatured with the bravest beast so far he passed my thought, that I in forgery of shapes and tricks come short of what he did. The officer in command of the rear guard expressed the opinion that he could resist successfully the attacks of the savages until a little later, when it was seen that the latter were receiving ascensions to their strength and were becoming correspondingly bolder and more difficult to repulse when a second troop of cavalry was brought from the column as a support to the rear guard. These last were ordered to fight on foot, their horses in charge of every fourth trooper being led near the train. The men being able to fire so much more accurately when on foot compelled the Indians to observe greater caution in their manner of attack. Once a warrior was seen to dash out from the rest in the peculiar act of circling, which was simply to dash along in front of the line of troopers, receiving their fire and firing in return. Suddenly, his pony, while at full speed, was seen to fall on the ground, showing that the aim of at least one of those soldiers had been effective. The warrior was thrown over and beyond the pony's head, and his capture by the cavalry seemed a sure and easy matter to be accomplished. I saw him fall, and called to the officer commanding the troops which had remained mounted to gallop forward and secure the Indian. The troop advanced rapidly, but the comrades of the fallen Indian also witnessed this mishap, and were rushing to his rescue. He was on his feet in a moment, and the next moment another warrior mounted on a fleetest of ponies was at his side, and with one leap the dismounted warrior placed himself astride the pony of his companion, and thus doubly burdened the gallant little steed with his no less gallant rider galloped laggingly away, with about eighty cavalrymen mounted on strong domestic horses, in full cry after them. 
There is no doubt but that by all the laws of chance the cavalry should have been able to soon overhaul and capture the Indians in so unequal a race. But whether from a lack of zeal on the part of the officer commanding the pursuit, or from the confusion created by the diversion attempt by the remaining Indians, the pony, doubly weighed as he was, distanced his pursuers and landed his burden in a place of safety. Although chagrined at the failure of the pursuing party to accomplish the capture of the Indians, I could not wholly suppress a feeling of satisfaction, if not gladness, that for once the Indians had eluded the white man. I need not add that any temporary tenderness or feelings towards the two Indians was prompted by their individual daring and the heroic display of comradeship in the successful attempt to render assistance to a friend in need. Without being able to delay our march, yet it required the combined strength and resilience of two full troops of cavalry to defend the train from the vigorous and dashing attacks of the Indians. At last, finding that the command was not to be diverted from its purpose or hindered in completing its regular march, the Indians withdrew, leaving us to proceed unmolested. These contests with the Indians, while apparently yielding the troops no decided advantage, were of the greatest value in view of the future and more extensive operations against the savages. Many of the men and horses were far from being familiar with the actual warfare, particularly on this irregular character. Some of the troopers were quite inexperienced as horsemen, and still more inexpert in the use of their weapons, as their inaccuracy of fire while attempting to bring down an Indian within easy range clearly proved. Their experience, resulting from these daily contests with the red men, was to prove of incalculable benefit, and fit them for the duties of the coming campaign. Our march was completed to Medicine Lodge Creek, where a temporary camp was established. Well, scouting parties were sent both up and down the stream as far as there was at least probability of finding Indians. The party, consisting of three troops which scouted down the valley of Medicine Lodge Creek, proceeded down to the point where was located and then standing the famous Medicine Lodge, an immense structure erected by the Indians and used by them as a council house where, once in a year, the various tribes of the southern plains were wont to assemble in mysterious conclave to consult the great spirit as to the future and offer up rude sacrifices and engage in imposing ceremonies such as were believed to be appeasing and satisfactory to the Indian deity. In the conduct of these strange and interesting incantations, the presiding or directing personages are known among the Indians as medicine men. They are the high priests of the red man's religion, and in their peculiar spear are superior in influence and authority to all others in the tribe, not excepting the head chief. No important step is proposed or put in execution, whether relating to war or peace, even the probable success of a contemplated hunt, but it is first submitted to the powers of divination confidently believed to be possessed by the medicine man of the tribe. He, after a series of enchantments, returns the answer supposed to be prompted by the great spirit, as to whether the proposed step is well advised and promises success or not. The decisions given by the medicine man are supreme and admit of no appeal. The medicine lodge just referred to had been used as the place of assembly of the Grand Council, held between the warlike tribes and the representatives of the government referred to in the preceding pages. The Medicine Lodge was found in a deserted but well-preserved condition. Here and there, hanging overhead, were collected various kinds of herbs and plants, vegetable offerings, no doubt, to the Great Spirit, while in strange contrast to these peaceful specimens of the fruits of the earth were trophies of the warpath and the chase, the latter being represented by the horns and dressed skins of animals killed in the hunt. 
some of the skins being beautifully ornamented in the most fantastic of styles peculiar to the indian idea of art of the trophies relating to war the most prominent were human scalps representing all ages and sexes of the white race these scalps according to the barbarous custom were not composed of the entire covering of the head but of a small surface surrounding the crown and usually from three to four inches in diameter consisting what is termed the scalp lock to preserve the scalp from decay a small hoop of about double the diameter of the scalp is prepared from a small width which grows on the banks of some of the streams in the west the scalp is placed inside the hoop and properly stretched by a network of thread connecting the edges of the scalp with the circumference of the hoop after being properly cured the dried fleshy portion of the scalp is ornamented in bright colors according to the taste of the captor sometimes the addition of beads of bright and varied colors being made to heighten the effect in other instances the hair is dyed either to a beautiful yellow or golden or to crimson several of these horrible evidences of past depredations upon the defenseless inhabitants of the frontier or overland immigrants were brought back by the troopers on their return from their scout old trails of small parties of indians were discovered but none indicating the recent presence of a war party in the valley were observable the command was then marched back to near its former camp on bluff creek from whence after the sojourn of three or four days it marched to a point on the north bank of the arkansas river about ten miles below fort dodge there to engage in earnest preparation and reorganization for the winter campaign which was soon to be inaugurated and in which the seventh cavalry was to bear so prominent a part we pitched our tents on the bank of the arkansas on the twenty first of october eighteen sixty eight there to remain usefully employed until the twelfth of the following month when we mounted our horses bade adieu to the luxuries of civilization and turned our faces towards the wichita mountains in the endeavor to drive from their winter hiding places the savages who had during the past summer waged such ruthless and cruel war upon our exposed settlers on the border how far and in what way we were successful in this effort will be learned in the following chapter end of chapter thirteen This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 14, Part 1 of My Life on the Plains. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In concluding to go into camp for a brief period on the banks of the Arkansas, two important objects were in view. First, to devote the time to refitting, reorganizing, and renovating generally that portion of the command which was destined to continue active operations during the inclement weather season. Second, to defend our movement against the hostile tribes until the last traces of the fall season had disappeared and winter in all its bitter force should be upon us. We had crossed weapons with the Indians time and again during the mild summer months, when the rich verdure of the valleys seemed as bountiful and inexhaustible granaries in supplying forage to their ponies, and the immense herds of buffalo, and other varieties of game roaming undisturbed over the plains, supplied all the food that was necessary to subsist the war parties and at the same time allow their villages to move freely from point to point and the experience of both officers and men went to prove that in attempting to fight the indians in the summer season we were yielding to them the advantages of climate and supplies 
we were meeting them on ground of their own selection and at a time when every natural circumstance controlling the result of the campaign was wholly in their favor and as a just consequence the troops in nearly all these contests with the red man had come off second best during the grass season nearly all indian villages are migratory seldom remaining longer than a few weeks at most in any one locality depending upon entirely the supply of grass when this becomes exhausted the lodges are taken down and the entire tribe or band moves to some other point chosen with reference to the supply of grass water wood and game the distance to the new location is usually but a few miles during the fall when the buffalo are in the best condition to furnish food and the hides are suitable to be dressed as robes or to furnish covering for the lodges the grand annual hunts of the tribes take place by which the supply of meat for the winter is procured this being done the chiefs determined upon the points at which the village shall be located if the tribe is a large one the village is often subdivided one portion or band remaining at one point other portions choosing localities within a circuit of thirty or forty miles except during the seasons of most perfect peace and when it is the firm intention of the chiefs to remain on friendly terms with the whites at least during the winter and early spring months the localities selected for their winter resorts are remote from the military posts and the frontier settlements and the knowledge which might lead to them carefully withheld from every white man even during a moderate winter season it is barely possible for the indians to obtain sufficient food for their ponies to keep the latter in anything above a starving condition many of the ponies actually die for want of forage while the remaining ones become so weak and attenuated that it requires several weeks of good grazing in the spring to fit them for service particularly such service as required from the war ponies guided by these facts it was evident that if we chose to avail ourselves to the assistance of so exacting and terrible an ally as the frost of winter an ally who would be almost as uninviting to friends as to foes we might deprive our enemy of his points of advantage and force him to engage in a combat in which we should do for him what he had hitherto done for us compel him to fight upon ground and under circumstances of our own selection to decide upon making a winter campaign against the indians was certainly in accordance with that maxim in the art of war which directs ones to do that which the enemy neither expects nor desires to be done at the same time it would dispel the old foggy idea which was not without supporters in the army and which was confidently relied on by our indians themselves that the winter season was an insurmountable barrier to the prosecution of a successful campaign but aside from the delay which was necessary to be submitted to before the forces of winter should produce their natural but desired effect upon our enemies there was much to be done on our part before we could be ready to cooperate in an offensive movement the seventh cavalry which was to operate in one body during the coming campaign was a comparatively new regiment dating its existence as an organization from july eighteen sixty six the officers and companies had not served together before with much over half of their full force a large number of fresh horses were required and obtained these had to be drilled all the horses in the command were to be newly shod and an extra fore and hind shoe fitted to each horse these with the necessary nails were to be carried by each trooper in the saddle pocket it had been seen that the men lacked accuracy in the use of their carbines to correct this two drills in target practice were ordered each day the companies were marched separately to the ground where the targets had been erected and under the supervision of the troops officers were practiced daily in firing at targets placed at one hundred two hundred and three hundred yards distance 
the men had been previously informed that out of the eight hundred men composing the command a picked corps of sharpshooters would be selected numbering forty men and made up of the forty best marksmen in the regiment as an incentive to induce every enlisted man whether non-commissioned officer or private to strive for appointment in the sharpshooters it was given out from headquarters that the men so chosen would be regarded as they would really deserve to be as the elite of the command not only regarded as such but treated with corresponding consideration for example they were to be marched as a separate organization independently of the column a matter of which itself is not so trifling as it may seem to those who have never participated in a long and wearisome march then again no guard or picket duty was to be required of the sharpshooters which alone was enough to encourage every trooper to excel as a marksman besides these considerations it was known that should we encounter the enemy the sharpshooters would be the most likely to be assigned a post of honor and would have superior opportunities for acquiring distinction and rendering good service the most generous as well as earnest rivalry at once sprung up not only between the various companies as to which should secure the largest representation among the sharpshooters but the rivalry extended to individuals of the same company each of whom seemed desirous of the honor of being considered as one of the best shots to be able to determine the matter correctly a record of every shot fired by each man of the command throughout a period of upwards of one month was carefully kept it was surprising to observe the marked and rapid improvement in the accuracy of aim attained by the men generally during this period two drills at target practice each day and allowing each man an opportunity at every drill to become familiar with the handling of his carbine and in judging of the distances of the different targets worked a most satisfactory improvement in the average accuracy of fire so that at the end of the period named by taking the record of each trooper's target practice i was able to select forty marksmen in whose ability to bring down any warrior whether mounted or not who might challenge us as we had often been challenged before i felt every confidence they were a superb body of men and felt the greatest pride in their distinction a sufficient number of non-commissioned officers who had proved their skill as marksmen were included in the organization among them fortunately a first sergeant whose expertness in the use of any firearms was well established throughout the command i remember having seen him while riding at full speed bring down four buffaloes by four consecutive shots from his revolver when it is remembered that even experienced hunters are usually compelled to fire half a dozen shots or more to secure a single buffalo this statement will appear the more remarkable the forty sharpshooters being supplied with their complements of sergeants and corporals and thus constituting an organization by themselves only lacked one important element a suitable commander a leader who aside from being a thorough soldier should possess traits of character which would not only enable him to employ skillfully the superior abilities of those who were to constitute his command but at the same time feel the esprit de corps which is so necessary to both officer and soldiers when success is to be achieved fortunately in my command were a considerable number of young officers nearly all of whom were full of soldierly ambition and eager to grasp any opportunity which opened their way to honorable preferment the difficulty was not in finding an officer properly qualified in every way to command the sharpshooters but among so many who i felt confident would render a good account of themselves if assigned to that position to designate a leader par excellence the choice fell upon colonel cook a young officer whose acquaintance the reader will remember to have made in connection with the plucky fight he had with the indians near fort wallace the preceding summer colonel cook at the breaking out of the rebellion although then but a lad of sixteen years 
entered one of the New York cavalry regiments, commencing at the foot of the ladder. He served in the cavalry arm of the service throughout the war, participating in Sheridan's closing battles near Richmond. His services and gallantry resulted in his promotion to the rank of lieutenant colonel. While there were many of the young officers who would have been pleased if they instead of another had been chosen, there was no one in the command, perhaps, who did not regard the selection as a most judicious one. Future events only confirmed this judgment. After everything in the way of reorganization and refitting which might be considered as actually necessary had been ordered, another step, bordering on the ornamental, perhaps, although in itself useful, was taken. This is what was termed in the cavalry as coloring the horses, which does not imply, as might be inferred from the expression, that we actually changed the color of our horses, but merely classified or arranged them throughout the different squadrons and troops according to the color. Hitherto the horses had been distributed to the various companies of the regiment indiscriminately, regardless of color, so that in each company and squadron horses were found of every color. For uniformity of appearance it was decided to devote one afternoon to a general exchange of horses. The troop commanders were assembled at headquarters and allowed in the order of their rank to select the color they preferred. This being done, every public horse in the command was led out and placed in line. The greys collected at one point, the bays of which there was a great preponderance in numbers at another, the blacks at another, the sorrels by themselves, then the chestnuts, the blacks, and the browns, and last of all came what were jocularly designated as the brindles, being the odds and ends so far as color were concerned, roans and other mixed colors, the junior troop commander, of course, becoming the reluctant recipient of the last valuable enough except as to color. The exchanges having been completed, the men of each troop led away to their respective picket, or stable line, their newly acquired chargers. Arriving upon their company grounds, another assignment in detail was made by the troop commanders. First, the non-commissioned officers were permitted to select their horses in the order of their rank, then the remaining horses were distributed among the troopers generally, giving the best soldiers the best horses. It was surprising to witness what a great improvement in the handsome appearance of the command was effected by this measure. The change, when first proposed, had not been greeted with much favor by many of the troopers who, by long service and association in times of danger, had become warmly attached to their horses. But the same reasons which had endeared the steed to the soldier in the one instance soon operate in the same manner to render the new acquaintances fast friends. Among the other measures adopted for carrying the war to our enemy's doors, and in a manner of fight the devil with fire, was the employment of Indian allies. These were to be procured from the reservation Indians, tribes who from engaging in long and devastating wars with the whites and with other hostile bands had become so reduced in power as to be glad to avail themselves of the protection and means of subsistence offered by the reservation plan these tribes were most generally the objects of hatred in the eyes of their more powerful and independent neighbors of the plains and the latter, when making their raids and bloody incursions upon the white settlements of the frontiers, did not hesitate to visit their wrath equally upon whites and reservation Indians. To these smaller tribes it was a welcome opportunity to be permitted to ally themselves to the forces of the government, and endeavor to obtain that satisfaction which acting alone they were powerless to secure. The tribes against which we proposed to operate during the approaching campaign had been particularly cruel and relentless in their wanton attacks upon the Osages and cause, two tribes living peaceably and contently on well-chosen reservations in southwest Kansas and the northern portion of the Indian Territory. 
no assistance in fighting the hostile tribes was desired but it was believed and correctly too that in finding the enemy and in discovering the location of his winter hiding places the experience and natural tact and cunning of the indians would be a powerful auxiliary if we could enlist them in our cause an officer was sent to the village of the osages to negotiate with the head chiefs and was successful in his mission returning with a delegation consisting of the second chief in rank of the osage tribe named little beaver hard rope the counsellor or wise man of his people and eleven warriors with an interpreter in addition to the monthly rate of compensation which the government agreed to give them they were also to be armed clothed and mounted at the government's expense advices from general sheridan's headquarters then at fort hayes kansas were received early in november informing us that the time for resuming active operations was near at hand and urging the early completion of all preliminaries looking to that end fort dodge on the arkansas river was the extreme post south in the direction proposed to be taken by us until the red river should be crossed and the northwestern posts of texas could be reached which were further south than our movements would probably carry us to use fort dodge as our base of supplies and keep open to that point our long line of communications would have been considering the character of the country and that of the enemy to be encountered an impractical matter with our force to remedy this a temporary base was decided upon to be established about one hundred miles south of fort dodge at some point yet to be determined from which we could obtain our samples during the winter with this object in view an immense train consisting of about four hundred army wagons was loaded with forage rations and clothing for the supply of the troops composing the expedition a guard composed of a few companies of infantry was detailed to accompany the trains and to garrison to point which was to be selected as the new base of supplies everything being in readiness the cavalry moved from its camp on the north bank of the arkansas on the morning of the twelfth of november and after fording the river began its march toward the indian territory that night we were encamped on the mulberry creek where we were joined by the infantry and the supply train general sully commanding the district here took active command of the combined forces much anxiety existed in the minds of some of the officers remembering no doubt their late experience lest the indians should attack us while on the march when hampered as we should be in the protection of so large a train of wagons we might fare badly the country over which we were to march was favorable to us as we were able to move our trains in four parallel columns formed close together this arrangement shortened our flanks and rendered them less exposed to attack the following morning after reaching mulberry creek the march was resumed soon after daylight the usual order being the four hundred wagons of the supply train and those belonging to the troops formed in four equal columns in advance of the wagons at a proper distance rode the advance guard of cavalry a corresponding cavalry force formed the rear guard the remainder of the cavalry was divided into two equal parts and these parts again divided into three equal detachments these six detachments were disposed of along the flanks of the column three on a side maintaining a distance between themselves and the train of from a quarter to a half a mile while each of them had flanking parties thrown out opposite the train rendering it impossible for an enemy to appear in any direction without timely notice being received the infantry on beginning the march in the morning were distributed throughout the train in such a manner that should the enemy attack their services could be rendered most effective unaccustomed however to field service particularly marching the infantry apparently were only able to march for a few hours in the early part of the day when becoming weary they would struggle from their companies and climb into the covered wagons 
from which there was no determined effort to rout them in the afternoon there would be little evidence perceptible to the eye that infantry formed any portion of the expedition save here and there the butt of a musket or point of a bayonet peeping out from under the canvas wagon covers or perhaps an officer of infantry treading alone in his native heath or better still mounted on an indian pony the result of some barter with the indians when times were a little more peaceable and neither wars nor rumors of wars disturbed the monotony of garrison life nothing occurred giving us any clue to the whereabouts of the indians until we had been marching several days and were moving down the valley of beaver creek when our indian guides discovered the trail of an indian war party numbering according to their estimate from one hundred to one hundred and fifty warriors mounted and moving in a northeasterly direction the trail was not over twenty-four hours old and by following it to the point where it crossed beaver creek almost the exact numbers and character of the party could be determined from the fresh signs at the crossing everything indicated that it was a war party sent from the very tribes we were in the search of and the object judging from the direction they had been moving in other circumstances was to make a raid on the settlements in western kansas as soon as we had reached camp for the night which was but a short distance from the point at which we crossed the indian trail i addressed a communications to the senior officer who was commanding the expedition and after stating the facts learned in connection with the trail requested that i might be permitted to take the cavalry belonging to the expedition leaving the trains to be guarded by the infantry whose numbers were ample for this purpose and with the indian scouts and trailers set out early the next morning following the trail of the war party not in the direction taken by them as this would be an idle attempt but in the direction from which they came expressing the conviction that such a course would in all probability lead us direct to the village of the marauders which was the ultimate object of the movement we were thus engaged in by doing so we might be able to strike a prompt blow against our enemies and visit swift punishment upon the war party whose hostile purposes were but too evident in these views i was sustained by the opinions of our indian allies who expressed confidence in their ability to take the trail and follow it back to the villages the officer to whom my application was submitted and whose sanction was necessary before i could be authorized to execute my proposed plan returned an elaborate argument attempting to prove that no successful results could possibly attend the undertaking i had suggested and ended with the remark that it was absurd to suppose for one moment that a large military force such as ours was and accompanied by such an immense train of wagons could move into the heart of indian country and their presence remain undiscovered by the watchful savages for even a single day this specious reasoning sounded well read well but it gave no satisfaction to the men and officers of the cavalry all of whom thought they saw a fine opportunity neglected however we shall strike this trail again but on different ground and under different circumstances great as was our temporary disappointment at being restrained the result satisfied all of us that for very different reasons from those adducted to withhold us from making the proposed movement all as the sequel proved was for the best on the sixth day after leaving our camp on the north bank of the arkansas the expedition arrived at the point which was chosen as our future base where the infantry were to remain and erect quarters for themselves and storehouse for military supplies the point selected which was then given the name it now bears camp supply was in the angle formed by the wolf and the beaver creeks about one mile above the junction of these two streams 
these streams by their union form the north fork of the canadian river the exact geographical location of the point referred to as latitude thirty six degrees thirty minutes longitude ninety nine degrees thirty minutes being in the neighborhood of one hundred miles in a southerly direction from fort dodge on the arkansas we of the cavalry knew that our detention at this point would be but brief within two or three days of our arrival the hearts of the entire command were gladdened by the sudden appearance in our midst of strong reinforcements these reinforcements consisted of general sheridan and staff hearing of his near approach i mounted my horse and was soon galloping beyond the limits of camp to meet him if there were any persons in the command who hitherto had been in doubt as to whether the proposed winter campaign was to be a reality or otherwise such persons soon had cause to dispel all mistrust at this point selecting from the train a sufficient number of the best teams and wagons to transport our supplies of rations and forage enough to subsist the command upon for a period of thirty days our arrangements were soon completed by which the cavalry consisting of eleven companies and numbering between eight and nine hundred men were ready to resume the march in addition we were to be accompanied by a detachment of scouts among the number being california joe also our indian ally from the osage tribe headed by little beaver and hard rope as the country in which we were to operate was beyond the limits of the district which constituted the command of general sully that officer was relieved from further duty with the troops composing of the expedition and in accordance with his instructions withdrew from camp supply and returned to his headquarters at fort harker kansas accompanied by colonel keogh seventh cavalry then holding the position of staff officer at district headquarters after remaining at camp supply six days nothing was required but the formal order directing the movement to commence this came in the shape of a brief letter of instructions from the department headquarters of course as nothing was known positively as to the exact whereabouts of the indian villages the instructions had to be in general terms in substance i was to march my command in search of the winter hiding places of the hostile indians and wherever found to administer such punishment for past depredations as my force was able to do on the evening of november twenty second orders were issued to be in readiness to move promptly at daylight the following morning that night in the midst of other final preparations for a long separation from all means of communications with absent friends most of us found time to hastily pen a few parting lines informing them of our proposed expedition and the uncertainties with which it was surrounded as none of us knew when or where we should be heard from again once we bade adieu to the bleak hospitalities of camp supply at last some of our numbers were destined never to return it began snowing the evening of the twenty second and continued all night so that when the shrill notes of the bugle broke the stillness of the morning air at reveille on the twenty third we awoke at four o'clock to find the ground covered with snow to a depth of over one foot and the storm still raging in full force surely this was anything but an inviting prospect as we stepped from our frail canvas shelters and found ourselves standing in the constantly and rapidly increasing depth of snow which appeared in every direction how will this do for a winter campaign was the half sarcastic query of the adjutant as he came trudging back to the tent through a field of snow extending almost to the top of his tall troop boots after having received the reports of the different companies at reveille just what we want was the reply little grooming did the shivering horses receive from the equally uncomfortable troopers that morning breakfast was served and disposed of more as a matter of form and regulation than to satisfy the appetite for who i might inquire could rally much of an appetite at five o'clock in the morning 
and when standing around a campfire almost up to the knees in snow the signal the general for tents to be taken down and wagons packed for the march gave every one employment upon the principle that a short horse is soon curried and as we were going to take but little with us in the way of baggage of any description the duties of packing up were soon performed it still lacked some minutes of daylight when the various commanders reported their commands in readiness to move save the final act of saddling the horses which only arrested the signal sounds of the chief bugler at headquarters boots and saddles rang forth and each trooper grasped his saddle and the next moment was busily engaged arranging and disposing of the few buckles and straps upon which the safety of his seat and the comfort of his horse demanded while they were thus employed my horse being already saddled and held near by by the orderly i improved the time to gallop through the darkness across the narrow plain to the tents of general sheridan to say good-bye i found the headquarters tent wrapped in silence and at first imagined that no one was yet stirring except the sentinel in front of the general's tent who kept up his lonely tread apparently indifferent to the beating storm i found the headquarter tent wrapped in silence and at first imagined that no one was yet stirring except the sentinel in front of the general's tent who kept up his lowly tread apparently indifferent to the beating storm but i had no sooner given the bridle rein to my orderly than the familiar tones of the general called out letting me know that he was awake and had been attentive listening to our notes of preparation his first greeting was to ask what i thought about the snow and the storm to which i replied that nothing could be more to our purpose we could move and the indian villages could not if the snow only remained on the ground for one week i promised to bring the general satisfactory evidence that my command had met the indians with an earnest injunction from my chief to keep him informed if possible should anything important occur and many hearty wishes for a successful issue of the campaign i bade him adieu after i had mounted my horse and had started to rejoin my command a staff officer of the general a particular friend having just been awakened by the conversation called out while standing in the door of his tent enveloped in the comfortable folds of a huge buffalo robe good-bye old fella take care of yourself and in these brief sentences the usual farewell greetings between brother officers separating for service took place by the time i rejoined my men they had saddled their horses and were in readiness for the march two horse was sounded and each trooper stood at his horse's head then followed the commands prepare to mount and mount when nothing but the signal advance was required to put the column in motion the band took its place at the head of the column preceded by guides and scouts and when the march began it was to the familiar notes of the famous old marching tune the girl i left behind me if we had entered into solemn compact with the clerk of the weather this being before the reign of old probabilities to be treated to winter in its severest aspect we could have claimed no forfeiture on account of non-fulfillment of contract we could not refer to the oldest inhabitant that mythical personage in most neighborhoods to attest to the fact that this was a storm unparalleled in severity in that section of the country the snow continued to descend in almost blinding clouds even the appearance of daylight added us but little in determining the direction of our march so dense and heavy were the falling lines of snow that all view of the surface of the surrounding country upon which the guides depended to enable them to run their course was cut off to such an extent was this true that it became unsafe for a person to wander from the column a distance equal to twice the width of broadway as in that short space all view of the column was prevented by the storm End of part one chapter fourteen